The story begins when the head teacher of class 3 of Chang'an's third senior high school, Miron Kyu, in her lecture, tells the students about the incident three years ago. She explained that Earth changed, and the animals and plants evolved like crazy, to prevent the world from being destroyed and to maintain world peace. Humans have awakened the ability to control monsters to fight, and these awakened ones are called Imperial Ambassadors. From that year, Earth entered a new era. After summing up her lecture, she told all the students to remember the whole speech because these points would test it. Then the school bell rings as it's recess time. Before coming out, she tells the students about tomorrow's exams, which will be about animal breeding, and interested students can go with their parents to check it out. After this, Gao Peng. An 18-year-old Chang'an third senior high school student dreams of becoming an imperial ambassador while returning home. As he was a young scholar and a sly and cunning straight as student, the world-altering cataclysm caused his parents' death and his grandfather's disappearance. Unexpectedly, Peng then awakened the super evolution system, which allowed him to see the detailed data of all monsters and their best path of evolution. However, while on the way back home, a strange interface appears before him, but he ignores it, thinking that he doesn't know if it's a hallucination due to stress. After entering the home, he was going toward his room while climbing the stairs when suddenly, a gray disc spider came in front of him. At the same time, an interface appeared there, and everything about spider was written on that interface. Seeing this, Peng says it doesn't seem to be an illusion, and then he remembers the gray disc spider is the spider raised by his grandma Chen who now lived upstairs from Peng after Chen passed away. Also, teacher Mirong said that these spider are very gentle. He proceeds to think the spider is mild, but when the spider jumps to attack, he runs away, screaming that Granny Chen's spider comes out to bite people. As he was running up the stairs quickly, the spider got close to him and threw a web toward him, but suddenly Peng remembered the interface on which it was written that the monster's weakness was flame. However, he takes out his lighter, lights it up, and throws it on the spider. But still, the flaming spider moves towards him. Seeing this, Peng gets scared and starts running up the stairs. Moreover, he runs, saying one more floor, and he will be at home. And Big Purple is at home. As long as he gets home, he will be safe. He climbs the stairs tiredly and finally reaches the door of his house. He calls Big Purple, and Big Purple opens the door quickly while Spider follows him and comes there. However, a normal grade purple. Claude Centipede named Dazzy, a pet left to Peng by his parents' greedy, cunning, fierce, and cruel nature. Although he often quarrels with Peng, he still secretly cares deeply for him. Peng feels safe by his side as they confidently stand in front of Spider, and Peng asks if he still wants to play. Seeing this, Spider quickly runs away, and Dazzy shakes Peng's shoulder with his head while angrily asking for food. Moreover, when someone bonds with a monster, he can communicate with it telepathically as the monsters are divided into combat and non-combat forms. In the non-combat state, the beast reduces its size to reduce energy consumption and can also slowly recover some minor damage. After this, Peng gives Dazzy his bag and asks him to put it on the cabinet. Then, he goes to the kitchen to cook and quickly prepares a delicious meal. He gives food to Dazzy and sits on the chair to eat. Suddenly, an interface appears before him, and he is surprised to see Dazzy has been promoted from a normal quality monster to elite quality. Also, the quality of monsters is divided into ordinary quality, elite quality, and perfect quality from low to high. And the higher the monster's rate, the greater the monster's potential. Peng excitedly starts thinking that if Dazzy is promoted to elite quality, he can be upgraded to perfect grade afterwards. And that's a monster that can break through the legendary barrier and rise to the rank of a leader. Then he happily hugs Dazzy while telling him about the promotion. After this, he checked Dazzy's promotion requirement, and three things were mentioned, the Thunder Wood Yin Shengzheng and Thunder Crystal Core. After reading the whole interface, he thinks Yin Shengzheng grass is easy to get by spending little money. He can get the Lighting Wood, but the Lightning Crystal Core is troublesome. He gets a little worried after reading the price of the crystal core, which was 8 credits, and the cost of rare attributes such as thunder, which was 10 credits. However, after the formation of the New World Alliance, the common currency was established as the Union Currency, and credits were the premium currency based on affiliate coins. 10,000 affiliate coins can be exchanged for 1 credit point. Then he remembered that when his parents had their accident, the state paid out 20 credit points of pension and he still had 11 credits on hand, barely enough to get the material for Dazzy's promotion. While looking toward Dazzy, he thinks it's to upgrade him, and he won't be able to get through the rest of the days. After finishing the plate of food, Dazzy asks for more food, 
And when Peng says he's a centipede, Dazzy starts shouting in anger, and Peng relaxes him by giving him a bowl of food. After this, he ate while Peng sat before him and thought, looking toward Dazzy, that nothing is complicated in this world. The money counts, the promotion method is empty, but money to buy materials is a headache. Suddenly, this thought came to his mind. If the information on the system he gets from that interface is correct, he can become a monster trainer. Thinking this, he gets excited. However, the promotion of monsters has always been the mystery explored by the monster trainer, and he can see it directly, which means he can become the top monster trainer. Thinking about this, he becomes joyful, and when the time comes, he can have as much money as he wants. Suddenly, he remembers that his teacher Mirong said the monster trainer exam would be tomorrow. Completing his registration for the monster trainer exam took a little time, and he got worried. But as his registration was finished, he again got excited. However, the next day, Peng takes Dazzy to Tong Tong's home, where he knocks on the door and hesitates when she opens the door while wearing the slinky dress after greeting her. He says he will take the monster trainer's exam and would like to ask her to take care of Dazzy for a few days. She smiles and replies, there's no problem. She also wishes him good luck for his exam. He leaves by saying he is thankful and treats him to dinner when he returns. After this, while looking toward Dazzy, she says the qualifications are ordinary and not cute. How did Peng get involved with such an unlucky plaything like him? Then she bends down and puts her hand lovingly on Dazzy's head, thinking the older man will be furious when he finds out, and then she takes him to her home. After this, she calls the older man and says she wants to tell him something but doesn't get excited as Peng signs an imperial beast, an ordinary quality purple-backed, yellow-clawed centipede. Hearing this, he yells, asking how the ordinary quality beasts have limited talents and are difficult to cultivate, why doesn't she talk to him? But she moves the mobile away from her ear. Then she got up while replying to him, how could she persuade him as his grandson was the same as him and on the surface, he didn't care about anything, but in reality, he was stubborn like an ox. Also, his daughter and son-in-law left this purple-backed, yellow-clawed centipede. After this, while looking out the window, she says they'll kill all the disobedient people and replace them with obedient ones, and there's no shortage of talents in this world, and he shouldn't worry about Peng and with her there, he won't be in danger. However, as the conversation ends, she hangs up the phone while on the older man's side in the office, and he calls his assistant to his room, where he tells her to tell the lab that he only gives them five months and if they don't work for him, then they don't need to exist. There is also the problem of the Qinghai branch that Lai Yi can solve within seven months, and he only has a little time to waste. She says while bowing her head in front of the chairman that she will do it now and then leaves. After this, while looking at the picture of his and Peng's childhood, he says that within a year, everything will be solved and then go to him, and no one can hurt him then. However, in Chang'an City Monster Division, many people were gathering for the monster trainer exam. Also, Peng stood there thinking, like so many people, the monster trainers are a hot commodity. Meanwhile, Lai Zigong waved his hand through the crowd of people called Peng, and then they met each other. Lai Zigong is accompanied by his mother, Zhang Hong, and sister, Lai Hongdu. His mother asks Peng if he can come alone to watch the monster trainers exam, and Lai Zigong adds that they're there with their mother to take the exam. When he tells Peng that her sister has not passed the exam three times, he believes she will pass it this time. Hearing this, she punches him hard in the head, and Lai Zigong asks how many times he has told her not to pat his head. He suspects his IQ is getting low, and she replies it has nothing to do with her. After this, they are shocked when Peng tells them he's there to take the exam. Zhang Hong winks and puts her hand on Peng's shoulder, saying maybe their youngest monster trainer in Chang'an will be born today. He replies it is not as good as the auntie said. He just came to try his luck. Meanwhile, Wang Shu, with his guards, comes from behind, asking about the youngest monster trainer in Chang'an City when the threshold for monster trainers became so low. While pointing to them, he says any dog and cat can participate. Hearing this, Lai Zigong angrily moves toward him, but his sister stops him by holding his hand. Then he smiles, saying he thinks it's ridiculous that even a kid wants to be a trainer. Peng replies that if he wants to become a trainer just by talking, he must already be a senior monster trainer. Then Wang angrily says they'll see about that and leave. After this, when Lai Zigong asks Gao about him, his mother tells Wang Shu, the son of the Wang group, has failed four consecutive monster trainer's exams. Meanwhile, the door opens, and Feng Zhu, the chief examiner of the Chang'an monster trainer's division, announces that everyone on the monster trainer exam is now starting and also tells everyone to take the test in an orderly manner. After this, in his speech in the examination room, 
the Chang'an City Trainers Division Chief, Feng Zhu, welcomed everyone and talked about the exam, which was divided into two levels, the literary and martial arts tests. Moreover, the first test is a written test, and three videos will be shown on the big screen later. They'll pass if they accurately describe the monsters that appear in the video without further ado before the examination begins. After this, the video plays for some seconds, and then they switch off the big screen, and he says to everyone there that this is the first video, and they will have 20 minutes to think about their answer. All the contestants sit there and start asking each other for answers while Feng angrily shouts at them, saying anyone who makes any more noise will be punished as cheating and expelled from the examination room. Hearing this, all the contestants get scared and become silent. Wang Su, while writing the answer on the page, happily thinks this year's literal test was the hardest in recent years, and fortunately, he got the exam question already. He angrily looks toward Peng, thinking he keeps pretending. While Peng was happy because he could see the answer sheet with the help of his super evolution system awakening, he asked for monster data in his thoughts, and an interface appeared before him. It was a storm dolphin, and it liked soothing music, sunbathing, and eating all kinds of fish and shrimp. It also fears dark attribute attacks and hates cluttered sound waves. Peng read the data and noted it on the answer sheet. After this, they played the following video. This time, it was a mighty gorilla that liked to climb trees to eat bananas, fear poisoning monster attacks, and an impatient personality, just like the first time he noted down the whole information on the answer sheet. Then they played the third and last video. This time, it was about a scythe mantis that fights for courage and strength, a carnivorous monster that likes to eat all kinds of insects and fears fire and flame attacks. Peng completed his answer sheet, and the time for the exam was completed, and they started collecting the answer sheets. However, they tell the candidates to wait for the result and not leave the branch. After one hour, the examination results are out. Chief Feng announced the list of qualified people. He called Zhang Hong who secured 80 marks. Hearing her test result, she gets relaxed. Then he called Wang Shu's name as he already knew his test results and he secured 86 marks. After this, the chief says all of the above have made some mistakes, but they passed their exams. He would like to wish these candidates the best of luck in their martial arts exams. Wang Shu laughed at Peng and asked why he didn't hear his name. No, and he hadn't passed the test. What a pity it seems that today wasn't the day to witness the birth of the youngest monster trainer in Chang'an. Peng gets worried, thinking it shouldn't be. Is there a mistake in the data given by the system? Meanwhile, the chief asks who Gao Peng is, and Peng raises his hands, stands up, and says he is. Chief Feng clapped for him, saying he didn't expect that the candidate who scored a perfect score on the test would be so young. And the heroes are young. All the candidates there turn around from their seats, look at him in surprise, and start talking to each other, saying a perfect score on the written exam as he looks so young, still in high school. Chief Feng adds by saying the future is promising. They could witness him becoming the youngest monster trainer in Chang'an City. After this, Peng looks at Wang Shu and smiles, saying, Gao Peng has a perfect score on the written exam. Sorry to let him down. Hearing this, Wang gets angry. However, the chief scans his hand to enter the big hall. All the candidates who have passed the test line up behind him, and they take turns reviewing their hands to enter and stand aside, looking toward the hall. Peng thinks what a prominent place. After this, Chief welcomes them for the second exam of the martial arts test, and then he tells them the martial arts test is straightforward. There are monsters provided by the association in the room behind him. They only have to improve the quality of the beast within a week to pass. The association will provide all the material consumed during the evaluation, but if they fail to improve the quality, they have to pay the market price. There's also a certain amount of material and if the amount is exceeded, it's also considered a failure. Then Lai Jin, supervisor of Chang'an's Monsters Division, gets there with the box of candidates' room cards, and all the candidates line up and take their room cards from the pack in turns. While Peng standing there thinks there's no way to know what kind of monsters they will encounter in this random selection process. No wonder it's said that the Monster Trainer's certificate is one of the most challenging certificates to obtain. Wang stands behind him, smiling, and heatedly looks at Peng, thinking he will be proud of himself for a while, and we'll see him later. Then, it was Peng's turn to take out his room card from the box. He hoped for a good draw while picking it up. Then, an invisible monster inside the container gave the card to Peng, and he selected that card and took it out. After this, as he moves forward, Lai Jin walks past him, smiling, then Zhang shows Peng her card number, saying she got room number 6, and then she asks him about his room number, and Peng replies he got number 10. 
Then, the chief tells all candidates to find their room according to the room card they have drawn and announces that the official martial arts examination begins. Then, a guy named Zhu Yuan meets Peng, saying the person in charge of room 10 can tell him what he needs during the assessment. Peng smiles and replies that he will trouble him. Then Peng swipes his card to enter room number 10. And as he enters, an interface appears before him where he gets all the details about the monster and its status. It mentions that the Red River Ape and its status negative lesions have been abolished. And then Peng asks Ju what happened to this Red River Ape. He replies too many experiments have accumulated a lot of waste and conflicting energy in the body, and this Red River Ape should be eliminated. Still, no more monsters are left in the association for him to train. Then Zhu tells Peng when he comes to Director Lai to ask him if there are other monsters in the association, and why he put that Red River Ape on the assessment list. He replies don't worry about it, he has his agenda. Then he calls Wang and tells him that things will be done correctly, and he guarantees that the kid, even if he is good, will not be able to pass the martial arts test. After this, Zhu tells Peng that the Red River Ape has been able to survive until now solely on its perseverance, but the possibility of it being promoted is too low. It has far exceeded the general difficulty, and if he needs it, he can help him apply and keep the results of the written exam and take the martial exam next time. Peng looks toward Ape and replies thanks for his kind words, but he leaves it at that. Then Zhu comes out of the room saying well, he goes for it, Peng gets near the Ape, which was locked up in the cage, and reads his mind and those thoughts that always hurt him when his owner removed him from where he used to live and sent him this place because he was suffering from a disease. Red River Ape remembers their words when they say the material and dosage of the culture solution are correct. Also, there is a severe conflict between energy and the body, and there is no way to start. It's hopeless this Red River Ape is wholly ruined. After this, the Red River Ape gibber tightly holds the cage bars, and Peng sees his image in his eye, and tears start flowing from Ape's eye. Peng tenderly puts his hand on the Ape's head, saying don't worry, he will help him evolve. However, Peng embarks on his mission, an interface appears before him, and he looks at the Red River Ape promotion program. First, he reads the whole information about it as there were two promotion routes, and the standard way of evolution requires much. Material to be consumed has exceeded the amount of materials given for the examination. He has to take the risk and then click on the information he got. Then he made a list of the materials he needed and gave it to Zhu, and then Zhao said black candle grass, skeleton mushroom grass, not, these materials are all toxic. Is he going to train the Red River Ape or kill it? Peng replies while holding the door that a severe disease needs a potent cure, and he doesn't be worried because he knows what he is doing. And then he shuts the door. While Zhao surprisingly thinks the total marks on written exams, it's another guy who can only talk about things on paper. Three days later, injured candidates from room number two were carried on stretchers taken by elevators for treatment. The candidate from room number seven shouted that the monster was almost promoted. What went wrong in room number eight? The guy was angry and pulled his hair violently and made himself bald, saying it was not scientific. The ingredients and proportions of the culture solution strictly followed his requirement. Why was there no effect? These candidates failed in the second martial arts test exam as they could not improve the quality of the monsters. Peng noted all the information, thinking the interface solution was correct. The black candle grass can play a stimulant effect, and the wounds on the body surface have healed. After eating black candle grass for three days in a row, the Red River Ape's spirit and condition have reached a brief peck that undead monsters' cores are also starting to take effect now. Just put the Red River Ape in sulfuric acid water and soak it. While looking toward the keys he got from Zhao and remembering his words, he tells Peng this is the key to the cage. The association provides non-aggressive monsters, but there's no telling how often this Red River Ape has tested and tortured, so watch himself. Peng looks to the keys and thinks it's difficult for monsters to communicate in complex ways without a blood contract, and there's still some risk in releasing the Red River, but they've come this far, and he can only choose to believe it. Then Peng, while looking at Ape, says he will let him out, but he has to be obedient, and Ape Node says yes. Then he opens the cage lock with the key and tells him to come out, and Peng looks at him, smiling slightly, he rushes out, jumps, and clings to Peng. Peng pats its head lovingly and says it's essential to help him get promoted. Then Peng took him to the bath side, where he pulled a large curtain. Behind the curtain was a huge tub full of sulfuric acid water, and he told Ape to lie in and take a dip. He promised he would be transformed. The ape plucks a feather from his skin and throws it into the water. Black smoke spreads as it flows into the water. The ape gets scared to see and shakes his head that he won't enter this water while looking toward him and thinking. 
After this, Peng lovingly puts his hand on the ape's head and says he can give him strength, but he must be courageous as the ape doesn't want to go into that water, but he obeys him and goes ahead and puts his foot in the water. Peng, standing aside, adds that it's so proficient that it makes people feel distressed. As soon as the ape enters the water, black smoke spreads there, and Peng starts coughing, and the alarm starts ringing all around. As the alarm goes off everywhere, the manager from the control room rashly calls the guard, telling them the fire alarm was triggered in room 10 to deal with the fire as soon as possible before it spreads. All the candidates come out of their rooms in fear and start asking each other what's going on. Then, one of them replies that the young man made a mistake in room 10 and caused the fire while the security guard holding the fire extinguisher runs toward Peng's room. Wang stood there smiling, thinking the money was not sent in vain Loalai is reliable as the fire alarm rang, and the security guard reached there. Zhao hit the door with his foot and opened it. As they enter the room, they are surprised to see only smoke but no fire. Peng turns his head to look at them and asks brother Zhao what brought him there, he replies he's making a lot of noise so he comes over to check. Peng apologizes to him as he's a little fascinated when he is busy and doesn't pay attention. Then, one of the guards informs the head office that room 10 has been checked and is clear and tells them to dismiss the alarm. Zhao tells them to go back. However, the candidates standing by the wall and watching one of them say, as that's a lot of noise, the other one replies this kid is too young and inexperienced, while Wang standing with them, thinks there's no monster in the room. The experiment has failed, how will he pretend this time? Meanwhile, Chief Feng Liu arrives when Ape comes out of the water. Wang and the two candidates get scared and turn away here while Wang stays alone. Ape comes out of the water and stands before Peng Chief Feng, Wang Liu, and Zhao, standing there get, surprised to see Liu asks if the Red River Ape. Zhao replies it's not just about written exams, this kid did it. After this, an interface appears before Peng that he completed the evolution of the Red River Ape to avoid substitutionary sensational death skill, and now the Red River Ape turns into a battle bone dead ape. Seeing this, he smiles and thinks he never thought it would work the system is so excellent this is just a small test, and in the future as long as he has enough materials he can promote the quality of any monster. Then Peng checked the ape back and forth from everywhere, thinking after the revolution, the body was much more significant. The gas wrapped around the bones was solid, and the bones looked like metal. Lai tells Chief Feng that this should be a new type of monster that has never been discovered and is still a rare undead monster. While Feng stands there, smiling, and thinks, yes, undead are not very common even within the Alliance. What's genuinely precious is not this new type of monster, it's the one who created this new type of monster. After this, Peng looks back, telling Feng that he succeeded in evolving the Red River Ape. He appreciates Peng, saying he is worth being the first in the written examination. Meanwhile, the monster grabs Peng's shirt from behind and pulls it, then turns to look at him while putting his hand on the monster's colossal finger. He says it has already helped him improve the quality, but he is still unsatisfied. Why, standing there, thinks the monster that is promoted is usually given to the employees of the association as a reward. In the past, he didn't even see this monster, but this time, the beast is different, this time. He is going to get Chief Feng to extend his hand toward Peng saying it looks like this monster is very dependent on him and in that, he will give it to him. Hearing this, Lai and Zhao are shocked. Lai points at the monster and tells Feng to give it to him. Then Feng tells Peng this is a new type of monster that is not recorded, and the data on all aspects are unknown. However, it looks like the upgrade was successful, so he is not losing anything. How about it does he want to take this monster away? Peng thinks it upgraded successfully more than initially. It was just ordinary quality after becoming elite as long as he exceeded level 20. However, an interface appears before him, and while reading it, Peng thinks he can be promoted directly to an epic class monster. But it can be said that it's already an epic class monster, and it's still rare for the undead. Zhao puts his hand on Peng's shoulder, asking why he thinks this isn't a Red River Ape anymore. He wants to go with him, doesn't leave him, and agrees. Meanwhile, Lai adds his point by saying that Feng waits for the president. This seems out of order, and following the association's rule, successfully evolved monsters are usually awarded to the association's employees. Moreover, this Red River Ape has tested six times, and it doesn't have to be this time that it was upgraded. Then Wang comes to them, saying yes, President, this monster should have been eliminated. And this kid is so young. How can he upgrade a beast this is about to die? Then Lai interjects and adds his points in this conversation. So to have such a monster to advance is undoubtedly not something that a person with such a young age and almost no experience can do. And Wang heatedly points to Peng, saying he must have cheated. 
When Chief Feng asks what kind of cheating, Lai raises his hand, saying not to say that this little friend must be cheating. The main reason is that the difficulty of this exam is far beyond what a junior trainer can handle. This little brother also happened to know some methods somewhere and accidentally cued the monster, so this result may not be the actual level of this little brother. Peng stays behind, caring for the beast, and doesn't interrupt them even though he listens to everything they say. Feng surprisingly looks at them, asking what they mean. Is he caught a dead rat by a blind cat to get the monster promoted, so the test results are invalid? Lai replies it's not invalid after all. The outcome is booming, and the certificate that should be combined is still to be given. Otherwise, the impartiality of the association would be questioned, but this monster should still follow the usual rule. Hearing this, Feng laughs and replies that it is because he's not strict in discipline this time. There are not many masters in Chang'an, so he doesn't know how to raise these frogs at the bottom of the well. Then he extends his hand to Peng and says why doesn't he show his skills to let them know that there's a world beyond. However, Peng angrily looks at them, then takes a deep breath, relaxes, and replies he just came to get a certificate. How did he get into all this trouble? Then, while heatedly looking toward Wang, he asks if he is young, so he cheated on the test. Then, he looks toward Lai while pointing to him and asks if he can't do it. He can do it, so he's just blind. Then Peng, fixing his glasses, says not to mention the incompetence and ignorance, and if others do it and he thinks it's impossible, there must be something fishy. Then he tells them the name of the Red River Ape has a river just because it's group lives and is manipulated by the Hongshui River, and its attributes have nothing to do with water because there's a river in the monster's name. It feels like it's river what a foolish. Judging by its previous state, there's more than one idiot who made such a judgment. It was then given a large amount of water and yin materials to swallow. They didn't know the weakness of the Red River Ape is the yin system. If he didn't know this common sense knowledge, he would have lived his age in vain hearing this, and Wang gets furious. Then Wang shouts, asking Peng if he's saying that the Red River Ape's weakness is the yin system. It's a wood system. Then, Chief Feng adds his point and speaks to Wang that although the Red River Ape will have a fearful response to the wood system, its weakness is indeed the yin system, and this is also the exam point. After this, while touching the monster, Peng says that because the strength of the Red River Ape's body goes deep into the bone marrow, it's hard to clear it, so he does the opposite. He was given black candle grass for three days to strengthen his soul. It was supplemented by many undead materials and stimulated by undead monster crystals. There is nothing to hide, but he advises him to try it casually. If he doesn't know this, don't just toss it around because the order in which the materials are added and the ratio between them matters. He is sure what the tested monster will become after all if the red water ape were to be extinct. In this way, he can't afford this responsibility. Hearing this, Chief Feng moves toward Peng while clapping. He says if his ability to take the junior trainer certificate is wrong, he will grant him a certificate as an intermediate monster trainer. Then he put his hand on Peng's shoulder, telling him the intermediate certificate was beyond his authority, and that he must go to the Yanjing headquarters to accept the assessment. Still, with his qualifications, he would get it, so he worked hard. Peng thanks him for this appreciation. After this, while looking at Wang and Lai, Chief Feng asks angrily as to cheating who cheated. Does he think he is the board chairman and can't find out who just said that this Red River Ape was a test piece that was supposed to be eliminated? So why is the test item that is to be eliminated in the examination room again? Hearing this, Wang and Lai get shocked and afraid as all the candidates are present there, and they start discussing each other after listening to Chief. Jiang says she always felt that Wang Shu's speech is weird, while the other one also adds saying there is also examiner Lai. Who isn't quite right, he has been targeting Gao Peng. Then Zhao raises his hand, saying he can testify while Lai shouts from behind and tells him to stop, but Zhao says that it was Director Lai who deliberately added the Red River Ape to this assessment list. And while pointing to Wang, he tells Director Lai did this because he took bribes from the candidate Wang Shu and the evidence is in the monster's mobilization record, which can be found upon investigation. Hearing this, Wang falls in fear, saying it over. Chief Fang angrily shouts, telling now that the evidence is there as the president of the Chang'an Monster Trainer Association. He declares candidate Wang Shu has severely cheated and is exempt from this reference qualification and will not be allowed to participate in the Chang'an Monster Trainer Association examination in the next three years. Former supervisor Lai Jin was expelled from the Chang'an Monster Train Teachers Association and will never be hired. Candidates there gets happy to see the justice and security Gurad took Lai and Wang. After this, Chi Feng looked toward Peng and asked if today was really a joke for him and why doesn't he sit in his office and have a cup of tea, 
and he also has to ask him to do a little favor. After this, Feng invites Peng for tea in Feng Zhu's office, and a conversation starts between the two. Feng invites him to represent CH Nagan City in the World Monster Trainers competition, and when Feng asks him about this competition, he explained that just now, he also told him that the number and quality of trainers in Chang'an City could be more optimistic, which is why he has never had good results in significant monster trainers competitions for several years. Then Feng tells him by waving his hand that if he is willing to represent Chang'an City, it has only been three years since the world changed. The world monster trainers competition has no strict age limit. Whether it's the elderly, middle-aged, or young people, they all stand on the same starting line. However, in terms of growth and potential, young talents like him must have an advantage. And after hearing this, Peng laughs and sees this, Feng surprisingly asks him if he is not interested. Feng also pretends to be upset. Then he says it's a pity after all the top players can get a prize, the top 10 can get at least 10,000 credits, and he is too selfish to want him. Hearing this, Peng quickly stood up, saying wait a minute. Seeing this, Feng said, taking on so much pressure. Peng relaxed and replied respect for President Feng. What pressure is this? The greater the ability, the greater the responsibility, and this competition, he will go. After this, he goes to the bus station with the ape monster while standing on the footpath. He looks at the intermediate certificate he got from Chang'an City Monster Division Academy. Peng named the Skull Ghoul Ape Dummy because he liked being alone in a daze. While looking toward the intermediate certificate, he thinks as he heard that 30 points would be added to the college entrance exam. After this, while entering the bus, he felt the exam was great. Not only did he get an elite quality monster, but he also made a great profit and got the identity token. Usually, the efficiency of this kind of organization could be higher, and it is convenient to have a good relationship with the president. While sitting on the bus, he thinks he is going to the competition because it sounds very annoying. Meanwhile, two boys standing behind him look toward the monster and talk to each other in a low tone. One asks to look, the one in front is a rare undead monster. The other one replies he can see the bones, so he can't go wrong. As he stands up, thinking undead, how interesting. He wonders what would happen if he removed a bone, and then he extends his hand from behind toward Dummy. Dummy first binds his fingers and arms, and later, he ties them all with an invisible thread while Peng is sitting in the front seat. This is happening behind him, and he is not aware at all as he is lost in his thoughts about bonuses of 10,000 credits then he thinks about those people under the roof people with low incomes don't have the right to choose. Dummy tightly bound that boy with his invisible threat, and he was about to put out his eye by driving his nail into his eye. Meanwhile, Peng calls him, and Dummy leaves, the boy there comes near Peng to listen to him while touching him. Peng says to support him, and Dazzy thinks he can only do this. Dazzy eats a lot, and looking at Dummy, he says, look at his size, he won't eat less. It's hard to raise him, also. Whom Dummy bound, sitting in the back seat in shock, Peng smiled, saying forget it. Who told him to be so handsome at such a young age and so genius heaven will be jealous. People sitting there talking to each other while looking toward Peng and Dummy, saying that this boy hasn't signed a contract with a monster. How could he make such a fierce monster so obedient? And when did they have such an aggressive man in Chang'an City? After this, they both get off the bus. Standing there, Peng asks why they don't ask Sister Tang to discuss it. Then Dummy suddenly pushes him back and stands before him. At first, Peng doesn't understand why Dummy did this, but when he stands in front of him, he understands that Dummy is worried about him being attacked. After this, Peng comes up and tells Dummy not to worry, they will be a family from now on. Dazzy is standing there, and Dummy does it all to protect him from Dazzy. Then Peng introduces them to each other while looking toward Dazzy. He gets worried because Dazzy gets so healthy. Tang came from there, saying Dazzy, and she was there to pick him up then. Peng, while pointing toward Dazzy, asks what's going on. Tang replied with a smile how is it? Dazzy is now very healthy and robust, she gave him a lot of food. Meanwhile, an interface appears there about Dazzy's health, he is exceptionally overnourished, and Peng thinks he is healthy and robust. Then she adds that Dazzy was too skinny before, so he needed to be more careful. Dazzy and Dummy both look at each other and stand facing their sides. Peng is shocked, and Tang waves her hand and says, ignore the details, don't be more severe than she asks him about the exam, and he replies it's not bad. He encountered a monster that failed to level up six times, and he upgraded him casually and got an intermediate monster trainer certificate with ease. Then he introduces Dummy to Tang, saying the president of the trainers association must give him the monster that has been successfully leveled up and he can't refuse to give him face. When she surprisingly asks about the intermediate monster training certificate while showing her the certificate, 
He replies, it's true. After this, she smiled and came close to him, saying his growth rate surprised her and that she would talk to him about it after a while when he was surprised. She asks him if he knows why the monster has such a high status and then tells him, in short, that the monsters they use, no matter how strong they are, are still monsters. The next day, Peng thinks while doing yoga that the Imperial Monster's secret technique is a damage transfer that can transfer all the damage he receives to his nightmare. Although the range is limited and can only be turned on by the subjective choice of the beast, the defensive power of the beast is far from that of a human. As the monster upgrades, it gains more vitality and defense, so this move is more beneficial to him. After learning it was Dazzy, an invisible thread connected him, but it looks like the contract is made, and Sister Tang could take out such things casually. Her origins are complex. Meanwhile, Dazzy walks up to him and stands next to the table. Seeing him, Peng says how fat he has become while touching his head. He says it like a fat purple pig, and then Dummy stands holding the mirror. Peng mentions and asks him to come near and bring the mirror. He puts the mirror in front of Dazzy and tells him to look at himself. Dazzy, after looking into the mirror, lies down on the floor depressed, and Peng sits next to him and comforts him by placing his hand on him, saying don't play dead. Get up and give him some good exercise in these few days to lose this body fat and after the reduction, he will provide him with a quality upgrade. Then Peng thinks that he and Dazzy are flying in the air. He gets a little worried and thinks he doesn't want to have a fat flying centipede in the future. Then, on the second day in Chang'an city center, Peng goes to meet Tang as there are stores and supermarkets he is finding. Her sees him from a distance, and she waves her hand to call him there. Sees her, he says, Sister Tang, he let her wait for a long time. She replies, teasing him that how could she? Peng is already an intermediate monster trainer willing to help her with her little company, so she couldn't be happier. Hearing this, he smiled, and then she said forget it, she won't tease him, she came out to pick him up and wanted to tell him something before she partnered with other people to open this small monster training institution. They also invested a lot of money in it, but the partners ran away with the money some time ago, and the trainers were taken away from the store. After this, she pointed toward her store, and he said this is an excellent location he also asked her if it was the busiest part of downtown and if the rent wasn't cheap. She replied with a smile the business was good, so she rented this place, but ever since the trainers were taken away, the life has gone downhill. While talking to her, he feels that she is strange today, she moves forward and says he will come with her. After this, they move ahead, she points to the elevator, telling him the studio is on the third floor, and as for the treatment, as she said before, the salary is at the highest rate in the industry and he will be given 20% of the shares. Then they enter the elevator, and she presses button no 3 to reach the third floor. She also tells him he shouldn't worry, he won't be delayed in his studies, drop by on the weekend, and the job of the monster trainer is straightforward. Then he confusingly asks if this salary is too high for Tang. According to this treatment, there are also many monster trainers in the market, and she can recruit them at will. Both emergencies are no problem. She replies better shortage than stubbornness, not having a monster trainer is trivial, but they can't smash the sign. Hearing this, he thinks first of a powerful monster control technique and then a store in the city's heart with such a generous offer, if it were anyone else, he would suspect this is a trap. But this is Tang. He has been an orphan for the past three years, without her secretive care, his livelihood would be a problem. Then he relaxes, thinking Sister Tang will harm him, and it doesn't matter if the treatment is too generous according to his actual ability, it is not unworthy. He can make more money for her in the future, and he'll listen to Sister Tang. Looking at him, she says she wishes them happy cooperation while thinking it was intense. Fortunately, Peng seems to have found nothing wrong. After this, they reach the third floor. A girl named Zun Kwangkwan welcomes them, and then Tang introduces them to each other, telling Peng that this is the person she hired as their receptionist. Then Tang goes to the elevator and reveals what's inside Peng as she has already explained everything to her, and she will show him the environment, and introduce colleagues. She still has things to do, and then she leaves through the elevator. He gets a little irritated by her move, and then Zun, pointing toward Fei Peng Monster Trainer Studio, tells them they must complete the registration information there. After this, she starts registering the information while looking toward him, she thinks he is so young, and then she takes his monster training intermediate certificate, considering it's estimated that the boss with a lot of money was fooled and cheated again. Peng, sitting there while drinking water, thinks if he wants to earn enough money for Sister Tang. The charging standard also needs to be set, unlike other trainers, as long as he follows his instructions, he will have almost 100% success rate in advancing to the next level 
and in this case the fee will not be the same as other trainers. Although he doesn't love money to receive less, the desecration of knowledge is also disrespectful to Goldfin. So he multiplies a lossy by three at the current highest price for an intermediate monster trainer. Then Zun returns his certificate, saying the information has been entered, it's just this fee standard. Is he sure he wants to set it to be three times the maximum fee for an intermediate monster trainer? He may only be aware of this with experience in the studio. It's not a big deal if he doesn't follow the rules and he doesn't get clients, but it's not a trivial matter if it affects the studio's reputation. As he asks her intention suddenly, Mr. Ma suddenly opens the door and enters, saying to Peng he has to prove that he has this ability three times the maximum charge. That, pointing to Peng, he worriedly says as long as he can cure his monster it doesn't matter how many times it is he will give him ten times as much as he can. Ten times, he will provide him with ten times the price if his beast gets promoted. Zun tells him to relax as a gentleman, but he doesn't listen to her. Peng replies that's unnecessary, showing his three fingers while folding the other two. He says this is his first order, so even if it's a big bonus, triple it. Ma asks him so he is confident that he can cure his beast. Peng asks what rush he needs to see where his beast is before he can answer accurately. Hearing this, he shows the small box, saying he will believe his once, then he shows them holding that small injured rat. Zun gets worried to see such a tiny beast. Then Ma, while leading his beast to Peng, says can he. In a word, meanwhile, an interface appears before Peng. He reads all the information about the purple lightning rat. Also, he gets the warning that to cure the beast, they've to deal with dangerous mutations in conflict as soon as possible and he asks Ma what he gave him to eat to make him look like this. He is surprised and replies that he gave him a blood jade mushroom. He wanted him to mutate and evolve, so he worriedly asks Peng if he could cure him. Peng thinks this purple mouse is already in the process of evolution. Still, it has led to this result only because of the conflict between the power of the blood system and the lighting system's capacity. The purple rat can complete its evolution using the system's plan to turn match into complementarity. Then he orders Zun to bring five shadow fruits, one red maple heart, a pair of thunder gold leaves, and one blood of bat monster crystal core. After this, while pointing to Ma with a finger, Peng says he knows the rules for trainers, they'll come up with a plan, and they can help him with the materials, but he will have to pay for it himself, and Ma agrees. After Peng gets close to the injured mouse, saying little one, don't worry with him there, it's hard for him to fail to evolve, they take the beast to the treatment room. Peng was ready, wearing gloves and a scrub suit. Ma and Zun wordly stood aside. Ma asked if this was the best way to upgrade his purple lightning mouse. Peng replied while the mouse was held onto the cutting board with one hand while the knife was born in the other hand and asked if there was a problem. Then Peng throws it in the pot on the stove and starts spooning from the top. Ma runs toward him to stop doing this while Zun, standing behind doing the calculation, asks Ma how much he pays. Seeing this, Ma holds his head in tension. Peg asks if he wants to sip rat soup to nourish Yin and Yang. When Ma shouts no, Peng smiles and tells him not to be nervous, just a joke to lighten the mood. Then he shows him the mouse relaxing in the pot and tells him this is not a soup. It's a medical bath he has prepared for his beast heating is only to enhance the absorption of the medicine. Ma thinks he must calm down, and Peng says the sky will come down on him. First, he must cook twice more. Seeing this, Ma thinks there are only two senior monster trainers in the entire city of Chang'an and they are both very high status people, so he can't get an appointment. Now, he can only try this pen, at least an intermediate monster trainer, but he is only with means if something happens. Ten minutes later, he surprisingly asks Peng if it is ready and if it takes a little too long to cook. He replies don't be worried, it's almost time. Suddenly, the pot explodes, its cover falls aside, and the mouse from the bank jumps around so fast that he makes a mess all over the room, and everything breaks. Seeing it, Ma excitedly says it worked. He has succeeded in upgrading his beast as the interface appears in front of Peng, and he says he has made a fortune. This is a perfect quality double system with a little bit of training. He can be promoted to leader level beast. Then the mouse sits on Ma's hand, and he happily looks toward Peng and apologizes for his previous rudeness. Also, he doesn't expect to make his beast advance and thank him. Peng politely replies there's nothing to thank him for, he's just paying him for his service, then gives him the list, telling him this is the damage to his office plus the consultation fee. Then he gave Zun a list, saying to follow this list and send the material to his house, the cost would be deducted from his commission. Ma says Peng wants to ask him to look at his other beast. Can he still make an appointment for tomorrow? Money is not a problem, and he can pay. But Peng refuses his offer, telling it not that he has to go to class tomorrow and doesn't have time. 
Ma says that he still needs to study at his level. Is it an association training class, or is it a master class? While picking up his bag and jacket, he replies to the third year of high school formal education, then leaves, saying he will go home from work and do his homework. Seeing this, Zun and Ma are shocked. Ma asks, they are all high school students nowadays, so terrifying. She replies Sister Tang bought the studio a few days ago at a high price, dismisses all the monster trainers, and asks her to keep it secret to deceive Peng. The next day, Tang, in her home, while holding a glass of wine, orders her invisible beast to send the crystal core toward Dazzy in Peng's home. Dazzy was crawling on the floor. As soon as the invisible beast threw the crystal core into the house through the window near Dazzy, he went near it, put it in his mouth, and started chewing. On the other side, Peng was returning from the supermarket with food for Dummy, thinking the 15 pounds of cedar pine needles were enough for Dummy to eat for a month. He is currently elite quality, and if he continues to evolve, he will be a perfect quality. He is a perfect quality monster. He has only heard of them in books and on TV. It is better to give Dummy good nutrition for some time and then consider continuing the evolution of things more appropriately. Peng gets a bit worried thinking Dazzy's side can't be more urgent to upgrade. He needs a level 10 and higher lightning monster crystal cores, and this stuff is hard to find. And even if he finds one, he most likely can't afford it. Suddenly, he hears something burst out in his home. He runs towards the house, rushes up the stairs, and quickly opens the door to call Dummy. He is shocked to see Dazzy lying on one side and his previous body on the other. Meanwhile, an interface appeared before him. Dazzy took much blood and flesh from the lightning Vajra centipede with the monster crystal core because of the same centipede species, and in the same evolutionary direction as the purple-backed yellow-clawed centipede is in the process of evolution. He was surprised to read the interface. While sitting aside, Dazzy thought about how he could eat something so expensive and who would give it to him, and he felt Sister Tang watching from behind the door. When she sees that he has seen her, she goes in coughing. Peng asks him if she gave Dazzy the crystal core, and when she laughs, he angrily asks her why she is doing this, it's good to say so in advance. She smiles while thinking if she told him in advance, then he wouldn't have wanted it, Then she says she is there to deliver something to him. Then she asks, keeping his shopping bags on the floor, look how sloppy he is, he left his stuff halfway down the road and didn't care. Then she, standing near the door of her house, says he is so spendthrift after only a few days of earning money he calls her, but she goes into her home and closes the door, saying he gets some rest and won't bother him anymore. Peng thinks there is a need, so Sister Tang feels that he needs it, and then he slaps Dazzy, scolding him for not eating whatever he sees in the future. After this, Dazzy lies on the floor, and Peng sits beside reading the interface, but Dazzy doesn't care about it. Peng sits there thinking, is there any way he can complete the upgrade quickly? Then he goes to the kitchen and searches all the belongings of Monster's medical treatment. He finds a medium-grade purple poison flower, grinds it into a medicinal juice, and feeds it to Dazzy as it will help him evolve. Then he puts the medicine juice in Dazzy's mouth, and as soon as the medicine juice goes into his mouth, Dazzy gets up, and a bright light breaks through the window and out of the house. Dazzy gets quickly active and suddenly falls on the floor. Looking toward Dazzy, Peng says he didn't think it would be so easy for Dazzy to become an epic quality, and is this the joy of holding a big leg? While Dummy was worriedly standing aside, seeing him, Peng says Dazzy is usually annoying, and he is still so worried about him. But don't worry, it's just a loss of strength. Giving Dummy a plate of cedar pine needles, Peng smiles and says that compared to his appearance, he is too kind, this is specially bought for him today, eat it. When Dummy eats these pine needles, some fall out of his hand on the floor. Peng quickly cleans it up and tells him to eat like a good boy. He thinks he has just completed the upgrade. It's better to stabilize it, and it will upgrade him after he finds the most suitable material, and he will become a powerful beast. Meanwhile, Dazzy stands up smilingly while Peng falls asleep on the couch, and Dummy leans on the same couch to rest. Seeing this, Dazzy puts a blanket on Peng and lies down with him in the same blanket. From the window, Tang considers the three of them resting and thinks, is it the calm before the storm? Peng has to grow up as soon as possible. The next day, in the school principal's office, the principal was shouting at the teacher as he disagreed with him for bringing a monster into the school, saying the students in the school are still children. None of them have been professionally trained. Haven't the people above considered their safety? Teacher fearfully replies in times of peace, this age is still considered a child in ancient times. People in this age already took weapons to defend the country. The principal added that the situation is so extreme that teachers bend their heads and reply. Although new technologies are being researched worldwide, 
and the speed is too slow. If things happen like this when the day comes when his technology is no longer a threat to them, it'll be later than the old principal. However, in the classroom, students gathered near Peng. One asked him if he got the Intermediate Monster Trainer Certificate. Peng asked him how he knew the boy while showing Chang in daily newspaper and said he was in the newspaper. Then all his fellows stand close to him and start praising him, saying he is so famous and now a big celebrity, and this is a great way to make their class look good. Lai Zigong was in the class fellow and was there for the Monster Trainer exam. Then, in the present time in the classroom, a boy, while laughing, says it just killed Lai Zigong miserably. When Zigong heard that his mother was also at the exam, he started to hang his head on the beam and stab his head in the chest, which tormented him a lot. Then a boy from his class came close, saying to him politely that he had a small request to make Peng stop him from talking about it, as he said it himself. It was an unwanted request, and it was not going to be difficult for him alone. But for both of them and it's not a good deal hearing this the shout angrily shout. Teacher Mirong stood behind him, slapped that student, and started yelling at her class, telling everyone to back down. She announced to make all the students fearfully sit on their seats. When everyone goes to their place, she stands next to the table and announced that from now on, all school around the world are urgently reformed. The second year of high school will have a new course on beasts, as well as a unique particular recruitment channel, was added at the same time. It is a joint project of the Union Ministry of Education and the Union Military. The best students can be recruited directly by the top military academies. The military coaches will be in place soon, and students interested in joining the academies will begin training this afternoon. If they want to be a particular student, see her as soon as possible after class to sign up. Hearing this, students start talking to each other. Meanwhile, teacher Mirong comes to Peng and tells him to come out as she wants to talk to him. After this, they both come out of the class, where she tells him that he did well this time. He got the Intermediate Monster Trainer's certification immediately. The principal also praised him by name in the meeting. Tomorrow, the seventh high school students are coming, and the school would like him to represent their school as a freshman. Feng humbly hands up, smiling, and replies to Teacher Murong, forget about the speech. This kind of thing needs to be lowered profile, and suit him. Also, he would like to apply for the particular student of the Imperial Ambassador. Mirong asks him why he suddenly has this intention, and it is true that being an Imperial Ambassador is a pretty good way to go, but it doesn't make much sense to him. Meanwhile, the military tank gets there, and as soon as she hears the horn sound, she looks through the window, saying his grades are excellent. With regular play and the bonus of an Intermediate Monster Trainer's certificate, he will get a lot of credit and he can try all the top academies in China and foreign academies. And suppose he wants to become an imperial ambassador. He can also use his cultural achievement to enter the military academy and apply for related majors without rushing. An army man was preparing the beast on the other side of the school grounds by fixing its belt. Peng looked through the window and thanked teacher Mirong for being so considerate of him. Also, entering the military academy before becoming an imperial ambassador is safer. But this is too slow, he wants to learn more from actual combat training and grow stronger quickly. Then he asks if it should be possible to take both exams simultaneously as he won't give up either opportunity, and she can rest assured. Nurong replies that she won't stop him since he has his ideas, but she hopes he can think it over, he bends down and thanks her. After this, all students from the junior and senior campuses gathered on the ground in the afternoon. The selection group was also there, and they looked very confident. Peng stood aside when Tan Kyanjin from the crowd waved a hand and called Peng, asking if he had also signed up to be an Imperial Ambassador student. He rashly came near him, asking if he isn't a monster trainer and has such good results. Peng formally asked if his grades were also good, so why did he sign up, too? When Tan excitedly talks about his childhood dream, he liked to watch animated films before, which were God's favorite treasure, and the monsters in them were remarkable. He wanted to be the more vital amassed and couldn't miss this opportunity. Peng asks, what if the most vital ambassador is a man? Does he want to be his man? Tan says the most critical ambassador is a form word, not a noun. Peng leaves there, saying keep up, the field is just ahead. As soon as the tank passes the ground area, students start talking to each other as they see the genuine tank for the first time. After this, the host asks Colonel to come for a speech. Seeing Colonel there, Tan stands aside. Peng asks if he is their instructor, as he's not that special except for being a bit stronger, and screams in fear when he sees the beast there. Peng stands there thinking what a murderous aura this colonel isn't. Simple then the colonel starts his speech, saying first of all, he has to commend them. They all have a lot of balls compared to the people who are afraid to come. 
but he doesn't think they've become an imperial ambassador. And while clinching fish, he says without a firm mind, without the will to stell, they will be pissing their pants the moment they see an absolute monster in the wild, and their legs will be as soft as noodles, and they won't be able to run away. Students there get angry at listening to the colonel's words and start talking to each other, saying this is too much of a disgrace, it's just the imperial ambassador as if no one has seen it before. Then, the colonel asks them if they don't like it, and he will show them the beast that military men were bringing to the colonel. After this, he orders the military man to set the target, and then he shows them all there, saying reporting sir, the target is 10 centimeters thick, and the three type armor plate has been set up then the colonel tells the beast to go ahead, then beast run and break the thick armor. All the students stood there, scared to see this peng standing there. They thought, how could such a thick armor plate be broken in one blow? Then the colonel asks them to see what he means. This is the killing power of a trained beast. In other words, the monster they will face in the future will have the same or even greater ability to kill. And this is their last chance. Those who want to quit step out now. Hearing this, Peng stands there and thinks so many have gone. It seems many hot-headed people came. Then the colonel asks what with the head down as it is not like he has done anything wrong. Study hard. Studying is also a good way out. He's out of deserters, he just made a rational choice to return to class. But he is different, he has chosen to stay from now on if anyone gives up. He's a real deserter, and he doesn't want any deserters. Has he got it? When Peng replies yes, Colonel shouts louder, and he can't hear him, he loudly replies. After returning home from school, Peng is tired and sits with his head on the couch and starts thinking. Although mentally prepared, he doesn't expect the situation to be much more severe than he thought. Meanwhile, Dazzy came to him asking for food and Dummy was sitting back then while moving toward the fridge. He thought, according to what Colonel Chen said, today, in one month, all institutes in the city will have to eliminate 12 O students from enrollment. This elimination rate is also too high. As soon as he opens the fridge and sees that there is nothing to eat, he angrily asks where the cedar pine needles are. He shouts only one hand. What the hell is going on Daisy? Sitting on the couch, replies, it ate, then Peng comes to Dummy, saying next time if he wants to eat more he has to tell him when Dummy sit his back to Peng then while touching his back he says he's sure he didn't say he is wrong dumbheaded. After this, Peng was sitting on the couch thinking, according to the property box, that Dummy needed to absorb 600 pounds of cedar pine needles. The first stage was almost complete when an interface appeared before him. Then he ordered cedar pine needles and lightning flower fruit and thought one caddy of cedar pine needles was thousand union currency and only 1.5 patas a day, which is still affordable and reasonable to eat. The more beneficial substances are absorbed, the faster they can move on to the next evolution. Dummy is still only an elite rank monster, and when it's at a higher rank, the material he will need to consume will be more precious. Some materials are even priceless and will only be obtainable by burning money. Then, looking toward Dazzy as he was eating food, he thought he needed to take 200 pounds of lightning flower fruit to advance to perfect quality. The thunder flower fruit is cheaper than the cedar pine needles, and he can buy a pound of them for a hundred union coins then thinking this all he get worried saying to himself it's not easy to raise a family. After this, he goes to the monster park where monsters are fighting each other, and their owner prevents them from fighting, pulling the belts around their neck and leading them to the other side. Seeing a giant pig, Peng gets surprised and thinks, forgive others, this pig is too exaggerated. Then he asks the pig's owner if it is her beast. As it is pretty healthy, can she make it give a tiny space? Hearing her beast is blocking the gate, she gets upset. Then she remembers when she bought and raised it, and with teary eyes, she replies that it wasn't like this, and Peng is quiet, thinking she didn't understand his words. Then, Instructor Zhang came there with his beast and asked what happened, and Peng, looking toward him, thought it was a coach. He wondered if the beast was blocking the way and ordered his silver beast all his. When his beast angrily looked at the pig, he got scared and stood up. Coach Zhao said the show was over and asked if they were to start training immediately. After this, the beast training started, and all the students were standing on the ground with their beasts, when the coach told them that he knew some wanted to sign more beasts in the future to form a complete combat squad. Today, they will first train their command of the beast, which is a fundamental and significant part. Otherwise, even if their beast is strong, it will listen to the authority equal to zero. Peng stood there and looked toward the pig and its owner while Zhao's speech continued while addressing everyone there. He said he believed they had just seen the opposite of the lesson. Then Zhao, while touching his silver moon wolf, asked if they wanted to train their beast. They must understand their habits and preferences to establish a good relationship with it in a targeted way. 
for example, his silver moon wolf because he bought its favorite black clad proc and fed it personally. He played and slept with it every day, so now its reliance on him has improved a lot, and it's willing to obey his command. And they've seen the colonel's beast smash the armor plate with its before. But the tale is in he silver moon wolf's natural strong point it's just that after months, and months of systematic training its tail gradually become more challenging and swings faster and more accurately. It had an additional means of attack besides its teeth and claws, and this is the colonel's training method, developing its attack diversity and enhancing its advantage. Then the coach orders Old Lie to show everyone there his silver fox skills again. Old Lie, while throwing a stone in his hand, says it's the same silver moon wolf, but different training methods used for various battles, and there are other directions of development then says everyone to watch this. He throws this stone away and the wolf jumps while crossing everyone there and follows this stone and bites it. Peng gets surprised, thinking what a horrible bite. Thazzy was also standing aside from him. Then Zhao tells the students about the current classification of the beast that there are five categories, attack, defense, support, healing, and field control, and the fact is that there are a lot of people who can do multiple categories. For example, the green devil vine can act as both a defensive and a control type. The most important thing is that they must be able to use it as an attacker. Then he clapped, saying he had already given them a demonstration. There was the official start of training, and he suggested that it is best to start with simple materials such as training bite force to choose wood first and then gradually increase the hardness. As for the source of materials, they've shipped many training materials, and they don't have to worry. Those who have chosen a training route can register and receive training materials. Hearing this, Peng thinks about what else the Dazzy needs to strengthen. Looking toward the Dazzy, he thinks the secret art of damage transfer has been learned before, so he has to improve its defense first. But how should he train to improve it? Speaking of which, it's incredible that such a small ape could move such a big box, so he guessed it was a strength type. Then he thought about the ape, and he remembered seeing in the studio's archive a kind of mutant ape monster with sparse hair called the Fierce Fist Ape. Fierce nature is very warlike, but the defense is deficient, so the first ape from birth will be trained by their parents crazy to use their own body to hit the tree trunk. At first, they hit the trees and then the rocks, mountain walls, and so on. Later, they would hit rocks and mountain walls, and the repeatedly injured and healed ski became more challenging and demanding over time. When the ape becomes an adult, thick muscles, calluses, and scars gather to form something similar to armor. At this time, they wouldn't suffer the slightest injury even if they hit the mountain wall, so he decided to follow this training method to train the defense of Dazzy, and then chose the training material. Meanwhile, Dazzy is trying to run away and hide behind the tree. Peng calls him, waving his hand, and says, come on. Dazzy says he has already chosen a training method for him, but training in this way. He is doing it for his own good, it is better to have pain now than for the rest of his life. While bringing the hammer, Peng says it can take a little bit of strength and sweat now not to bleed. As soon as Dazzy sees the hammer, he gets scared while Peng, holding the hammer, laughs, telling him to be good, he will be gentle. Dazzy runs away, and Peng also follows him, holding a hammer to stop him, saying it's for his good and that he must understand his pain. He finally caught up with Dazzy while the hammer almost dislocated his arm. One week later, Peng was sleeping, and it was seven alcock. The alarm rang, and he snapped it, thinking he didn't have to go to training today. He would sleep a little more in the morning. Meanwhile, Dazzy bangs the door with a bowl, saying he is hungry. Peng comes out of the room, telling him to knock, he will immediately make breakfast. Then he goes to the kitchen and starts making breakfast, in the sleepy state. He thinks about Dazzy and that he is the one who upgrades. But why does he suffer so much? Not only has his strength increased, but his speed has increased, and his skills in making pancakes have become more and more proficient. However, Dazzy upgraded to level 10, and Peng thinks that, fortunately, Dazzy didn't eat for nothing during this period of extra meals. Not only did he grow more extensively, but he also successfully reached the 10th level, and he's not sure if he is going to be able to get a good deal on this to do defense training for Dazzy. His arms are almost broken, and Dummy also ate up his salary. It's hard for him to feed these two ancestors thinking these tears start flowing from his eye. Meanwhile, Peng's phone rang, and Dummy put Peng's mobile phone on speaker. He introduces himself, saying he is the general manager of Blue Shield Security Company, and his name is Liu Senlin Peng. He replies that he wonders why he is looking for him while thinking of Blue Shield Security Company, which he has never dealt with before and has never heard of. When Peng does respond, Liu says on behalf of Blue Shield Security, he would like to talk to him about something that would greatly benefit him, 
and he wonders if he has time to speak in person. After some time, Peng goes to Fei Peng's studio, where Zun tells him his visitor is already waiting for him. He goes to his office, where Liu Senlin is, and then they meet and introduce themselves. Liu says he is Blue Shield Security Company's general manager, and is there to ask him to work as a monster trainer consultant for their company. Then Peng tells him to sit down and talk first and then asks why he is looking for him as there are senior trainers in Chang'an City, and he isn't the only intermediate monster trainer. Also, he needs to find out what kind of reputation he has that would make the general manager of an extensive security company like Blue Shield come to his door on purpose. Then Liu smiles and replies he is too modest as there are senior trainers in Chang'an, but one of them is the president of the Monster Trainers Association. Chen, and he doesn't have time to be a consultant for a small company like his. The other one is Mr. Gu Zianlin, but he is also the government full-time trainer consultant. Then, pointing to Peng, he says as for the other mid-level trainers, he prefers to believe in the young and talented Mr. Gao Peng than those people. Peng replies, first of all, there are his demands, he can accept these conditions before they continue, otherwise, there is no need to waste their feelings, instead, he has classes from Monday to Friday. Unless it is a very urgent situation, don't disturb him during the week. Second, it's okay for him to be a trainer consultant, but he will sign a buyout exclusivity contract, and he can only guarantee that he will help his competitors. Liu smiles and says he agrees, then, giving Peng the contract paper, he asks if he thinks this part-time contract they prepared is appropriate. While reading the contract paper, Peng believes this contract needs to be corrected. There are no mandatory requirements. The salary is 500 credits per year plus commission and 50 credits for every mantis from Blue Shield. While signing the contract paper, Peng thought the company's owner seemed rich and inconsistent, but this almost non-binding contract could be signed. Meanwhile, Sun knocked on the door and entered, telling Peng that Mr. Ma, who had made an appointment earlier, had arrived. And then Liu got up, saying since the contract was signed, he would not bother him anymore. Then he goes from there, saying he looks forward to future cooperation. Peng replies manager Liu is very polite. Then Liu goes back through the elevator to the second floor while talking to someone on the phone and informing them about the contract. Also, Peng has chosen a part-time job but needs to understand why there are so many trainers in Chang'an. Why must it be? But he gets it. However, Peng examines the seasoned begonia demon in the medical treatment room. Doing this, he asks Ma what he said last time. That's it, he replies yes, then Peng asks if it is a plant-based beast as the flowers are relatively pretty, the leaves have fuchsia patterns and serrated edges, and they have a slight fragrance. He wants to evolve this flower demon. Ma replies yes, there will be a flower king competition in Chang'an City in half a month, and he will use it to compete for the position of flower king. Surprised, Peng starts his work thinking the flower king competition isn't a beauty pageant, although the plants are wildly mutated. But the plant-based beasts that can give birth to spiritual wisdom are missing Zine even because of its healing properties. It's more sought after than the undead system. And now it is compared. This kid is lucky and makes people envious. Meanwhile, Zun gets there as she stands behind Ma and surprisingly says that the Flower King competition is for girls to participate in. Ma replies that he knows he is a big man to compete for the Flower King, which will look extraordinary. After this, Ma sticks his finger with the beast and says it's his second beast, and he hopes to give it a good start. He believes he has the right idea and wants to make it open his heart. Then, while looking toward Peng, he requests him to evolve his beast so he has a better chance of taking the tournament. Peng, standing there, thinks he didn't realize that Ma was so concerned about his beast. Peng humbly replies don't worry, leave it to him. Then Peng tells the usual rules three times the charge while Zun brings the terminal and means Ma to swipe his card. Seeing this, he is surprised. After getting the payment, Peng ordered Zun to prepare 200 materials tree essences, 50 drops of flower spirit dew, one leaf of spirit flower, one golden bell, one caddy of fat sea, and one black wind grass. She replied that they were all common ingredients, that the store had them in stock, and that they would be ready soon. As soon as the ingredients are prepared, she gives them to Peng, and he tells both of them to leave the room. Also, they too should go out and not disturb his work, and then he closes the room door. After this, Ma opens the door a little and peeks inside. Sun stops him from disturbing Peng as Peng prepares the injection and moves toward the beast, stating good boy, it hurts just a little. Don't be afraid, he injects its back, and the beast starts crying. Ma screams and runs to save his beast, but Sun silences him by placing her hand over his mouth and stops him, saying calm down, it is all for the good of his beast. 
After this, Peng tells them to come in and asks if they have seen a level 4 plant-based beast. They both get happy to see the beast. Ma gets so excited he hugs Peng tightly and thanks him. But Peng gets irritated because Ma holds him so tight while extricating himself, saying he can thank him but not do anything to him. On the other side, in the training ground, a girl named Mu Ting was training her beasts, but the beasts repeatedly failed in the training and fell. Her companions stood there watching her. One said they could not get into a good school even if they passed the test. The other added that they would still have to work from 9 to 5 after they got out, and maybe they wouldn't be able to work as an ambassador and find a job by then. It said that only 1200 people were recruited. They can mix for a month and then return to the test after a month. This month is a holiday. Mu angrily stood there, thinking of many stupid people who believe they are brilliant no matter what others do. She must try again only to find that person, Gao Peng, waiting for her. After this, in the Black Ember Forest, a small beast was playing there. Suddenly, a swarm of spiders threw the web at him from behind, and the beast could hardly save himself from the web by throwing this web away. But as soon as he freed himself from the web the swarm of black spider from up attack him with net and kill him. On the other side, Peng goes to Chen Jai material shop to collect the cedar pine needles. But the shopkeeper, Old Chen, tells him the cedar pine needles are out of stock, with only 10 pounds left. Peng asks if an estate outside the city specializes in supplying cedar pine needles, and it's still out of stock. Chen replies don't mention it. A week ago, a group of villainous spiders emerged from nowhere, and they ate all the herbs in the garden, and now the area has been sealed off by the army. Then he showed Peng the news from his notepad about the statement of Citizen Mr. Jack, who wrote that the most thrilling night and they almost became the food of the spiders, a new spider monster appeared in the Black Ember Forest area of Chang'an City. This area has been completely blocked. The government has confessed to civilians that it's strictly forbidden to break into the Black Forest without permission. Peng gets worried after reading this news while Chen, standing aside, tells other monsters in the surrounding mountains and forests that have become their food, and he hears that if it wasn't for the boss of the estate running fast, they could also be eaten. Meanwhile, a cellar man comes to his shop and asks Mr. Chen if he has any primary starwood. He replies yes, and then he says to Peng he has business to receive and they can talk later if he needs anything else. Then Peng, on the way returning home, thought in a state of anxiety. First, the college and the military collaborated, and then the security company came to his door. The unknown spider appeared something big had happened. Then his phone rang, and it was Liu Senlin. Peng picked up the phone. Liu asked if he knew about the newly discovered brutal gray spiders in the ember forest. Peng started thinking about the problematic gray spider and continued their conversation. After this, Peng goes to the Blue Shield Security Company building there. Liu welcomes him, saying it's urgent, so there are no more courtesies and allows him to walk through the background information with him. Then Liu takes him to his office, where he shows Peng different kinds of spiders on the screen by telling him that many brutal gray spiders are attacking numerous resource sites. Now, the government has brought together security companies and several private organizations to explore the Black Ember Forest to understand the habits and weaknesses of the brutal gray spider. Their company just received the assignment today and will be leaving in three days, but they don't have enough reserves of Imperial Beasts yet, so he would like to ask him to take a look at it in advance. If they can advance a few more Devil Mantis before they leave, they will have a better chance of success on this mission. Even if he fails, it doesn't matter. Then Peng replies that it is better to look at the situation of the Devil Mantis first. Liu says he must be diligent. The company takes this opportunity very seriously. A previous meeting convened by the coalition government abolished many regulations that suppressed non-official forces. Then, while swiping the card to enter the big hall, Liu says that because of the changes in monsters in recent years, the government is increasingly overwhelmed, and the conference has opened up many policies. He is afraid the direction of the coalition is about to change. Then Liu, while showing Peng the company's devil mantises, says they will also arrange enough human resources to assist him. As long as the results are achieved, the reward will make him feel good. Peng smiles and replies he won't let him down. After this, Peng explored the devil mantises, and Liu stood up in his office, looking at Peng out of the window. Meanwhile, his assistant came and asked him what Gao Peng was doing there when he went downstairs. He just touched and looked like an old man shopping and was slightly confused. Mr. Peng looked 20 years old, can he do it? Liu angrily looks at him while replying. If he doesn't know how to talk, shut his mouth up, and even his sister can't protect him. Hearing this, he gets scared. While looking toward Peng, Liu thinks he doesn't know if it will work. He is betting his future on him, 
and Gao Peng must be as capable as he says. Peng, standing aside, Devil Mantises orders the worker there to bring the eighth one from the left in the first row, the fourth one from the eight in the fourth row, and the largest one in the seventh row. Then he tells the assistant there to leave the ten Devil Mantises he just mentioned. Then, prepare a laboratory and a low-rank insect enhancement drug rank earth crystal core star steel powder. Perilla leaves 10 copies, and the assistant comes to Liu and tells him the list of materials Peng requires. Liu shouted at him and ordered him to prepare according to Mr. Peng's requirements. Then, while looking at Peng through the window, Liu thinks 10 minutes among the 100 imperial beasts, the 10 strongest ones were precisely selected. Not more, not less. This accuracy rate is intermediate, not even faster than the new senior. And the most frightening thing is that he is less than 20 years old. They bring everything Peng orders them, and then Peng starts his work. Liu sits in his office, waiting for the outcome. The assistant comes in and tells him it worked. Then, he goes to the hall where Peng is working. However, a bright light comes from the treatment room, and the devil mantises evolves, and the worker starts slogging with excitement. Then the assistant went to the manager and started praising his manager's choice as it turned out to be a leader level 4 wing jade mantis, and it's a perfect quality evolution. Looking toward Peng, Liu thinks this guy is unfathomable. He has found a treasure. The next day, Peng started Dazzy's training on the ground. There, he started the timer and noted Dazzy's running speed, which was 7.47 seconds and 0.4 seconds faster than the last time. Then he appreciated him and petted his head lovingly and gave a dried worm him as a reward. Then he looked aside from where students were talking to each other that Peng looked toward them the next time they would go to the park though some students had already started to fool around during training time. Then he looks toward the instructor Zhao, thinking the instructor only cares about the hardworking students and don't about the negligent students. That's right, if he can't even hold on to his training, he can't go to the battlefield as the instructor was instructing the student to train her reflexes and students thanking him. Meanwhile, Muting comes there from behind, calling Peng, and when he looks toward her, she says that he has trained his beast very well. He looks at her thinking, holy crap, so tall if she were a man, she would be called a strong man. And then he thanks her for the compliment. Peng is shocked when she says she is there to team up with him. He surprisingly asks why. And then he suggests that battles will be fought in the middle and later stages of training, and teams will be divided. Scores will be calculated in small groups, the others must be more competent and have mutual language. Then Peng thinks this classmate Mu looks simple, she's pretty good at talking, and he asks her about her beast. She smiles and replies wait a minute then she whistles and calls her beast, shouting speed, and the beast arrives quickly. Then, while touching her beast, she says, this is her lotus seed, it's a steel rhino. Seeing the beast size Dazzy and Peng get surprised. Then, standing in the distance, she says she has something to say before Peng considers teaming up with her. Lotus Seed is very timid while crossing the road. It would even give way to monsters dozens of times more miniature than it. But she's more than qualified to be on defense now, perhaps because of her dulled sense of pain. It is very tolerant of pain. Hearing her, Peng thinks it's not impossible to team up with her. Many Imperial Beasts are present, but 99% of them are of ordinary quality, and only a few dozen can reach elite quality. There are only two Imperial Beasts of select quality, and this Steel Rhino is one of them. Dazzy will take the attack route with the poison attributes, so a defensive course of the Imperial Beast is just right for them. It creates more time and space for Dazzy to attack and more options in terms of tactics while on the other side. Mu, looking toward him, thinks Peng hesitated for so long. Sure enough, he doesn't want to as Lotus Seeds may not fit into the Battle Royal Beast so it's not fair to him too then she signs and walks away. Meanwhile, Peng stopped him, saying wait a minute, he accepted her invitation. And then she surprisingly looked at him, he extended his hand, saying it doesn't matter if he has a timid temperament, she can train it later. Also, he thinks it's so tiring to communicate with scums, she becomes delighted, and while shaking hands with him, she also shakes him up and down. Dazzy gets worried about seeing this. After this, outside the Black Ember Forest Joint Operations Area, the commander and military sent there by the government ordered them to gather all the team leaders and managers in the open space. Seeing Manager Liu, Captain Mu says she didn't expect to see him there. Liu replies she must be joking. According to the latest official information, the brutal gray spider has a clear fear response to flames, and who doesn't know that her team is best at the fire element as it seems that Captain Song is going to take the lead in this mission. Then Captain Mu says she doesn't dare manager Liu's devil mantis is called the jungle killer, and she is afraid he will be the first to finish the job. 
They are smiling and talking to each other even though they don't like each other. Then the commander says to everyone there he is glad that they all came, and he's sure they had seen the new information yesterday. It's highly likely that the brutal gray spider preys on large numbers of game and brings them back to the nest to provide sufficient food for the monster. Everyone knows that once their mothers get enough food supply, it means that there will be more terrifying spider waves. Therefore, this mission is vital, and they hope that they can cooperate with them sincerely. The priority is to complete the task, and as long as the job can be completed the reward will never be less. However, owners and managers of different companies standing there start telling each other that the military is trying to be nice to them, but they are afraid that the civil organization will fight internally for the mission. The other one agrees with him and replies, don't let the task unfinished and fight among themselves and get exhausted. Then Captain Mu asks Liu what he thinks. He replies no rush, they should see what happens next. As the commander's speech continued, he said it seemed they had no objection, so they should start the task as agreed. They would first provide fire suppression by passing the word 3 o'clock fire. Then the soldier hoists the red flag and they fire a cannon, and wherever the bomb falls, large craters are formed on the ground. Seeing this, Liu surprisingly says to Mu that after talking nicely, she still has to show her muscles and scar the crowd of people, which is also considered a deep love of responsibility. She looks at him with hateful eyes and asks. Then Liu says, however, the government did take this exploration very seriously, and this artillery was meant to deter them, but it didn't significantly weaken the strength of the monsters for them. If they don't show anything real in this mission, they can't justify it. Then she started shouting, asking while pointing to his beast, they haven't done anything yet. Leader level imperial beasts, eight of them, several other organizations only have three and four each. Hearing this, Liu starts laughing, she angrily looks at him. Then he says that's because they still have their cards, unlike them, who are too honest. Suddenly, they hear a strange sound, and everyone there gets scared. While the soldier tells Liu that the state of his devil mantis is not correct, they seem very scared. Meanwhile, a lord of the ember forest monster full of flames got over there, and everyone there started screaming and running away, and the beast was moving toward them. However, the military commander summons the military killer Golden Beast, which saves them from that ember forest. The monster killer, Golden, throws fire from its mouth toward the monster, and then the monster runs away, thus saving the people there. After this, the military commander tells Liu that they suggest he act quickly as their support can only go so far and he replies that he understands. The commander says every employee to assemble from the Chang'an Guard Regiment to come there. Then the commander looked behind and said, what a bunch of ripoffs. They in the military can take care of this themselves, so why do they need to let these people do it and then come to the commander saying? However, they were one step ahead and noticed the change. They could take advantage of it and prepare for it, but the world is changing more dramatically than they thought. The situation is becoming increasingly dire. These non-governmental organizations should grow and participate as soon as possible to prepare for the future. However, Captain Mu and her team come to the cave with their imperial beasts, where the spiders are. Then, Mu orders the beast to throw fire toward the spider. Seeing this, the girl from her team says to her that this won't work. It's too wasteful of energy. Although their imperial beasts can quickly kill these elite quality monsters in seconds, the number of monsters is too many and it won't take long for the energy in the beast's body to be depleted. Captain Mu's team, holding torch in her hands and her beasts, were ready to kill the spiders. Then she ordered them all to adjust their formation. The defensive imperial beasts stood in the front row, and the supporting imperial beasts stood in the center of the group. The offensive beasts are on both flanks of the team melee first don't use long-range attack abilities keep moving forward. As the beasts move ahead, spiders also attack them. Then, the girl from Mu's team orders the throne demon flowers to use the thorn armor and attack, and then Mu tells her little beast to attack them with fire. All of her beasts attack spiders in union, the girl and her team say without much exertion. They defeated three spiders in one go. The tactics they trained ahead of time were working while Mu was appreciating her little beast, who was extremely tired. Suddenly, they hear the sound of fighting. The girl in the Mu team tells her people are fighting ahead. The fact that the sound can travel a long way in the cave means they are still some distance from their destination. Then Mu ordered them all to move, and they all moved from there as they stood up while seeing down the commander, their soldier manager Liu, and his team, everybody there was fighting with Spider's mother. Commander tells them all that the mother spider has little offensive power, and is only large enough to reproduce, 
but she is a fragile fighter in her class manager. Liu says they all work together to kill the mother spider. After that, they will divide the credits according to the wounds they will inflict, and if he trusts him, he will ensure fair distribution on his command of the back row of long-range attacks on the eyes of the rest continue to attack the feet then the military man replies and yes then one of them says spider mother eyes have s shield and it increases the attack. Then the girl in the Mu team, looking down at them, says the situation is deadlocked. They have to get down there and help them. If it comes down to it, the military will deduct their contribution, and the other team will reject them. Mu replies that sitting on the sidelines will only have a negative effect. They have to go down now. But something is wrong with the monster spiders, she has bad feelings. However, the other team, beasts and military men, were attacking spider's mother. Liu ordered his beasts to attack because the spider mother's eye shield was broken. As the devil mantis attacked her, she flooded in return and hit him away by screaming so loudly. Then Mu and her team stopped there, everyone there put their hands to their ears because her sound was so loud and they thought their ears would burst. Liu, while placing a hand on his ear, says who the hell said that Mother Spider doesn't have attack power then. While sitting on Devil Mantis, he says this is an evolving Lord Rank Peak monster, and apparently, the evolutionary process of this monster was interrupted by them. This isn't something they can solve so run then they all start running away from there. However, the military man and second commander were waiting for them outside. One asked if it had been more than three hours and no one had returned yet, the other replied, it was not that soon. The estimated time for the trip was five hours. Suddenly, the military man looks aside and tells someone to come back and surprisingly says he finished the task so quickly. The commander, pointing a hand toward them, shouts, saying all troops are on alert and prepared for battle. Liu waved his hands loudly to hold their people as he came toward them while flying in the air, riding on a devil mantis. Liu jumped off his beast. He lands on the ground, and the military man runs toward him, asking why he is alone and what about the others? What happened? Liu angrily tugs at his tie and asks if his government sent them to die there. What little offensive mother spider? That's a mother spider in the process of advancing to the lord level. Meanwhile, the second commander comes there, unties his tie from Liu's hand, and tells him to calm down and clarify the situation. First, Liu tells them while exploring the cave that they encountered a mother spider in the process of evolution. Due to the difference in strength, they had to be one-sided and massacred. They send out their best beast to complete the mission, and they've all been lost inside. Also, he doesn't know how many of his subordinates could escape, just the pension and the damage caused is said to be an astronomical figure. Then the second commander, while looking toward the government men, angrily asks if this is what their government research has come up with, a mother spider with little combat power. Meanwhile, another person was coming from the forest. The commander asked him where the mother spider was. Did it follow him? He said he didn't know, it seemed to be chasing the others, and after they came out, they were all scattered and fled. Hearing this, both commanders surprisingly looks into each other's eyes, and then all the people they've sent on the mission who come back safely meet their captain and tells them about the situation there, and also about the people who have died there. Then the commander says to the military man that if they knew in advance that this mother spider was advancing to the lord level, they wouldn't send this small amount of workforce. If they could bring it back to the military zone and train it properly, it would enhance the strength of their military area and those clerical workers would make mistakes. However, this mother spider failed to advance and became worthless. They didn't need to worry about the rest, one mountain can't tolerate two tigers, and the leader beast of the black ember forest will not let it go. However, on the peng side, Dazzy's training continued so well that a guy shouted at his dog, telling him to look at the other people's beasts, while caressing Dazzy's head lovingly. Peng thinks that, unexpectedly, Liu Senlin met two leader rank and one half leader rank monster after only taking over a government task. The hunting environment in this wild is getting increasingly severe, and the value of the corpse of a common level monster is pitifully low. The price of an elite level monster's corpse is only enough to buy a snack for dummy. As soon as possible, he needs to let dummy and Dazzy rise to the leader rank so that the success rate of hunting in the field is higher. And once they all advance, his reputation as a monster trained would be established. At that time, he can go to Yanjing City to get the senior monster trainer certificate, one regular and one assistant. As long as he grows according to this route, he can continue to become stronger. Dummy has broken through to level 14, but unfortunately, no one has completed the task set by the Monster Hunters Guild, and it has eaten all cedar pine needles at home. 
he can only stand foolishly in front of the refrigerator every day, staring at the fridge. Then, looking toward Dazzy, Peng thinks after all this training time has also reached level 13. Meanwhile, Mu comes there, showing her summary of training tips for defensive beasts. As she said before, Peng while reading the book, thinks since she chose to team up, she has to be well prepared with this notebook so they can formulate tactics based on the characteristics of her beast. While reading the book, when he read the paragraph where she writes for a defensive beast, the will of steel is always more important than physical defense. Reading this, he laughed, thinking she was earnest about it. She looked surprisingly toward him, asking what was wrong. Peng raises his heels and pet her on the shoulder, blurting nothing. He feels that she is pretty easygoing. And then an announcement is made all the students will gather in front of the stage, and there will be no free practice today. Then, all the students gather, and instructor Zhao announced that this concludes the first phase of training. Before they start the second phase, he would like to report a list of name. Then he called the names of those students who had been eliminated. Hearing their words, students started shouting about why they were destroyed. It was not fair to them. Then, instructor Zhao asked them if they had a problem with that. Their instructors had seen how they had behaved these past few weeks, and they needed to know whether they were fooling around. Then he asks Zai Zhongyi if the phone. Upon hearing this, he realizes his mistake and asks Hu Yanchen how she can sleep comfortably on the training field and from tomorrow on, and they should go back to the classroom and continue to sleep, if they fool around and become lazy in the basic training. Then there is no point in continuing the training. Also, the second phase of the training is practical. If they continue with that kind of lax attitude, they won't only cause accidents, but they may even lose the lives of their beasts. Hearing this, students get worried. After this, two students from Peng and Mu's team stood aside. One listened to the instructor say his teddy was the strongest and could kill these monsters without leaving any behind. The other one replies that his teddy looks like a bluff on the field. He is afraid he will be scared to crawl instantly. If he needs to fight, he still needs his yellow-tailed king scorpion beast. Then they both heatedly look at each other and start insulting each other then one of them points to the other one angrily and says what bullshit, yellow-tailed scorpion king. A common yellow-tailed scorpion. The word king is his self-proclaimed. The other angrily replies, asking while pointing his finger at him what self-proclaimed he can tell him about the beast that can evolve into a yellow-tailed scorpion. King Pang and Mu, standing beside them, were worriedly looking at each other, seeing them angrily talking to each other. Jiang Renbai says there are five people in a group. Get ready to start actual combat training. An instructor will lead the new group. So hurry up, then, while pointing to other candidates. They say they are teammates of Peng and Mu go and find other teammates to them who are coming to be in their team. Then they make a team with Peng and Mu. One says he wanted to team up with him for a long time. And the other says they are a team now. Hearing this, Peng laughs. Meanwhile, Zhang came there while shaking hands. He introduced himself to Peng and his team members and told them he would be in charge of their group's practical training. Then, he smiled asking who wanted to be the first to try. Then Zhang showed them a giant monster named Steel Pig that was weakly wounded. They started screaming with fear, asking the instructor if they could get a different monster. Then, he showed them another beast, a hairless elite quality monster, and asked them how about this. Hang stood while looking toward both monsters. Think of the Haina, which looked unimpressive in an elite class. It's more potent than the wild boar, has poison resistance, and is wounded. And if they get excited and go berserk, Hainas can be much more aggressive than the wild boars, so he can't let the instructor change the monster T-Soft one should pick up the permission. Then Peng moves forward with Dazzy while raising his hand and says that since no one will try, he will be the first to challenge. Then, the instructor opens the trap door and lets the monster out. The monster runs toward Peng and Dazzy to attack them while Peng tells Dazzy to go ahead. The beast roars and hits his claws on the ground. The ground cracks from there. Dazzy jumps to attack and bite him so severely that the monster starts yelling in pain, then hits Dazzy and falls to the ground. Peng team member got scared to see this and started asking his friend while keeping his hand on his head if he lost. The other angrily shouted, saying he didn't know it and didn't pull his hair. Peng stood beside him, thinking it looked like Dazzy was at a disadvantage, but the steel pig had been poisoned with mild injury. Dazzy had already taken control of the situation. The toxin had been injected into the steel pig along with the attack, and the more violent the episode of the steel pig is, the faster the poison spreads. Suddenly, the steel pig gets severely injured and falls on the ground badly while Dazzy stands aside actively. Seeing this, Peng's team members and their monster get shocked, asking what's going on. The steel pig had the advantage just now, and why it suddenly fell. 
Seeing this, Peng's team member asks Jiang how it could be poisoned. He replies the steel pig's face was blue, so it was poisoned. Then Jiang congratulates Peng as he passed today's training. He is a very toxic centipede and has good combat sense however it is better to let it use poison sparingly otherwise it is difficult to improve its combat power. It will lose most of its combat power once it encounters enemies immune to poison. Peng thanked him for his guidance. Peng was feeding Dazzy the way people fed the dog watching this, and the instructor thought this centipede was almost raised into a dog. Then ZH Nag said the Stell Pig could still fight. Who would go next? One of Peng's party members, touching his beast, said his beast could participate in the second round of the battle. The other one stood aside and added by saying he could only beat a dog in the water, and then they both again started teasing each other. Jiang scolds them and orders them to continue training. Then he sends his yellow-tailed scorpion, saying kill it while it's sick, use the poison needles, attack poison it to death toward the monster. The yellow-tailed scorpion attacks the beast with his tail and falls him away. As expected, the owner of that scorpion starts laughing, saying that his yellow-tailed scorpion king easily defeats the steel pig. Suddenly, he is surprised and starts asking why his scorpion is down. Peng replies that it is because it was poisoned. He worriedly asks how his scorpion could get poisoned. Mu adds that what Peng said should be trustworthy because Peng's imperial beast and the yellow-tailed scorpion's poison remain in the monster's body. Moreover, it is not the case that all the imperial beasts with poison attacks have poison resistance. Then he embarrassingly asks, so it was poisoned by itself, the other one, seeing him, starts laughing while making fun of him, says the yellow-tailed scorpion king laughs to death. Then he replies while pointing to his beast he still laughs at himself he should look at his beast for himself. As he looked back, his beast was running toward the monster. He shouted for him to stop and pulled it back. Then Mu said to Peng she had a question for him while their team member was telling his beast to drink some antidote and Zhang holding his head standing aside think the team isn't easy to lead. However, in Peng's home, Dummy searches for food in the fridge but finds nothing to eat. Standing behind him, Peng smiles and thinks of poor Dummy as if thinking that food can be transformed in this way. It is silly and cute. Meanwhile, his phone rang, and the call was from Monster Hunting Association. He picked up the call, and Yingsu told him the cedar pine needles must have arrived. Also, his task number, 1,348,721, posted in the Monster Hunting Association, had been completed, and the item would arrive at the pickup location at the scheduled time. Peng hastily puts on shoes and runs to receive his parcel, thinking it's finally there. If the shortage continues, he wants to give Dummy a new evolutionary route. He waves his hand and receives his parcel from the robot. However, a group of three thieves were overseeing them. One of them said to their boss while pointing toward Peng that they should be the ones who paid a lot of money to buy cedar pine needles. The boss replied that's right, they followed the delivery truck from the Monster Hunting Association warehouse so there was no mistake. Their boss tells them tonight they're going to do a big job, and then one of them asks if they are okay with doing this. The boss angrily looks toward him and shouts at him, saying what he fears. This world is always weak for the weak and vital for the strong. As long as he doesn't get caught, he is fine, and he is just too timid, and then he starts crying while replying stop, it hurts. Then the boss says his second brother is right, and they weren't going to do it right away. They step on a point first, if they can't afford to offend, they will withdraw immediately. The other one, clenching a fist, replies as expected of the boss, and then, in the nighttime, three of them enter the area where Peng lives. While on the way, the boss says to them third brother, this is more exciting than stealing something. The other one replies, asking, it's not right, the boss, how this neighborhood is so shabby it feels even poorer than the hellhole they live in. Is this kid wealthy? The boss adds by saying isn't that better. This kid has no background but recently made a fortune, so it's more suitable for them to do it. And he wants to do something big this time. The boy replies yes, and then the boss hits him and tells him to be quiet. He asks the boss while crying why he hit him again. But he hasn't said anything yet. However, they reached outside the building where Peng lives. The boss was trying to open the door lock of Peng's home, and two brothers stood near him. After a while, Peng opened the door of her house, and a light came out. One of them turned and looked, and she asked yawning what are they doing up in the middle of the night. Their boss was still trying to open the door while the two brothers raised their hands. One of them replied with a smile sorry, miss, the hallway is too light, he couldn't open the door at once, and the other one said, nodding his head in, yes he is right it's too dark. Hearing this, she yawned and returned to her house. She was about to close the door when the thief's boss grabbed it and didn't let her close, saying wait a minute, as they are slightly thirsty. 
Can they come in and ask for a glass of water? She smiles and replies why not go in there? The thieves smile suspiciously at each other and enter the house, thanking her. When they enter the house, their boss indicates to his partner to lock the door. Seeing this, Tang asks why they are closing the door. The boss replies they are afraid of disturbing the other neighbors at this late hour. She smiles and tells them then they can rest assured she uses unique soundproofing material on the walls even if they play bouncy they won't disturb the next door neighbors. They scream out of fear when her beast also gets there. Seeing this, the thief boss takes out her knife and runs toward her, saying don't pretend to be a fool. There, she uses her magic, and his knife turns back to him and cuts his hand, and the blade gets stuck in the floor, and he starts screaming in pain. In contrast, his companion Hogo tells his brother Hedgehog to go and help the boss, and Hogo throws his little beast prickly prick toward her. As soon as he releases his little beast, her invisible lizard beast catches it with his tongue, puts it in his mouth, and eats it, and Hogo starts shouting about his prickly prick. Tang, putting her hand lovingly on her beast, asks why he is eating randomly again. Then the boss orders his rat to throw attack magic at her. As soon as he throws flame toward her, he smiles and says, Well done, bullet rat smelly woman. Now see if she is still challenging. Tang's dress is slightly flared from the shoulder. The boss surprisingly asks why she is not injured. She smiles and replies she told him the answer, but he also doesn't understand it. Then she says with her scary red eyes and smile, but that's okay, she will teach them by hand, and they've plenty of time. She beat them badly, and their voices came out of the house. Tang heard a slight sound while sleeping. He thought, who doesn't sleep in the middle of the night? She injured them badly, tied three of them down together, and called the old Kai, saying he would send someone. She had three volunteers there, so don't worry, it is all well trained, and she guaranteed that they would guard the border until the last moment. The next day, Peng and Dazzy were in the training ground. Peng and his team members were crying, thinking they could even break the defense, and then Peng looked toward the water bear bug, thinking this was the first time he had seen a monster with the attribute characteristic. However, an interface appears before him, and he reads all the information about the mutant water bear bug. From there, while reading, he thinks it's also time to consider the third beast should they sign a water bear bug. After all, water bear bugs are hardy beings that can survive in space with nuclear radiation minus 200 degrees below zero and microwave ovens. After the catastrophe, their vitality has been further improved, and they have strong resistance to various abnormal attributes. However, although this kind of beast can protect itself, there needs to be cooperation between Dazzy and Dummy. Never mind, choosing a long-range attack or defense type is more suitable if there is room than a flying and healing type beast. This was Moo's beast Lotus Seed's turn to fight with Steel Pig, and her Lotus Seed was about to defeat Steel Pig while Jang was standing beside telling her to calm down student Moo when giant beasts are fighting to stay away from the battlefield to avoid the unnecessary accidents. Peng stood aside, watching the fight, thinking that Lotus Seed's timid character had significantly improved when their classmate Moo's training manager Louis called. He attended the call and talked to him. Louis asked Peng if he had any free time. When Peng asked what it was, he replied while driving the car he would like to invite him to dinner, and that he had some friends coming over, so he would like him to introduce them to him. Hearing this, Peng thought Louis Semlin's attitude seems to be too flattering, but after the last Black Ember Forest incident their company lost a lot of money powerful monster trainers like him they naturally don't share any effort to draw in Peng replies and say him meet at the school gate after school. Louis picked Peng up from the school gate. Peng said sorry for annoying him when he got into the car, and Louis politely replied that there was no trouble at all. He was also on his way, and his daughter happened to be at his school, so he came to pick her up from school, and Liu daughter was also with them. His daughter Liu Zheyu adds by saying this is the second time he has come to her school this year, and the first time was at the beginning of the school year. Her cat was lying in the cradle meows. He smiles and says to Peng if he has time. He wonders if he can help Yu by looking at her beast. At this, Peng turns and looks back toward his classmate Lu's beast and cat-like beast. This is relatively rare. Then he smiles and tells her he is in the studio on Saturday and Sunday so she can meet him in the studio on the weekend. Then Liu while dropping her home says go home first. He and Peng still have things to do. Then she says goodbye to Peng look toward her. Peng think if he was going to meet a friend why did he let her daughter go home first it's getting stranger and stranger. Then he asks manager Liu about the identities of his friends. He smiles and replies he will know when he arrives. And then Liu takes him to meet him with his friend. He welcomes Peng there and tells him to come with him while on the way Peng seeing that place think this place is decorated in the style of a landscape garden probably the work of a master who is well versed in the design of northern and southern gardens eating there it seems that Liu's friend's identity is not simple. 
After this, they enter the big hall. As soon as they enter, Liu's friend, seeing them, stands up and introduces his friends to Peng. First, he introduces Captain Song Si of the Firefly hunting team. She smiles and waves her hand. And then Peng gives a little introduction of Captain Jiang Gu of the Sky Star Hunters. When Liu introduces him to Peng, he says old Liu what he said before was so mysterious he didn't expect that it was a young boy who will come there. While looking toward them all, he thinks it's not a coincidence that all the people sitting there are from monster hunting teams, and the eyes of these people looking at him are filled with temptation and doubt, making him feel very uncomfortable. Then Liu says to them now that they're all there, let's have dinner Jiang Gu says wait a minute because Peng doesn't look happy. Did they come too abruptly and make him unhappy? Captain Song Si adds by asking Captain Jiang what he is doing there to scare a child. If it spreads that some of them were bullying a student, it will be very shameful. Meanwhile, Liu says he didn't make an appointment with Peng, so he didn't know they had so many good friends there today because he didn't think so well. Brothers forgive him. Jiang replies that they've tried to know Mr. Peng for a long time, and they've always wanted to meet him in person and get some advice. But he's hard to get to, come on, Mr. Peng, do him a favor. As they all were drinking, while looking toward Peng, they laughed. One asked Peng to eat and drink with them, and the other added by asking what the point of just drinking was to seize the opportunity to ask Mr. Peng for more advice. Looking at them, Peng thinks this group of people seems to be passionate, but their words are loaded, they must come there for a good meal. Then Liu, while giving the glass of wine to Peng, asks for forgiveness as he didn't arrange it correctly. Then Peng looks at the glass of wine. While he sees his reflection in wine, he thinks that Liu Senlin created value for him that far exceeded what he was paying him. In other words, he owes him, and now these little moves, but he should see how this feast will be some. However, the dinner starts, Captain Zhang says to Peng that he is a rough man and there is something he wants to say. The word is that he is young and capable, and not only does he have a 100% promotion rate, but he doesn't know if he is as magical as the rumors say he is. Peng smiles and replies the main reason for this is for the love and care of the examiner. Feng, if he needs anything, he can come to their company for consultation. Hearing this, Captain Zhang smiles and says to Peng his words are too raw since he is a friend of Liu and he is also a friend of his. It's suitable for friends to help each other, so why should the company participate? Meanwhile, Zio adds by saying that since they are eating together, everyone is a friend. He then involves the company, which is not correct. Then the guy stands aside and says this man is still young and not sensible, and they should raise a few more points. He will be sensible. Captain Si Song says her sister also has some imperial beasts that need his help. Why doesn't he take the time to help? Hearing them all, Peng thinks this group of people, does they think he is an idiot? Then Peng tells them he is just a high school student who hasn't been in the industry for a long time and can't afford to take on such an important task. Liu says to Peng that today it's all his fault he didn't arrange the party properly. He waits a moment, he will drive him back. Peng angrily replies that there is no need, he has already made an appointment for a car in advance. So there is no trouble. Then Peng goes from there. Sees Peng going. They heatedly look toward them that this kid is ungrateful. Then the guy stands aside and says forget it, a child. Don't be angry with him. Liu asks for forgiveness to make them angry. But he had good intentions. But it seems that this time there is a bit of too much unpleasant. Then they both leave, saying everyone back to dinner. Manager Liu was kind enough to call them but the other one thinks he can only say that Mr. Peng is still young and vigorous. Meanwhile, Captain Zhang puts his hand on Liu's shoulder from behind and says this time that he helped him target Peng and provoke his relationship with other groups. The favor he did for him in the Black Ember Forest is over. Liu smiles and replies don't say that they are lifelong friends. They should help each other more Zhang. Showing his hand, says no one rule is one rule. They are not friends, then he also goes from there. Thinking Goa Peng has helped him so much to tie him to his boat he can set him up this Liu old fox. However, Peng returns home, takes off his overshirt, puts it on the couch, then turns on the TV, and sits to watch the latest breaking news. There, the news reporter says that according to the news broadcast of the Alliance News, the Blue Devil genetic liquid launched by the Jilongbang group has been exposed to severe side effects. In the Neon region, there have been many malignant mutations in the beasts taking the Blue Magic Beast genetic optimizer. Jilongbang group announced the global takeback of Blue Devil genetic optimizer at the same time. Users who have already purchased the product can return it for free at the original price at Jilongbang stores. Many countries have already pointed out the uncontrollable nature of GMOs and called on the public to treat GMO products aggressively and positively. Meanwhile, Liu Senlin calls him, 
After picking up the phone, Peng asks what he can do for him. Liu apologizes to him about today's incident, saying it was all his fault, he should have told him who they were in advance, but he didn't expect them to be so disrespectful today. Peng says it doesn't matter, he is not too mad about it. Liu says they don't worry and won't give him a face, which means they won't give him Liu Senlin's look from today. After this, the call ended. Peng sadly think he doesn't blame these people for thinking they can fool him. It's just that he doesn't have the strength to talk to all the people with evil intention. After this, while watching TV, he says he can only play by the so-called rules until he is strong enough. The first Yang Cheng Dog King competition ended successfully yesterday. The contestants participating in this year's Dog King competition are all from the Yang Cheng Rong Cheng and Peng Chen areas. The first Yang Cheng Dog King was won by the 20-year-old talented beast trainer Hang Ning. It is reported that Hang Ning is also a university student and is currently studying in his junior year at Yangcheng University of Science and Technology. In three years, he was able to evolve his imperial beast to the perfect quality leader level, so he must be one of the tops among the folks. But it won't be long. After this, in Fei Peng's studio beast workroom, Peng takes Dummy there, he prepares a medicine and tells Dummy to drink this medicine. Then Liu Zheyu, on the third floor, came to the Peng studio with her two friends and their beast. One of them asked if the studio of Mr. Peng that they were talking about Liu Zhou nodded his head yes while a. Her friend asked Zhou Yu as she said that Mr. Peng was about the same age as she. He looked ancient. Liu Zhou Yu turns back while angrily looking toward her, then she tickles a, asking her little rain, how dare she beat around the bush and say she is old? Watch her move. A, while laughing, replies don't tickle, she is wrong. However, Xun welcomes them there, asking if they have an appointment. Zhou Yu's friend starts looking around. One of them asks if she needs an appointment. Is business. Is their studio that good? Then, another added, saying she doesn't think anyone is there either. Zun says she can contact the boss to confirm the time if they don't have an appointment. Zhou Yu stood there thinking Dad said that Mr. Peng has a high level of beast training and is simply the first genius in Chang'an. The only bad thing is that the fees are very high. Because of this, there are not many customers. Suddenly, a booming and strange sound comes out from the treatment room. Zhou Yu and her friends get scared due to this sound and start shivering. A asks fearfully about the sound. Zhou Yu says it sounds so strange that she can't breathe properly. However, in the beast workroom, Peng was promoted to dummy by giving him some medicine. And then, finally, he was successful in his work. Dummy was promoted to level 16, acquired blood silk heart, and gained many monster characteristics and these characteristics were too powerful. Moreover, an interface appears before Peng about Dummy's promotion. While reading it, he gets so happy thinking that these characteristics will significantly enhance Dummy's combat power. However, going out like this is inconvenient because his size has also increased. After holding his overshirt, Peng comes out while pointing to Dummy, who is also following Peng. He tells Zun to find something to help Dummy cover up. This look isn't good for the street. Seeing Dummy, she gets surprised, thinking that promoted to a royal beast in just this little time. Peng is getting better and better. Zhou Yu and her friend stood there. Seeing Peng, she called his name and looked toward her. He remembered this was manager Liu's daughter, and thought, is it because he hung up Liu's phone directly? This old fox might need clarification about his thoughts, so let his daughter come over and test his attitude. However, her friend's beast is quite interesting, adapted to a new ecological niche with the emptiness as the sea, and there are still such strange beings. However, she smiles and tells Peng she wants him to help her look at her beast. He smiles and replies she doesn't have to call him Mr. Peng as they are both about the same age, so he is a little uncomfortable with the name. Hearing this, she is surprised, and then he says the old rules, she should know the standard of his charge and pay the bill first. She is only an elite level, average, quality mint cat according to his charging standard of 60 credits. While smiling, he says it seems that Liu Zheyu doesn't know what her old fox father did, and it doesn't mean bullying a girl for her father's sake. He will pay for the materials needed to upgrade the quality of her mint cat. Hearing this, she gets happy and excited and thanks him when he asks her where her beast is. Then, she starts looking for it everywhere, saying where is the cat? It is just there now. Then her friend A, pointing to her cat, says that her cat is hiding in the corner, probably scared. Seeing this, Ju gets worried and then extends her hands toward her cat. And then the cat runs and clings to her, then she holds her cat lovingly, saying don't be afraid cats are good. Peng stood beside seeing this think perverted cat. 
Then he asks A about her jellyfish and where she bought it because he has never seen a beast with this attribute before. So he is a little curious. She replies this guy is hardly an imperial beast, just a small pet that can barely be used as a handy wallet. After this, while putting her mobile phone in the jellyfish face space, she tells Peng the mobile phone is stored in the freedom that comes with it. Also, this floating jellyfish was originally a speciality of Peng Cheng. Recently, a group of traders imported a lot from there, and now they are selling it in the commercial street of Wook Square. Hearing this, Peng thinks about the third beast. He gets the directions and then goes to the Wook Square, where sellers tell people through loudspeakers not to miss it when they pass by the latest featured jellyfish flying jellyfish. Many people gathered there, and they called others there, telling them to come and look at the super hot new pets from Peng Cheng. People enjoyed themselves there, and many wanted to buy these jellyfish. Peng goes near the jellyfish, and the seller man stands aside. Peng asks the seller man if he can look at the floating jellyfish. The seller man replies while holding the jellyfish there. While the other seller was selling the jellyfish and people were standing there holding money telling him how many fish they wanted. Peng said to the seller, man, no, he meant he could sell all the rest of his floating jellyfish, but he would like to pick one. After this, the seller man took Peng to the store where the rest of the jellyfish were, he opened the door, and they both entered. Seeing so many jellyfish there, Peng thinks, according to the records, the birth of the floating jellyfish was due to a group of jellyfish that happened to be infected and mutated by the space force at the beginning of the catastrophe. They settled in the sea for several years afterwards to multiply, and then they were almost eaten by the other monsters to get their species exterminated. While looking toward them, Peng asks if this may be the most space attribute monster in the world. The seller man replies that the space attribute, except for the ability to float in mid-air and open a small dimensional space in the body, almost has no attack power if it weren't for the good looks and the bad taste it might have gone extinct. Hearing this, Peng, while looking toward jellyfish, thinks, fortunately, it's not delicious to eat, and the level of jellyfish there is not too different from that outside. Then Peng suddenly notices the jellyfish, which doesn't feel the same as other jellyfish that float quietly, but are very active. Then, pointing to that jellyfish, Peng asks the seller man how much for the one. He replies the young man has a good eye, and their boss says that it is a rare mutant species with the perfect quality speed variation, the floating jellyfish king and he can sell it to him for a hundred credits. Then Peng smiles and asks his brother if he has to be conscientious in business. He recognizes the mutation of the floating jellyfish king. This is a little overstated, right? He will pay 50 credits. The seller man nods in yes and replies when he meets someone who knows how to do it right is 50 on 50 right. As a friend hears this, Peng calculates on the mobile phone, thinking without a second's hesitation. It seems that even at 50 credits they've something to earn. Then, the seller bound the jellyfish's legs and gave it to Peng, saying young man, if he has other friends who want to buy floating jellyfish, he can bring them to them and give him a discount. Looking toward him, Peng thinks, opening his mouth for a hundred credits, what jellyfish king. It's good to expect him to give a discount and not ask for a lot of money. Then he smiles, thinking, but he doesn't lose anything. Their pace and win dual attribute elite quality, and their family imperial beast team are becoming a group. Then, while taking that jellyfish home, he tells him he looks like a balloon and gives him the name Silly. Dazzy was asleep on the other side of the house with his head on the pillow. As soon as Peng unlocked the door and said he was back, Dazzy excitedly got up. When Peng showed the jellyfish to Dazzy and said this was their new family member, he got angry and went to his room and slammed the door. Seeing this, Peng surprisingly thinks and learns to be jealous. Peng stands outside the door of Dazzy's room to cheer him up saying this little unscrupulous man see how he fix him. Then Peng, standing aside from the wall, says he bought him dried bread, worms which he loves to eat, and the dried insects of the poisonous swordworm and the leaves of the starflower. Also, to help him upgrade, he has issued a high price quest to buy the crystal core of the leader level lightning monster. The bid is 301 credits. The average price is a completely one credit point higher, enough for an entire family to live on. Hearing this, Dazzy gets excited, opens the room door, and emerges. Peng happily asks while showing him the food he wants, and Dazzy nods yes with a watering mouth. Then Peng teased him and tossed his food bag up, saying it's not easy. How dare he slam the door on him. Dazzy angrily said give it to him, knock it off, and then they both started fighting. Peng punches Dazzy, falls him on the floor, and goes from there, saying good, he has learned to curse, watch out for him, and after a day without a fight, the upper room uncovered tiles. After this, he goes to the jellyfish, seeing his hand, he thinks he doesn't have a high level, so he should have enough mental power to try the contract now. 
Silly's consciousness space is even smaller and more fragile than Dazzy's at the beginning. It's troublesome. Besides, Silly's consciousness is too restless, and if he wants to make a contract now, how come he feels like a monster who wants to abduct a child? However, Dummy and Dazzy come there. Standing there, Peng thinks he needs to be in contact with Silly for a while. Let him lower his guard, and he will grow attached to them over time. Then Peng excitedly says he decided he will take Silly to school with him tomorrow, and will have a good relationship. The next day, Peng, while using Silly as a hat, putting it on his head, takes him to school. His classmate is surprised to see him and starts talking in a low tone. One of them asks if he has a hat on his head, and the other one smiles and replies it's so ugly. He greeted his fellows, and Mu was surprisingly looking toward him then. While bringing out a water bottle from Silly's face space, Peng asks Mu if she would like mineral water iced. She replies no, this hat is his. Meanwhile, Peng smiles and says, it's not a hat. It's a floating jellyfish and imperial beast with spatial abilities. Then Mu, while touching her lotus seed, says she has heard of it, and it's just as timid to forget about that for a moment. Has he seen the monster for training today? After this, it was a training day with the purple gold scorpion in the cage, they took it to the ground. Mu, seeing it, asks Peng how about it, he is still going first today. Moreover, their class fellow standing aside from them. One of them says that the bonus points for today's first win are Peng's again. The other one replies they can't help it. Peng is strong and has a high win rate, so they can refer to his style of play to beat their opponents and get some points, so be thankful. Peng says to Mu he can't be the first on the team every time. It's not fair to them, and they should allow others to be first. Today, hearing this, the fellows get worried. However, a fellow with his chicken dragon beast says to instructor Zhang that since classmate Peng is willing to give up the first place, and he will apply to be the first one to go today. Seeing him, Peng thinks of chicken dragon. This is the only elite level beast in the field other than Dazzy, and it is already level 11. Unfortunately, it is only standard quality, but it is enough to try the depth of the purple gold scorpion. However, Peng and Dazzy stood on the ground, aside from them, Dazzy suddenly noticed a ladybug passing by. See it, his mouth started watering, and then he moved toward it to eat. Peng shouted at him, asking if he saw it and paying attention to where he was looking. Peng punches him hard in the head, saying he knows how to eat. He observes the attacking habits and style of the purple gold scorpion he will put him on later. What's that shiny on the corner of his mouth? Wipe it off. Then, instructor Zhang waves the red flag, and the boy releases his chicken dragon to fight with the gold scorpion. And then the fight starts between the two. The purple gold scorpion hit the chicken dragon so hard and injured him. Seeing this, the boy got worried while Zhang stood beside him and said, Fortunately, this purple gold scorpion wasn't poisonous, otherwise, this shot alone would have put down his imperial beast. Luckily for him, the dragon was strong enough that the scorpion only pierced the muscle with its barb. The rare ringtail wasn't stiff enough to do more damage. Meanwhile, the chicken dragon rams his beak into the scorpion so hard and gets him badly injured. The boy starts shouting while Zhang stands beside him and gets angry seeing this. Moreover, Peng stood there and saw this thought that was not necessarily true. The purple gold scorpion attacked the chicken dragon badly, even though tears started flowing from her eyes. Also, the eggs broke out of her and fell into the cage. Seeing this, the boy shouted and called his chicken dragon. Seeing this, Zhang gets happy and orders his monstrous cat to stop it, and this monstrous cat only shows up to him and no one else. The purple gold scorpion moved toward the chicken dragon to attack and was already screaming in pain. Seeing the scorpion toward her, the chicken dragon ran away, crying in pain. Also, the boy stopped her, saying chicken dragon, slow down. After this, Zhang asks other students who else wants to fight the purple gold scorpion. Also, when Peng's purple-backed lightning centipede was the first to take the field in every challenge, he knew that some students were upset, thinking that he was biased and underestimating everyone. Then he turned and asked what now. Students were scared and didn't raise their hands. One of them said the instructor let the students with good grades go first. Then the instructor, looking toward Peng, asks him then. Peng tells Dazzy to go ahead then. Dazzy enters the cage to fight with the purple gold scorpion and the fight starts between the two. Mu stood with Peng, saying that although Dazzy is powerful, the strength shown by the purple gold scorpion isn't too timid. Hearing this, Peng thinks that Mu is correct. This purple gold scorpion is probably hiding its clumsiness. Then, while clenching his fist, he says he can only believe in Dazzy. In the fight between the two, Dazzy beats the scorpion and injures him. Seeing this, Peng and his team members get happy. The next day, all the students were being taken for training by bus, and their instructor's jeeps were with them. 
Pei, looking out through the jeep's window, said to her friend it's so beautiful, look at this side, the mountain is so high. Also, the other students were getting happy and talking to each other while looking at the beautiful scenery and the wild beasts. Suddenly, the bus driver breaks his bus while smiling. He says sorry, students, there's a stone on the road, he didn't see it. Peng is sitting in the last seat, looking toward him, thinking, and that's what he does when he doesn't like their noise. Then he remembered when he left in the morning, he knocked on Tang's door, but there was no answer. She didn't answer the phone either. It stands to reason that Tang's strength isn't weak, so there shouldn't be anything wrong. Then, while knocking on the door, Peng thinks it has something to do with the secret she has never been able to tell him. Meanwhile, the bus driver breaks the bus so hard that everything falls around, even though the students tumble back and forth so severely that some get injured. However, Peng, in bad condition, thinks there is no way this will happen again. Then he and his fellow angrily go toward the bus driver, saying he can't bully people like this, it is too much. The driver smiles, replying, sorry, not on purpose this time. Then, finally, they reach their destination. The instructor gives a speech to the students that this valley behind him is their wilderness training base. Every inch of the valley has been cleared. Average level and elite level monster are retained and there will never be any leader-level monsters. The identity watches they've been issued contains a positioning system and an emergency button, and their task is to live for a week, and they can't quit in the middle of the field training otherwise they're considered to have given up. Then he asks the students more questions. One of them raises a hand, asking if there are fixed supply points in the training ground. The instructor replies there are safe houses in the valley made of special steel. Only a monster above the leader level can break through the safe house's defenses, and they also have a certain amount of food. So, if they want to get through seven days, it's not impossible. It depends on how they choose to get going, kids. However, the gate opens, and students enter, talking to each other. Mu look toward Peng, and the captain announces on the loudspeaker and tells them to move faster. If a monster accidentally eats them, the positioning system will allow them to find the beast and avenge their death as they all move while Peng stands with Dazzy and Mu. A sparrow was sitting on the branch of a tree nearby. Peng says it is a sparrow that likes to gather in a moist and watery environment and is very sensitive to rain. If it rains, they will fly to that area also known as rainbirds. She says she remembers that in weather signal towers in general cities, there are rainbirds. The attack power of the rainbirds is fragile, but the speed is breakneck. Then the bird flies away from there. Seeing this, Peng says he still has to go to the wild to look. Unlike a monotonous city, the wild has the wealthiest kinds of monsters, which is a monster's paradise. She replies that a student is a student. Everyone else is in a hurry to get into the valley, but Gao Peng has already started to observe the environment, so such a mentality makes him so capable. Then Peng replied no, it was just too crowded to stand there, so he waited for them all to pass. Hearing this, she was surprised and asked him if it was time to go, then they both went from there on the way. Peng thinks he is mistaken, he sees a figure in the tree canopy. However, it was the day of training. Peng and Mu were team members, they explored many things on the way and finally found a house. Mu pointed to the house and told Peng there was a hidden green-skinned iron house not far in front and it should be a safe house. Peng replies, saying let's go over and take a look, and then they both come there. Then they both get into the room, seeing beds there. Mu says few beds are in the safe house, so the instructors don't want them to huddle too much. Peng replies there are no leader level monsters in the valley, less than 5% of elite level monsters, and there is no point in training in the field if she has to huddle like this. Peng was surprisingly looking toward the bed Mu told her that each bed had 5 boxes of compressed cookies and 10 bottles of mineral water, so she could make it through the week if she ate sparingly. Therefore, the military has fully considered the true strength of these students, otherwise, if they have to fight against monsters and find food by themselves, there may be a reduction in staff. Then, while wearing the protective suit, she asks him if he wants to change his claim, and then she smiles, saying there are still some tiny mosquitoes in the jungle that are quite poisonous, so if he gets a bite, he will be in trouble. Peng laughs and, raising his hand, replies no. He will apply the herbs, then, while coughing, he tells her to get around and see if they can get some meat. He doesn't want to eat compressed cookies for seven days. Now, with the safe house, they can rely on the lotus seed's original size to get out of the way quickly so they can return to the safe home even if something happens. Mu excitedly replies as expected of Gao Peng. He is thoughtful, and then they both go out with their monster Peng, on the way. He says that they should first look for a nearby water source, which is generally surrounded by natural hunting grounds. As they move forward, Mu suddenly stops saying the fragrance of the flowers and plants in the woods is too strong, 
and there is a rotten smell she almost faints. Then, she is about to stand leaning against the tree. Meanwhile, Peng grabs her arm and tells her to be quiet, and then he tells her to let her lotus seed hit that branch with as much force as possible. Hearing him while looking toward him, she thought this tree didn't look like anything extraordinary, so why did Peng want the lotus seed to hit the tree for no reason in school? His judgment was always accurate, maybe he had found some clues, and she should trust him. After this, she touched and ordered her beast to go, then her lotus seed beast stood before the tree and observed it while the green snake hid in the trees, thinking he couldn't see them, and then he hit the tree so hard even all the branches of the tree break and snakes fall on the ground. Wu thanks Peng that if not for him reminding her, she would have been trapped. But what kind of monster is this? He replies that this disguise is too good. A green tree snake is a green colored snake that mimics a tree branch. The snake's flesh contains traces of toxins that monsters can eat but not humans, he thinks. Still, he signed a contract with Dazzy, theoretically. All the damage he suffered would be transferred to Dazzy, which has a toxic resistance, meaning he could eat it. He heard that the more poisonous the snakes are, the more delicious the meat is. After this, they move from there. Suddenly, Peng feels something strange and looks back to the tree, but then he moves from there thinking, unknown, he mishears. Meanwhile, a green snake runs to hide himself. Moreover, Mu calls Peng, waving her hand from a distance, then she takes him aside, saying there seems to be a water source ahead. She dips her hand in the water and says it appears fresh water with no odor. Peng politely replies excellent. If they have a clean water source, their chances of making it through the seven days significantly improve. Suddenly, he felt something strange in the water, a green frog spit on Peng's leg. Meanwhile, an interface appeared before him about that green frog. Peng read it thinking this green-skinned frog is a psychopath. It only likes to spit on other creatures and hates to spit on them. Most importantly, there are no creatures so bored that they will spit back at them. Then he ignored the frog, saying, Forget it, one more thing is better than one less thing. They still need to think about how to clean this pond efficiently. Then Peng looked toward the frog, and the frog stuck out his tongue and teased Peng. After this, Peng also spits on the frog. While fixing his glasses, he smiles and thinks he has given the frog a chance. But he doesn't treasure it, he has the system and still can't cure his little attitude. Mu sits beside him and calls him. After seeing that Peng spits on the frog, the frog started screaming angrily, and soon, many more frogs gathered in the pond. Peng moved forward to listen to the Mu and stood back in the pond. Looking toward the pond, Mu asks Peng why there are so many frogs. Hear their voice, and sweat starts flowing from Peng's face. She asks him what's wrong, and his face suddenly changes strangely. Meanwhile, all the frogs together spit at them, but Peng holds Mu's hand and shouts to them to run as they run from there. Dazzy and Lotus Seed are also with them. After this, they reach the safe place. Sitting there tiredly, Mu says who would have thought that one day she would be so scared by a group of frogs that she would turn around and run. Tiredly lying on the ground, Peng replies, Don't underestimate frogs 1 and 2 aren't terrible, but there can be at least thousands of green-skinned frogs in a pond. Seeing Peng scared, Mu thinks he is the one who caused such a terrible thing. After some time, he stands up, saying now they should sort out the situation. Then he discusses with Mu that behind the woods to the north is the pond of green-skinned frogs, to the west is the direction of the gate of the valley there are few trees and no threatening large creatures have been found along the way. To the south is a dense forest with tracks of giant carnivorous monsters. Most trees are very thick and not conducive to the movement of lotus seeds. To the east, there is a slight steep slope, and up the hill is a spacious meadow with signs of herbivores gnawing. Then she says this is enough information they got for now, and what about now? Does he want to expand the range a little further? Peng replies excitedly, now back to cooking. Hearing this, she gets upset while Dazzy stands behind her and starts mouth-watering. Then he relaxed her, saying the amount of exercise today is enough. If she is too nervous on the first day, she will get tired very quickly. She nodded yes and said they should promptly find some ingredients they can eat. Peng smiles and replies, no need, holding a green snake. And he says it's fresh, and there are ingredients, thin lotus lilac, golden silk cardamom, and blue black grass. Seeing this, she says when was this all collected? No, she should ask where he put these things, he replies this is the survival of the wilderness, and they must always be prepared for it, and they were getting observed. However, in the security room, the captain asks for the footage of room number 13. The other one was saying to the other soldier that a disgrace signal was sent out on the 31st with coordinates 1, 7, and 3 bars right 24. Captain, they were discussing every room, then a soldier asked the instructor about room number 17. 
The one that Zhang Bairn said was a promoted seed, the other one replied yes, the beast and its features match. Then Captain Zhang told that faced with the green-skinned frog, he can only run away. Even if he is running away, don't forget to find something to chuck at it. While running, the Solider stands aside confusingly and asks if he thinks about it that's survival ability. Colonel says what he thinks is too simple. Don't forget that he is only a student trained for a short period. Whether it's his use of the terrain, his master of wilderness survival skills, and his determination to give up when things go wrong, he has outperformed most teams, giving him a focus to monitor him. However, on Peng's side, Mu tells him she will have to look at his work. After this, she tries to open the safe house door but gets worried. Then Peng asks her what's wrong. She replies it seems to be locked back. She knocks on the door, requesting to open it. Someone from inside replies, someone won anyone's full, and they go somewhere else. Mu worriedly says to Peng that there is no such thing as a safe house in the wild, and it seems they can only think of themselves as unlucky when they meet such people. Peng replies it's getting dark now and only two people will sleep on the ground. While someone from inside says they are still talking to them, just let them go. This safe house is so tiny they will want them to squeeze in and go to another place before it gets dark. She shouts at them angrily, but Peng relaxes her, putting his hand on her shoulder and telling her to wait for a minute. Classmate Mu is not worth being angry with these kinds of people. Someone will soon educate them. Well, she sadly replies he is right. Then she goes to her beast, saying they should go from there, while looking toward Peng. She asks why he is going back and is surprised to see that Peng locked the door, and those inside ask if he closed the door from outside. Seeing this, Mu puts her hand over her mouth in surprise, asking where this lock came from while Peng wipes his hand clean and replies took it from the safe house. It was right next to the table. He guessed the instructor wanted them to use it to reinforce the door to increase safety and he put it in his bag when he was coming out. Then they both go from their colonel, commander, and soldier, seeing him through cameras. The captain there is impressed by Peng's mind, saying this kid is so good, and he is as refined as a monkey. The colonel stands beside Ad, saying he has potential. Jiang adds that it is much better than the average student. Coming up next is the highlight in the wild with monsters everywhere. The question is, can he survive a night? While on Peng's side, they pass through the forest. Peng tells Mu they will go in this direction again to see if they can find a safe house. However, in the darkness of night, a monster watches them from behind the bushes. On the way, Mu says it seems they can only rest in the wild for the night. Peng replies if they continue the search, it won't be safe, and there are no caves to be found. Then Peng, pointing toward the tree, says that the trunk is straight at 3 and 4 meters above the ground and happens to be bifurcated. They can build a simple shelter on that free while Mu agrees with him, saying it's a good idea. Then she ordered her lotus seed to hit the tree, and then Peng sat on the tree to create a shelter with Mu and Dazzy's help. Finally, they started a cover there. Mu said that it could be regarded as makeshift. And then, while looking at Peng, she thought he slept way too fast. Dazzy and lotus seed were also resting, and then she took out her blanket from her bag and fell asleep. However, a girl watches them quietly from behind the bushes, thinking sleeping in the wild with neither campfires nor night guard, she should take the chance rather than jumping from one branch of the tree to another, thinking something is coming. Meanwhile, a dark shadow panther ran toward them, jumping from one tree to another. The girls hiding behind the tree were watched, thinking it wasn't decisive. Peng is okay with his skill set. When the panther roars, Lotus Seed wakes up after hearing its voice. Mu and Peng also wake up from sleep. Mu, in a sleepy state, asks Lotus Seed what's wrong. Meanwhile, Peng shouts, telling Mu to jump off the tree. She throws the blanket away, jumps behind the tree and sits on the Lotus Seed, asking Peng what's happening. Peng stood in front of them and replied look at the tree in front of Mu, looking toward the panther fearfully. He asked if this should be a shadow type and dark type monster, and its style and strength were unknown, not to mention that the combat abilities of hench monsters are highest at night due the run and fight. While looking toward the panther, Peng understands it is level 15, an everyday grade dark shadow panther. He replies to Mu that to make a run for it would expose their back to the vicious beast, and doing that would only initiate the predatory instincts of the beast. However, the panther jumps to attack Peng. Peng sees this, thinks fast, and calls Dazzy, and then Dazzy stands in front of Peng to save him. Then the panther jumped and swung his claws to attack Dazzy, but he protected himself from the attack. While using electricity to paralyze the panther, Dazzy shot and bit him so hard and made him. Seeing this, Peng thinks of using electricity to paralyze the enemy to slow it down. All the training they've done has not been in vain. Even though he's facing a higher level enemy, Dazzy can still handle it quickly. After this, the injured panther ran away 
He roared while jumping from one tree to another. Meanwhile, while hissing, a substantial green anaconda got there from the side of the tree, and then it moved toward them. Seeing it, Peng shouted to run. After this, Peng and Mu, sitting on the lotus seed, run away. The anaconda is watching them from behind, and he eats the tree branch. Meanwhile, a girl comes there saying it looks like he has no interest in Peng. Well, he is pretty diplomatic. Otherwise, her cover would have been blown if they had fought. While in the control room, they were watching everything. A soldier tells the colonel that an emergency has occurred and asks them to eliminate that mutant giant jungle anaconda. Then Commander Tan replies that there is no need. The giant jungle anaconda is gentle, and its offensive strength when initiating attacks isn't muscular. This will be another trail for the students, and if they can't even deal with a trial of level, then they should give up on going down this path when they still can. Then the colonel tells the soldier that Commander Tan is correct, however. Have the Golden Condor team get ready to stand by for rescue. If someone presses the emergency rescue button, they are to set off immediately, and then the soldier salutes him while agreeing with him. The next day, Mu sleeps, leaning against the lotus seed and wakes up when the sunlight falls on her face. Hang asks her if she is awake, she is just in time, they can depart now. Mu surprisingly asks, and he replies while holding Dazzy food in hand that to take a look around yesterday's campsite. They left in a hurry yesterday, so they left a lot of items behind. She stood back, asking about yesterday's campsite but they needed to find out if that giant jungle anaconda was still there. They also didn't know any necessary information, such as its weaknesses and attack pattern. Going back like this was just too dangerous. Then Peng says it's precisely because they didn't collect any helpful information that they need to go back. And the level of understanding toward a monster is also a skill set of a monster trainer. She won't know when this information could save her life. The time they live in has changed. She will only become weaker if she still wishes to continue staying in a safe area like before. Then he goes there, and she follows him, saying to wait for him. She runs after him, asking if she can't catch up if he is walking so fast, and when he encounters a monster, could it be that he is going to ride Dazzy without her? When Dazzy bows to him, asking Peng to sit on top of him, Peng says don't be angry, Dazzy. Indeed, he can't transport people while the girl is watching them hiding behind the tree. After this, Mu and Peng, their beasts, pass over the tree that would have broken and fallen to the ground. Mu says this is horrible. If they hadn't run fast enough, they wouldn't have ended any better than these trees. Suddenly passing over the tree, Peng looks at the wood pace heart while Mu, moving ahead, says she will look over there. Seeing this, Peng stands near it, thinking wood space heart is a crucial ingredient for Silly's evolution. But he has never heard of it being sold in any of the markets it's like no one even knows of the existence of this kind of ingredients. So they're hidden inside these kinds of trees, similar to bottle trees. Also, from the looks of it, yesterday's mutant giant jungle anaconda could grow that big because it ate these rare ingredients. No wonder it didn't chase after them yesterday. It was protecting its food. Then Peng grabs it and puts it in his bag, thinking it seems like he needs to find a chance to collect more wood space hearts later. For now, he should take advantage of this given opportunity during field training to see other rare ingredients. After this, Pen spent the third day with the same success, the fourth day with laughter and success, and the fifth day in the same way, and then the sixth day came like this. The seventh day comes when the colonel gathers students on the ground while telling all of them some outstanding students have passed the training, and he is delighted the tentative date for the next combined training in the valley has been set for three weeks. From now on, students who have attended this one can participate in the next one for free. The training has now ended, and he hopes they have learned plenty from it. Next is a three-day holiday. Classes will resume in three days. Hearing this, all the students there get excited that they finally rest and now they will go home. Also, return students their mobile phones. Mu says they can finally get in touch with the outside world. She will call her home to tell them she is okay. While Peng is looking toward his mobile phone, he thinks he will send Sister Tang the news too. But he is surprised to see Lotus Swarm's picture on his mobile phone. However, in CH Nagan City Center, some people listen to the news on their mobile phones while others watch the information on the big TV in shops and stores. The announcement was about the battle in the north as the reporters were reporting dear viewers as they'd already seen they were at the front lines of the fight. The CH Nagan military troops have stopped the locust swarm outside the front lines. According to the research by Director Feng of the Chang'an Monster Breeder Association, these monsters, called dead leaf locusts, are terrified of fire. This is some good news as they have successfully held them off using their weakness. This swarm of locusts is estimated to have a few billion of them. Each dead leaf locust is at least 30 cm long. 
Peng was watching the news. Dazzy and Dummy were also sitting aside in the room while Silly was playing all around Peng, watching the news, and thought the situation didn't look too good. Then Peng got a call from Director Feng. He picked up the phone and greeted him smilingly. Feng asks him if he has come home after his training. While sitting in his office, he tells Peng that the military just sent over a batch of the new type of voracious golden toads and wants them to promote their grades. Does he have time to come down to the association tomorrow? He will be paid for his service. Hearing this, Peng asks voracious golden toads. Is it possible that the military wants to use the voracious golden toads to deal with the dead leaf locusts? Feng puts Peng's call on the speaker. Two guys sit there in the office, surprised to hear this, and one of them asks the other how he knew the military wanted to use them. Hearing this, Feng angrily looks toward them. Then he replies to Peng, saying that's correct. Using firearms to exterminate them is pretty inefficient. So the military wants them to research ways to improve the grade of the voracious golden toads by using the laws of nature. Then Peng asks about the laws of nature. Using the natural enemies of locusts is a pretty plausible idea. And Feng replies by asking so what does he say? Is he interested in participating in this research project? The remuneration is negotiable. Peng says if he puts it that way, then he doesn't mind. Can the payment be changed to a commander tier electric type monster core? Crystal Fang replies truthfully that this wouldn't be allowed, however, he knows some people in the military, so it shouldn't be much of a problem. He will see him tomorrow. The next day, Feng comes from his office to receive Peng and sees this waitress there. They get curious to know one of them who's that young man. Director Feng even came down to greet him in person. The other one replied, asking if he was the son of some leader. Feng receives him, pointing toward the elevator, and says to Peng yesterday, and the military brought two samples of the voracious golden toads, let's head inside. However, in the elevator, Peng asks if he stays up all night. He replies yes and spends most of the night looking after them, but he still needs to make heads and tails of them. Meanwhile, they reach the fifth floor. On getting there and seeing this place, Peng thinks what an ample space Feng welcomes him to the Monster Breeder Association Research Center. Then he shows Peng their workplace and offers him a voracious golden toad. Peng looks toward the toad and thinks that the voracious golden toad evolved from the horned frogs, and they have terrifying jump abilities and are of the Earth's attributes. When Feng tells Peng to look there as a servant stands there holding toad's food, Peng asks about it, and Feng replies these are fennel-scented grilled locust skewers, they're the voracious golden toad's favorite food and he can try to feed them. They are shocked to see that Peng eats that food instead of providing toad, and while eating it, he says the sauce is rich and fragrant. It has just the right amount of oil in the fresh meat, which is wrapped by a crispy exterior, and he gives this roasted locust a 10 out of 10. Seeing Peng eating his food, the voracious golden toad starts making noise. Peng relaxes him while giving him his food and tells him that he was taste testing it for him. It's a pity that there's too much fennel and a bit too strong. As soon as Peng closes his food to him, the toad quickly eats its food. Peng looks toward the food stick, thinking that even to eat the metal skewer, the voracious golden toad must have a very powerful stomach, or it wouldn't be able to digest that. After this, he asks Feng which aspect of the voracious golden toad the military wishes for them to improve. Feng replies to its defense and ability to digest things, and improving its offensive capabilities will also be good. Moreover, Feng shows him the result of his research in the interface that he found the voracious golden toad has a relatively decent affinity for two attributes, earth and fire. Also, he extracted a bit of greedy golden toad skin, combined it with various fire attributed materials, and discovered that its flesh has a high affinity with fire orchid vines. The flesh showed no signs of rejection when fire orchid vine extract was introduced, but fire orchid vines have very gentle fire attributes so relying on that is insufficient. Hearing this, Peng thinks there is a path that uses fire orchid vines as a supporting ingredient. That path of evolution is also towards the fire attribute. They need to modify the formula a bit. Then, he tells Director Feng that they could approach this from a different angle. Feng replies by asking what he has already come up with an idea in such a short amount of time. Peng excitedly replies, giving him an example that they can view the voracious golden toad as the primary food ingredient and the fire orchid vines as a seasoning. Still, the flavor of fire orchid vines isn't strong enough, so it's hard for the taste of their herb to permeate into the toad. In this situation, they could consider a different cooking approach, such as using a more vital ingredient for cooking the meat with more heat. Hearing this, Feng doesn't understand what Peng is saying, so he surprisingly asks for a more robust component for more warmth. Peng smiled, saying yes, and then Feng surprisingly asked about the red-faced demon chili. 
Feng smiled and replied Director Feng could give it a try. After this, Feng pointed to Xiao Zheng and said, If he recalls correctly, there was still a batch of red-faced demon chilies in the association's warehouse. Go and bring it over to the Zheng node. Yes, comparing evolution to cooking is too much. This is the method their city's youngest monster breeder came up with. Feng sighed, thinking although Xiao Zheng had potential, they needed more talented individuals to join them to broaden the path for monster breeders, and he hoped he would understand this one day. After this, Zheng brings the ingredients, looking at the dragon chili. Peng says it looks like it has been well preserved while Zheng looks toward Peng, smiles and thinks he chose the best one. They don't want Mr. Peng to blame the ingredients quality when he fails do they? After this, Feng heated the dragon chili and put that material in the jar, saying judging from its color, its properties seem too strong. Then he ordered Zheng to get some such wood, King Jinseng, and Moon. Peng thinks they still need a few more ingredients, but it would be too deliberate if he said something now, waiting for the result of the experiment. Feng filled that material in an injection, telling the evolution solution was completed, and then he injected this injection into the voracious golden toad. As soon as Feng injected the infusion, an explosion occurred. Feng said it was a failure. Xiao Zheng to test the blood and flesh to find out why the loss was then. Zheng found the toad exploding because it absorbed too many fire elements. The explosion was a result of conflicting energies there was. There's a lot of unmerged fire element residue in the flesh and blood. However, Feng asks about conflicting energies, and Zheng says that based on the results of his previous experiments if there was a chance for success, he should have been able to pick up at least some trace of the fire element from the blown up pieces and flesh that was partially emerged with the fire element. If that were the case, they must keep improving the formula and adjust the amount of materials needed. If the energies conflicted with one another, they didn't merge at all, which means that this experiment is a total failure. However, Feng says it's too early to decide what they thought needed to be corrected and continue the experiments. They need more data. Hearing this, Xiao Zheng angrily looks toward Feng, calling the teacher Feng's hand to him, showing him the order to bring him another set of ingredients. After this, Feng does the second experiment, which also fails, and then he does the third experiment, which also fails like the first and second experiments. Seeing this, Feng's companions start talking to each other, one of them asks, as they've already failed three times. Indeed it's a problem with the formula, and maybe Zheng was right about it being incorrect. The instructor there signs and replies to them that Gao Peng still too young his skills were a bit over-exaggerated. Peng stood aside, listening to their conversation, and smiled. Then he told director Feng they'd tried so many ingredients already. He felt that using the devil chilies as the sole main ingredient was insufficient. Perhaps they could add another main element. Hearing this, Feng, while putting his hand on his mouth, asks for two main components. That's a bold idea. Feng replies he believed in him, didn't he? So why doesn't he believe in him one more time? Then Feng asks what he plans on using for the other main ingredients. Feng tells him black soft soil is an earth attributed soil material with dampness properties and is of yin nature. They can have the voracious golden toad consume this to protect its internal organs. After that, they can add some sparrow saliva wood to the test list of supporting ingredients for the devil chili, and the wood feeds fire, and fire creates earth. Hearing this, Feng, looking toward his failed experiment material, asks, mutually reinforcing and neutralizing each other, they might as well give it a shot. After this, they bring the ingredients and prepare the material. Zheng, searching on the computer system, surprisingly tells Feng's teacher that the fire element has successfully assimilated into the flesh this time, and the amount is substantial. Feng happily says, it's effective, that's great. After this, Peng asks Feng why he doesn't proceed to live to test since many of these ingredients must be consumed. They won't know their results by then, simply experimenting on the monster's flesh won't be enough. Feng excitedly replies, saying, all right, and then Peng injects the injection into Toad, saying even though they never cut off too much of the flesh and anesthetize it each time in hopes of full recovery, this Toad is still a little pitiful. Now, he will feed it some locust skewers later. As soon as he injects the injection, smoke spreads everywhere Peng. In contrast, Coughing says they already figured out the correct amount of each ingredient, and the rest is all pretty routine. Add in the remaining ingredients at the right time. They all can go outside first. While coughing and covering his mouth with clothes, Feng says there is no need, he will be able to observe the reactions by staying close to Peng. While returning the injection to Feng, he thinks he will get some air. After this, he got out of the hall and stood there while putting his hand on his nose. 
He thought these demon chilies sure had a pungent smell. Just now, he was acting natural enough, and they wouldn't know that he already knew the formula based on the suggestions he gave them. The procedure was experimented with by Director Fen, but he still needs to be careful. It'd be a pain if someone with ill intentions found out. This is the first research experiment conducted on the voracious golden toad, so there's no explanation why an ordinary high school student like him knew the formula before they even started. Everyone is coming out coughing. Feng returns and looks back to the red fumes, thinking it's a success. However, from that red fumes, the toad has turned into a magma fire monster. Seeing this, Zheng excitedly goes to Feng, saying that a fire attributes dual attributed of fire and earth teacher they've succeeded. Peng, seeing this, thinks that the fire attribute is there, but it doesn't have dual attributed to use it as soon as possible. This is the only method they could use. Meanwhile, an interface appears before him about magma fire toad while the people of the laboratory, seeing this success, start crying with joy. However, at the front lines north of CH Nagan City, the locust swarm were moving to attack the civilian area while the military, to save the civilian from their attack, was ready to face the locust swarm. Moreover, they had prepared their weapons in tanks. The soldiers were informed that the 3rd Squadron had assembled there. Also, the ammunition inspection was completed, and the commander ordered them to replace the parts. Also, the captain informed the headquarters that everyone had reached the district and prepared for battle. They watched the locusts swarm through binoculars and told her they were coming. As the locust swarm moves to attack the military, the captain orders them to use white phosphorus bombs, use the white phosphorus incendiary bombs, and then throw bombs toward the swarm. The captain watched them through binoculars and said the military excellent follow this rhythm and press on and suddenly get scared to see that the insects will use that sandstorm thing again. Meanwhile, a soldier informs the captain that the sandstorm has blown back the incendiary bombs. The captain replies the locust swarm has started using the sandstorm, and then he orders the military to stop using the incendiary bombs. He repeats stop using the incendiary bombs. Then the military man, in fear, says to the others, if they can't use the incendiary bombs, what else can they do? Then, the other one stands aside from him and starts firing toward the insects, saying there are countless civilians behind them. These disgusting bugs shoot them and kill them all. Meanwhile, toads come there and start attacking the locust swarm. The military man is surprised to see how the sandstorm stopped, and he asks the platoon leader where these big to came from. He replies what giant toads. This is someone from the university with excellent knowledge of dead leaf locusts, so stop with the giant toads. However, the toads release the red smoke from their mouth, which turns into a fire. They throw that fire toward the locust swarm, and those insects become ashes and fall to the ground. As soon as they fall on the ground, toads eat them while the captain shouts in surprise, asking if a hundred were wiped out in just one attack. The platoon leader replies with these red stream toads, their brothers will have to risk their lives to fight these monsters, and the person who researched them is great. However, on the city side, an older adult was sitting on a bench under the shadow of a tree. An older man named Han stood beside her. She asked her about that monster training, asking if his granddaughter also participated in that particular training. He replies don't mention it. She was eliminated the next day. Her dad gave her a good lecture. Meanwhile, a jeep gets there. Also, the military man comes out of the other and stands aside from the jeep. Seeing this, the older woman asks which family this jeep is going on. Old Han replies that in this direction, they are going to the sixth floor to find Peng. A similar car had come to pick him up before. The older woman, hearing this, says, Speaking of Peng, she remembers walking her dog in the neighborhood. He saw him coming home with a skeleton. Hearing this old hand waving hand, she asks what skeleton it is, a ghost. Meanwhile, Chen also stood aside to add her point, saying she had seen that skeleton flash ghost fire around his body. Old Han asked if she had seen the Gao Peng guy living upstairs in her building. Meanwhile, an older woman stood on the bench with her gray disc spider behind them, hearing their conversation, laughing, saying what skeleton is this. Gao Peng's imperial beast looks scary, but it protects people and takes care of them. Hearing this, the two older women look toward each other surprisingly. The older woman, while giving her spider the needles, says to help her thread it, and the spider threads the needle. Seeing this, old Han says this little guy is so capable he never heard her say his name. She smiles while putting her hand on the spider's head and replies she can't name it. On the other side, Peng stands aside from his home, surprised to see a military man there. However, the captain comes to him, giving him the crystal core. 
Mr. Gao Peng. According to the agreement that President Feng made with him on behalf of the military, a crystal core of a leader-level thunder monster is the reward for the successful complete research evolution of the Red Stream Fire Toads Peng taking the box thanks to the captain. Then, the captain tells Peng he volunteered for this assignment because he wanted to meet him in person. He saluted Peng. Speaking on behalf of his comrades, he would like to express his high respect and sincere gratitude to him. Also, the special representative is those comrades who have already lost their lives in this operation. It is the bounden duty of soldiers to defend their home and their country, and they are not afraid of dying, but they are worried about not dying correctly. After this, they go from there. Peng watches them going through the window, and then he looks toward his hand, thinking that while covering the system, he should try to participate in more experimental projects in this new area to help the front line. But the system is only an aid. The most important thing is to improve his strength as soon as possible to protect himself, and then he will also have the right to speak in the experiment. Meanwhile, Dazzy comes from a side and clings lovingly to his leg, and then Peng hugs him, saying so conscientious about comforting him. Peng tells Dazzy excitedly that the primary material has just arrived, and he will help him upgrade his quality today. Then he goes to the kitchen and starts preparing soup on the stove, and then, due to the fumes blackening his face, he pours the soup into the bowl, brings it to Dazzy, and tells him to drink it. Dazzy drinks that soup. After this, the bowl slips from his hand and falls on the floor and breaks. The bright light spreads all around Dazzy, and then he falls on the floor. Seeing this, Dummy gets worried, and then he stands aside from Dazzy, touching Dazzy's head. And then suddenly, a plan comes to his mind. He goes toward the fridge. From there, he brings pine needle seed and feeds it to Dazzy. Seeing this, Peng stood aside, smiled, and then put his hand on Dummy's shoulder, says don't worry, let Dazzy stay alone for a while. Hearing this, he stood beside him and started eating pine needle seed. Seeing this, Peng think of these two living treasure. He believes it's also a good idea to settle Silly's contract. However, Silly was wondering all around. Peng called him, pointing his hand, but Silly ran ahead instead of listening to him. When Peng showed her juice, he said, Come there, Silly, get some good juice. Silly saw the juice bottle in Peng's hand, ran toward him and grabbed the juice bottle. Seeing this, Peng thought all three of them were foodies. As soon as Silly grabs the juice bottle, her needles sting Peng's thumb and little blood comes out. Peng closes his eyes, and in his thoughts, he enters the world where interfaces appear all around him, like the jellyfish in the form of smoke. Peng thinks Silly's consciousness space is still a bit weak, so he asks the smoke if he has gotten bold as he is willing to approach him on his initiative while thinking it seems all the delicious food he gave her didn't go in vain. Then, extending his finger to the smoke, Peng says it to become his partner, and he will provide him with the power to stop fearing everything. The smoke replies no, he doesn't want power. He wants juice. Peng gets upset and replies that he will give him lots and lots of juice, and then the interface disappears, which is the contract between Peng and the jellyfish. The following day, a woman named Zhang was sleeping, and her spider was also resting on her bed. Suddenly, she felt someone in her room telling her to get up as it was time for breakfast. When she woke up scared, a parrot told her to get up and have breakfast for him. She sighed and replied, good boy, it's him. After the older man left, he has been with her, thanking her for that. Some time ago, an older man, while trying her food, said that since his daughter's accident, he has not been in good spirits. Then she says it was hard for the older man to take care of her meals every day even though she was suffering, especially breakfast. He would get up on time daily to make breakfast for her and then wake her up. Unfortunately, when she got better and could care for him, the older man left, and the older man's picture was on the wall of her room. Also, at that time, she didn't know how to live and didn't want to live anymore. Fortunately, the words he imitated gave her the motivation to continue living. Then she thanked the parrot for staying with her like this. But the older man had been waiting for her for too long, so she had to go to him. Then she remembered when the older man came to her room while putting his hand on her hand saying he had come to see her and she started crying when he showed her the ring on his finger saying this time they would never be apart again. Then he intertwines his finger with hers, which has identical rings. She, with tears in her eyes, says they will never be apart again, and the story shifts to the present time when she is lying on her bed, her hand touching the dying parrot's beak and the parrot's wings scattered on the bed. The next day, Peng was sleeping. Suddenly, he woke up hearing Dazzy's voice, and when he looked aside his bed, Dazzy was flopping around, itching his mouth. Peng quickly got out of bed and kept his head in his lap, asking if something was wrong with his evolution. He is surprised to see when his teeth suddenly start changing. Seeing this, Peng thinks that the genes of the centipede have mutated after the mutation of the world. Peng was sitting with Dazzy on his lap while looking toward Dazzy. 
he thinks the current form of Dazzy is that he is afraid it can no longer be judged by common sense. Then, he lovingly stroked his head on Dazzy's head and said, Don't be frightened. This pain is necessary, bear growing up and run with it. After this, Silly comes to the room. Peng puts Silly as a cap on his head and comes out of the room thinking about what evolutionary path he should choose for Silly. Should he go as the support, and should he go for killing power? He chooses the evolutionary route using the hollow wood found last time as the primary material. Also, it will become a dual attribute wood spirit jellyfish with healing powers and spatial abilities. However, if the space system attack is increased, the general attacking force will be very frightening. If he gives up the attack line and evolves it into a support type, he will always feel a little unwilling about it. But such a training process, the time and effort required money are certainly not a tiny amount. It will be relatively faster if he evolves it to support the process. Then, while clenching his fist, Peng thinks, forget it. He will take the support route and upgrade the wood spirit jellyfish. When he becomes strong, he can cultivate any type. But for now, he will choose the best one that suits him. After this, Peng came out of the home and suddenly saw many people standing there. Seeing it, Peng thought, why is it so lively today? People were talking to each other. A woman looking toward the soul guardian flying in the sky said it was a spirit. It must have come to pick Granny Chen. Han Old replied, look at the sky. It must be Old Chen. Hearing this, Peng looks at the sky and is surprised to see the Soul Guardian monster there. And then an interface appears before him through which he reads all the information related to the beast. Meanwhile, the military arrived there and started questioning people who were gathered outside the building. Old Han said he saw them. They flew up the two bodies on the iron frame as points of light. The parrot and the man were dead. Peng stood aside there, thinking if it was Granny Chan who had passed away. Then he remembered that there was also a grey plate striped spider at Granny Chen's house after the death of the master. The beast was no longer restrained, and if it chose to go into the mountains and return to nature, then it was fine. The fear is that they will change their temperament and become aggressive and attack other humans. And then he runs toward Granny Chen's house, thinking he must find it quickly. Peng finally reached Granny Chen's door tiredly, but the door was locked. Seeing this, Peng thought there was no moment inside the door, so where could it hide? According to the habit of the grey plate striped spider, it should be. And then he finds the spider outside the home on the wall. Peng calls Dazzy there, and he quickly arrives there, seeing Dazzy's spider fall off the wall. Peng surprisingly asks Dazzy why he fell off after being frightened by him. Then the spider gets close to Peng. Seeing this, Peng puts his hand on the spider's head and reads his mind. And this thought is in his mind when Grandma, while putting her hand on the spider's director, says she is too old and will die soon so that he won't sign a contract with her. Also, forgive Grandma for not giving him a name. It's just for the reason so that he can meet a new fate in the present time. Peng stood there putting a hand on spider's head, asking if he must be having a hard time. And then while extending a hand, smiled and asked Spider if he would like just come home with him. The next day, when Peng happily passes to the studio with Dazzy and Grey Plate, Spider sees this person. They start talking to each other that it's the head of the five poison sects. While Peng passes by, they think he is lucky a tank is exactly what he lacks right now, though using a spider as a meat shield seems ridiculous. There is an evolutionary pathway for the striped Grey Plate Spider to be a tank. The ingredients are relatively easy to find. Then, getting into the elevator, he thinks he will soon receive plenty of soul power after he establishes a blood contract and quickly strengthens it. With the soul power that Dazzy and Silly provide, he will be able to establish a blood contract with Dummy in no time. Then he sighed, and tears started flowing from his eyes, thinking he shouldn't have promoted Dummy's grade that early. Not it would be hard to collect the soul power needed to promote it, seeing his crying Dazzy wordily look toward him. After this, he reaches the studio. Sun greets him, calling Little Boss. Peng surprisingly thinks, doesn't this girl usually call him Master Peng? Something is wrong. While looking toward Peng, she excitedly says Little Boss, long time to see him. Peng smiles and nods yes. Then Zun tells Little Boss there have been many people inquiring about him. Some customers specifically want to see him despite telling them to wait because he is not free, but she can't get in touch with him. Describing this, she shouted at him while Peng relaxed, saying he had some time today and they would talk things out nice and slow. Then, while giving her the ingredient list, he smiles and politely asks if she can prepare these ingredients first. He will treat her to milk tea later. Then she angrily snatches the list from his hand and goes from there. As soon as she goes, he sighs. Moreover, while using Soma Mana on a grey plate spider, he goes to the laboratory where Peng says, don't be sad and become his partner. 
he will give him a loving home. And then he tears the contract paper while the spider replies, yes. And Peng lovingly petted the spider, saying they can start with the evolution now. Then Peng, while creating the timer, began his work as he kept the spider in a glass container. And then, moving toward the spider, he tells the spider his body color is gray, and he is a striped gray plate spider. After evolving, he will become a gray armored spider, and since Silly and Dummy both end with it, he shall call him Stripey then. Then, while putting the evolution solution in a glass container, Peng tells him he sees this is an evolution solution he has explicitly made for him and that he will become stronger once he bathes. However, the spider's evolutionary process gets started. Peng looks toward him and thinks of soul transfer. It hurts. This is only a fraction of the pain that Stripey is experiencing right now, and he can do it. This pain is something he must share to become stronger. They can only rely on themselves to overcome it. Meanwhile, Zun comes there, calls him a little boss, and then asks a customer there while pointing with her hand if he knows a customer who looks very rich. Peng smiles while taking off his glasses. Peng replies that he will be there in a second. Thinking he has one more mouth to feed now, it's time to earn money. After this, Peng goes to the room where the customer is looking. Peng surprisingly looked toward them, thinking that it is interesting to a commander tier familiar. Then Peng took off his coat and put it on Zun's arm, telling her he would attend to the customer. She stayed there and paid attention to the little spider's evolutionary process, and saw the container on the table. The moment the liquid turned into a lighter color, pour the contents of this tube into the container, and then she smiled and replies right. Moreover, Peng greeted the customer, Lu Zai. While shaking hands, Zai told Peng he had long heard of his good name and that it was a pleasure to meet him finally. Then, he briefly introduces Peng, saying he is a freelancer. Previously, he owned a small herb garden, which brutal grey devil spiders sadly destroyed, and his garden is still under repair. However, Peng surprisingly asks if he means City East's herb garden. Zai says that's right. He didn't think that Mr. Gao Peng would know of his little garden, and he is honored. Hearing this, Peng believes this is too zealous. He doesn't think he is well known, so their conversation starts. Zai says to Peng it seems that he is unaware he was invited to the military's celebration banquet just a while back. Also, during the feast, Director Chen said he had been the key contributor to the magma fire toad research process. Air moves, Zai's assistant, takes off the clothes from the cage, and Zai tells Peng, while pointing toward the dog-type monster that he has a familiar he wants to strengthen, so he brought it there because he figured that Mr. Peng is very trustworthy. Peng sees the monster get surprised and thinks it is an ebony night hound. Also, according to what is known, all dogs-type monsters can evolve into an ebony night hound. It's a possible alternate evolutionary path for dog-type monsters. This species has jet-black fur that perfectly blends in with the darkness of the most wavelengths of light making it the perfect assassin under the cover of the night. This also makes it an ideal watchdog. Many manor and garden owners choose this as their familiar, and then Zai tells Peng that he knows how he charges his fees for commander tier familiar. He determines the price, also, feel free to state his price. Hearing this, Peng thinks of eliminating the two rarest and strongest paths for its evolution and eliminating five more courses that require materials that are too rare and procedures that are too complex. They are now left with 13 studies. After this, Peng says promoting the grade should be no problem. He even has quite a few evolutionary paths to choose from, and the strength of the familiar after evolution will differ accordingly. Zai replies he understands he will have the most expensive one. Then Peng, while showing his hand, smiles and tells them it is 5,000 alliance credits. Hearing this, Zai gets shocked while Peng quickly holds Zai's hand, saying what a great decision, Mr. Zai. Suddenly, a strange sound comes from the laboratory. Hearing this sound, Peng runs toward the laboratory, asking Zun what happened. She responds fearfully, pointing toward the spider and tells Peng to look, boss. However, the container is broken, and Stripey comes out of it. Seeing this, Peng thinks it's a success, but then he scolds Stripey, asking how he could break the lab's equipment. Also, he scared Zun. After this, Stripey comes to him. Then, while petting his head lovingly, Peng says no matter how strong he becomes in the future, he must remember how to control his strength. Then Stripey moved back, and a wooden stick lies on the floor. As soon as he moved, he broke that stick. Peng worriedly thinks, why do all the familiars under him seem silly? Is this what they mean by a man being known by the company he keeps? Then Peng smiled while looking towards Stripey and ordered him, saying now go to his office first, stay quiet, and don't touch anything when Stripey moved. Peng surprisingly thought, why is it crawling sideways? After this, Peng holds Zun's hand and lifts her, apologizing. Can he order a new container for him, one larger than the previous one? 
place the fees on his tab and prepare the materials needed for the Ebony Nighthound's evolution. He has already made an appointment with the customer to start the experiment next week and call someone to clean the laboratory and put it on his tab, too. Since the apparatuses are broken, he can't continue his work anymore so that he will head back now. She stood up, telling them they needed to spend money again, and then Peng went from there with Dazzy, thinking his house was getting increasingly crowded. It is about time to move to a place with more space. It would be best if it were on the outskirts of the city. It would be more convenient for him to leave town for training and gather medicine that way. But he must first contact the middleman for now. Then, while looking towards Stripey, Peng thinks, does he do the evolution incorrectly? Why did it evolve into a crab? Instead, he hits Stripey, telling him to walk correctly. He is a spider, not a crab. Stripey got scared by Peng's behavior, and then Peng sighed and relaxed. After this, Peng goes to the property dealer's office. The employee, Xiao Lu, welcomes him there, saying she is the employee he spoke to earlier. Peng asks when he contacted her before she thinks he could see the house today. She replies while pointing aside, telling them they have a car to pick him up this way. According to his requirements, a large villa on the city's outskirts should have a garden, basement, and relatively clean surroundings. Then she gave Peng a pad, saying there were photos of the estate. Peng viewed the picture of a villa in the tab, and she said that although the villa doesn't have a basement, a large area around it belongs to the estate, so he can build a cellar by himself. While pointing to a picture, he asks which area is located. Hearing this, she gets worried, but by relaxing, she replies around Prosperous Dragon Lake. The price is low, only 2,000 credits. Then she tells him in a low voice because it's the outskirts, there's very little overseeing the area. In addition to the villa's location, there is a large plot of land, which is equivalent to a bonus, especially for his requirements. Then Peng says she doesn't be worried, and he still has some questions he wants to know. Then, showing her, he asks if these photos are new, points to a picture on the tab, and asks if this picture was taken before the cataclysm, as the background plant doesn't seem to have mutated. Also, she doesn't have any critical information to hide from him, does she? Hearing this, she responds, how is it possible? Consider it, sir, a standalone villa from before the cataclysm that comes with a few dozen acres of garden is practically impossible to find in Chang'an City nowadays. Now, it is selling only for 2,000 alliance credits, which is very cheap. Although it's a remote area, there is a road right at the foot of the hill, so if he buys a car, it will be convenient to get around. Hearing this, Peng thinks about how is this scene of fooling people so familiar, and there seem to be a lot of problems, such as decoration and safety issues. According to the photo, this house is worth at least 3,000 to 4,000 credits. After all, there was plenty of unrest in society during the early stages of the cataclysm. Such a villa in a rural area would either have been deserted or left in ruins. So as long as the house is 60% newer than the photo, he will be satisfied as for safety, it may be a problem for others. It's enough to have them in his family, maybe. He can give them a free extra meal. And then he smiles, fixing his glasses while she calls his name. Also saying it is going for a relatively low price, and the seller is making a loss from this deal. Peng tells her they should go and see. After this, they both go from there. While she looks stripey while touching him lovingly, she asks is this his beast? What a cute little crab. Also, he has good taste. Peng turns while telling her angrily it's a spider. She smiles and replies yes, but suddenly he feels someone hiding behind a wall, and when he goes to look at the border, she calls his name, asking what happened. But as he walks toward the wall, no one is there, and he turns around, saying to her it is nothing. Maybe it's just his eye hearing this, someone hiding behind the wall smiling. He captures Peng's picture, thinking young master, Gao Peng, who has become famous recently, finally found him, and then they both go from there on the bus. Then, they arrive at their destination. While pointing toward the villa, she tells Peng this is the house she introduced to him. While looking toward the house, he thinks he can't believe it's so different from the photo. Is it that only the outer wall is a little shabby? Then they get into the house. While looking at everything, Peng thinks there is hardly any dust inside the house. Does the shelter still let people clean regularly? And is the furniture fully furnished? It's just the old style, and some tables, chairs, and floors need to be repaired. The furniture in this room is costly. Even if the location isn't good, it cannot be sold for only 2,000 credits. It's too weird. However, a man comes there asking is Mr. Gao Peng. 
Hearing this, Peng looks toward Xiao Liu, points toward him and tells him this is the seller of this villa, Mr. Liu. Liu smiled and said he heard that Mr. Peng was coming to see the house, so he rushed over. Peng surprisingly asked if they knew each other. Liu comes toward them, asking who the community now doesn't know the great name Gao Peng. He is the trump card of President Feng, the hero behind the last military operation. Then, showing Peng his business card, he smiles and says this is his business card, and now he is also doing some Imperial Beast business on the side. If Mr. Peng is interested in cooperation, he can give him a 20% discount. Hearing this, Peng thinks that Mr. Liu knows how to do business. Then Liu asks how his house is well taken care of. He has someone come every month to clean it, and if he wants to buy it, he only needs to spend an additional nursing fee, and he can move in directly, which is very convenient. Peng replies he is not going to lie to him. The price he offered is a good deal, but there is a problem. His house is worth at least 4,000 credits even if it's not in a good location. Also, 2,000 credits s way below the market price, and he wonders if he could tell him why. Putting his hand on the table, Liu said his parents initially used this house after their retirement, and his parents are rural people, not used to living in the big city, so he bought a villa in the outskirts for them. Then he remembered that they had worked hard for him all their lives and he as a son had become successful so naturally he wanted them to live with happiness. But that beast wave ruined everything, and they didn't have time to enjoy it, not even for a day they had to suffer. Then, he punches the ground and abuses the world. Then, in the present time, he tells Peng that he is going to keep this house for a long time. But he heard that Peng was looking for a home in similar condition, so he asks the agent to recommend it to him for 2,000 credits, and he can think of this as his investment in him. Also, he is not young anymore, his abilities are limited, and he is powerless to do whatever he wants. Young talent like him is the future of Chang'an City, and he hopes such a tragedy can be avoided in the future, then Peng thanks him for his trust. He also tells him that he will buy this house, and then in the night, Peng returns home, bringing food for Dummy, Dazzy, and Silly as soon as he opens the door. All three of them are busy with work and don't pay attention to him. Seeing this, Peng says indifferently, then he says to them with a smile, come and see them too. These are his carefully selected nourishment for him, much better than orange juice, pine needles, and whatever while taking out the food boxes from the shopping bag. Dummy and Dazzy get curious while Silly is still drinking orange juice. Then he puts all the food on the table in front of them, saying come on, eat quickly. Meanwhile, Tang comes in from behind, saying his house seems more lively. Peng returns and looks toward her. She greets him, saying, long time to see. She lovingly pets Dazzy and says he got an upgrade. Then Tang, while pulling Dazzy's checks, lovingly says Dazzy even grew teeth to come and let her see if it crooked while Peng turns his face and thinks, bear with it. Then she asked Peng if she heard he had already bought a house. He smiled and replied Sister Tang. He got the news very fast. But the house still needed to be repaired by a renovation company so they could move early. Then she excitedly, holding Peng's hand, said that he should have just asked this sister of his. There are many ways to decorate. He has insufficient social experience, so don't be fooled by others. Then he freed his hand from her hand. After this, she stands at the door and says it's a deal. She has to go beforehand. He replies by saying now he wonders why the house was cheap. Then she slams the door shut and leaves. While standing out Peng's house, she thinks that when the time comes, she can buy the house next to Peng. The next day, Peng goes to the forest with Silly, Dummy and Dazzy, then Peng hides behind the tree and watches the jeep parked below, thinking it's already at this level and the bottle grove shouldn't be far behind. Then Peng stood on the leaves beside the tree, thought it best to gather all the necessary materials today. A total of three days of vacation, and today is the last day. If he didn't collect all the wood he needed today, then he will have to wait until next week's vacation to continue, which is too much of a delay. Meanwhile, Peng felt something strange. He turned to look, and there was a monster gray sand bobcat. They get scared to see the monster, and Peng tells them it is not suitable for everyone to watch out. However, the beast jumps, running toward them. Dazzy stands in front of him, but Dummy attacks the demon, saying his opponent is him. Then Dummy jumps toward the beast. Seeing this monster run away, Dummy grabs the beast with an invisible thread, binds it with an invisible rope and attacks the monster. Looking at Dummy, Peng thinks Dummy's power today has increased more than tenfold from when he was a Red River ape, and he expected him to be strong, but he didn't expect him to be strong. Then Dummy, after attacking the monster, looks toward his hand. Seeing this, Peng says, hasn't he been familiar with his power? After all, Dummy hasn't been allowed to fight after evolution. It seems he has to let him exercise a little more. 
then Peng tells them to go from there. Dummy, while looking toward Peng, thinks he didn't understand what the boy was saying that day. But he knew that that boy, that's all it is since then. While the conversation between Peng and Dazzy continues, Dazzy says if it weren't for him throwing him, he would have been the one to protect him first. Peng replies that Dummy threw him away in a hurry. Please don't be mad. But Dazzy says Dummy is also great. But he throws him, and Peng agrees with him, and then they all go from there. However, after searching for of three hours, Peng walked through all areas suitable for the growth of hollow bottle trees and finally found them. While on the way, Peng thought, looking toward the tree, the green tree snakes were also present in the hollow bottle tree area last time. Perhaps this snake has a particular preference for hollow bottle trees. Moreover, Dummy sees the green snake hanging with the tree branch. He pulls the snake off the tree, kills it by holding it tightly and cuts the snake's body into two pieces. And from the snake's body, Dummy gets the core, and then he shows the core to Peng. Seeing this, Peng thinks this is the core of the green tree snake. The green tree snake's crystal core is just a side task. The task is to find hollow wood's spatial cores, but Dummy got the core through his reasoning. Then, while pointing toward the tree, Peng tells Dummy to punch these hollow bottle trees. Dummy clenches his fist, hits the tree with all his might, and breaks. Seeing this, Peng Dazzy and Silly get happy and appreciate Dummy. Peng is delighted to see the crystal core in a broken trunk, and he tells Dummy to break more trees like that tree. The gang of three criminals were looking for Peng on the other side of the woods. Two were named Yao Huan and Deng Sen, while the third was their boss. They also had their beast called Tudu with them. Yao asks his boss if that kid is really near there. The boss replies the information given by the group can't be wrong. They will keep looking for him. Suddenly, Tudu heard a sound from behind. He points to that side to tell them that someone is there. Deng asks, looking at Tudu's captain, is Tudu saying something? The boss replies, Tudu says there was a strange noise over there. He is unsure if it was that kid, but they should go over there and look. After this, they go that way. Yao, on the way, asks how come this is a bit like practicing boxing. Deng smiles and points to Yao, asking if practicing boxing is stupid. Who would practice in a forest full of monsters? Their boss adds his point, saying don't take it lightly, they can't ignore any clues. They finally have a high-paying job. Pointing to Deng, the boss asks if he has forgotten his sister is still waiting for the tuition fee to go to school, and they have to finish it this time. Then he orders them to come with him to take a look and figure out what's going on. While hiding behind the tree, the boss looks toward Peng and then Dummy. While looking toward dummy breaking tree, Yao says he is out. This beast can break a thick tree with one punch, he's too strong. Then the boss, while showing Peng's picture to them, says look at this, that kid is their goal. But what is he looking for in the broken trunk? Meanwhile, Yao angrily says captain, those people gave them money to investigate this kid's beast. And they only need to look at it from there, they will be spotted if they get any closer and Deng agrees with him. Then Yao, while looking toward Peng's beast, says these imperial beasts, are not ordinary at all. Also, there is an enormous centipede. It's probably not a good idea to mess with, and they should retreat. But the boss scolds them and orders them to be quiet. And then he says boys, they are always doing something cheap and cleaning up a few corpses. Haven't they had enough with their abilities? They can't go to the depths of the black ember forest full of unknown horror, and now that they have an opportunity before them, they certainly have to take it. While looking toward Peng, the captain says this kid has some problem who would make such a big noise in the forest to measure how thick the tree is, and if there is something valuable in the trunks, they can get it out. There are so many trees they will certainly get an opportunity. Then, the boss orders them to tell Deng to wait for Yao to be in the dark and let his beast directly control that person, and Yao follows him to deal with that giant monster. Now they will take the risk, and maybe they can end their miserable life of suffering. However, Peng asks Dazzy and Dummy what's wrong when they angrily look aside. Then Peng looks toward where they both are looking and asks who's coming out. Their boss tells Dang and Yao that it is not good they were found. Then they come out while the boss waves hands and says hello to Peng. Also, meeting each other is fate. They are there to see if they can do anything to help him while Yao looks toward the boss and thinks. Luckily, the boss responds quickly. Hearing this, Peng, while looking toward their beasts, thinks about which type of help. Also, the spiny bee and skeleton butterfly are the beasts that are good at attacking enemies in the woods, and these two people are definitely up to no good. When Peng felt something suspicious and looked aside, Dang was there. He was hiding behind a tree. Seeing this, Peng said he still got people there, the boss smiled, telling don't worry. He is his brother. They aren't evil while thinking, what the hell is this? How can it be so sensitive? However, while looking toward Dang and his monster mithril praying mantis, Peng learned about them. Deng, looking toward, Peng smiled, saying he had just gone to the toilet and arrived just now. 
Moreover, Peng, the monster, thinks this is Mithril praying mantis. It should be a rare mutation, but Dazzy can overcome it, so it's not something to be afraid of. Then Peng replies he thinks he doesn't need help, especially this kind of help. Dazzy, silly, and dummy stand with him. Hearing this, the boss laughs, saying forget it since the little brother doesn't like their disturbance. Then Yao asks his boss leader if they will leave, and the boss replies that one after another exposure, there's no chance for a sneak attack. Once it fails, there will be another enemy out of nowhere. He is young, but he can raise three loyal beasts simultaneously. He's rich or has strength, either way, he's not an easy target to provoke. While looking at Tudu, he says besides that beast with a black cape, his breath makes Tudu very uncomfortable and Tudu's intuition saves him many times. However, they go from there, telling Yao they should go to this stupid world. Who knows what monster they will meet. They can wait for him to go away, and then they will come back, and they should see if they can find any clues. There are a lot of clues in the forest, and there's no need to fight with him. Yao sign and replies, nodding their head, and then leave, looking back toward Peng. Peng also looks toward Yao, thinking if Dummy hadn't found the people in the shadow, would they have attacked directly? Then, while fixing his glasses, he thinks if they did, he would have killed them. Two hours later, Peng was excited because he had got a 2kg crystal core. Then he called Dazzy to come there, waving his hand, and while Dazzy was holding the insect in his mouth, he was going aside. After this, while holding Dazzy's and Tenny, he says there they go and then collapses Dazzy's head and Tenny. As soon as he collapses, a fire comes out and Peng sets fire to the sprouting wood stick. He throws the post on the broken trees and they grow everywhere. Peng, coming from there, thought forest arson was a crime before the catastrophe. Still, it was removed after the disaster, and all the vitality and resistance of these plants are more substantial than they can be imagined. This kind of ordinary flame can't set off a prairie fire in the forest it is convenient for him to destroy the traces, however, the gang of criminals is standing up the mountain. Yao, pointing down to the woods, surprisingly tells his leader to look there. Then, three of them look down at the burning forest. Yao asks such an intelligent kid if he is afraid they come back and find anything. The leader replies this kid is too vigilant while thinking, and that kid didn't even notice it himself, his share of cruelty hidden in his bones. When Yao asks the leader if he will let go of this thing so quickly, the leader points his hand toward Yao and replies there is no fundamental conflict between them and this boy. If he had held on to some conspicuous treasure, he might have considered risking offending someone and getting rid of all the traces. And to put it bluntly, it's not driven by sufficient interests. They can't afford it even if they want to, but it won't be the same for some people. Meanwhile, he dials Dr. Jiang's number and tells him the task is complete and the target's royal beast screen data has been transmitted. Hearing this, Dr. Jiang thanked him for his hard work, the payment has been passed, and he is happy to cooperate. After this, in Dr. Zhang's office, his assistant tells him this group of people don't seem to dare to do anything. This trial mission failed. Zhang replies, it's alright, they are already prepared for the next step of the plan while thinking Jai Kamlu, his grandson, his only relative, found him. However, at home, Peng, looking towards Stripey, eating a lot of food, gets worried, thinking Stripey's growth rate is so fast. Not only has his level increased by one, but his size also looks larger. But it is overeating at once, then, while picking up Stripey's body skin, Peng thinks this is broken. He thought it would have magical effects like the skins of the ancient beasts from some novel. Then he gets close to Stripey, saying to continue to eat and work harder. It is best to do nothing for a while. Now, listening to this, he gets happy, and then Peng laughs, saying they will eat fried spider after he gains weight. Hearing this, he gets worried. Then Stripey opened the food and came one after the other, but all the clubs were empty. Peng says it is suitable for him to eat less, this kind of canned food will accumulate, like toxins in his body, once he eats it. Thinking he got the particular core, he finally collected everything he needed for evolution. But this time, he couldn't just stew it like a big pot of food because Namely has a fragile physique and can't stand the recoil. These materials need to be specially processed. However, at night, Peng goes to Fei Peng's Imperial Beast Studio with Silly. He scanned his hand to enter the door, and when he entered, a worker told him Zun had already returned home. Peng replies this is okay and that no one will bother him. Then Peng, while picking the lab suit, thought the materials were scarce this time and, according to the recipe, unique treatments such as cold storage temperature burning and strong acid corrosion. Then he prepared the material. After this, he did the material, saying he was sure Silly would love the sweet taste, and then he poured that material into the container. As soon as Silly smelled it, he felt it was his favorite orange juice and got incredibly excited. Peng orders him to go in a container, and he rashly goes in. 
Fang looks towards Silly and thinks he hasn't finished his sentence, and Silly quickly goes in. He is too impatient. Silly was enjoying himself in the container, seeing his body color. Fang got worried, thinking the colors didn't match up. What's this green? If he remembers correctly, the favorite place for Silly to stay is the top of his head. Suddenly, he felt like the evolution route of Silly was wrong because he didn't like fluorescent green. Also, he gets worried thinking the material needed to promote the epic quality is too rare. And what the hell is the space-based material Huan Kongsha? It seems that he can't be evolved at the moment. However, an interface appears before Peng about Silly's evolution. While closing their eyes and clenching their fists, Peng thinks that after Silly's promotion, his soul strength has increased a lot, and if he works hard, he can make a contract with Dummy in a few days. After this, while looking at Silly's green color, he gets angry, and when Silly gets close to Peng to sit on the top of his head, he throws him away, saying, don't come there, but Silly doesn't listen to him and sits on the top of his head. Meanwhile, Peng's phone rang. While looking at his phone, Peng thinks this is the decoration company introduced by Sister Tang the other day. Hasn't the detailed procedures been finalized? What do they want at this late hour? Then he received a phone call from manager Lai, who asked Peng if he had time because there were some difficulties in cleaning up the villa, and he needed to come and see it in person. Peng, on the way to returning home, asks about the difficulties. Manager Lai replies there are some mutant plants. If they don't clean it out, they can't continue to renovate the house. They need him to instruct in person. They need him to teach in person. Peng replies he is on the way. Lai says all the workers are waiting at the scene now. Come as soon as possible. Peng gets surprised and says, wait a moment, manager Lai. As he says, all the workers are on the scene now waiting for him and then asks if he is a big shot that all of them are working overtime for him. Manager Lai replied this is how their business is, Mr. Peng, while the mobile phone was on speaker in Dr. Jiang's hand. Also, his guards grabbed Lai by the back of his arm and shoulders. Dr. Jiang forced Lai to call Peng there that night, and Lai requested Peng to come there, telling them they were waiting, and then he hung up the phone. After this, Jiang tightly held Lai's head says good job, and he will eat a roast chicken tonight. At the same time, Manger Lai was very scared on Peng's side while holding his mobile phone. He thought what manager Lai said was suspicious, but Sister Tang's phone couldn't be reached again, and to be safe, he would take Dazzy and Dummy with him. Then he ran from there to home, saying to let's go. However, half an hour later, manager Lai bound hands, sitting on the ground. Dr. Jiang's companion asks him why he hasn't come yet. He hasn't noticed anything. Jiang replies be patient. It doesn't matter if he comes later. They still have to meet Jai Han Wu's people. And to be honest, he doesn't want to use such rude methods. After all, they are civilized people, and he never thought Jai Hunwu would still have a grandson alive. If someone hadn't told him the news secretly, he would have thought he was already a loner. Hearing this, his assistant says if words get out that Jai Hunwu's grandson is still alive, there will undoubtedly be many who would want to remove this threat secretly. Then Jiang, while looking toward his wine bottle, says, After all, Jai Hunwu has no family and will get old, but his grandson is still young. Many move people's hearts. The Southern Sky Group has grown into a giant with many high-level forces, and everyone has heard this. His assistant asks if he meant to kill Gao Peng. But why don't they just do it directly? Why do they have to try again and again? Jiang, pouring wine down from the glass, says Jai Hunwu spent much effort protecting and hiding his grandson. He must pay a lot of attention to ensuring his safety. Indeed, people are protecting him in secret, and if they move in immediately, an accident is very likely. It would be highly problematic if they alerted Jai Hunwu and then asked who said he was going to kill his grandson. He wants to keep him and negotiate with the people on Jai Hanwu's side. Then Jiang throws a glass on the ground, asking if he thinks they are qualified to fight for the power of the Southern Sky Group. The glass breaks, and Jiang says killing his only grandson will bring them the monstrous wrath of Jai Hunwu. The ultimate winner will only be those genuinely qualified to compete for that position. Then he smiles, telling me that the research institute he works in isn't the top one among the foremost research institutes of the Southern Sky Group. There are at least 30 at the same level. And to mention the fact that there are several major security agencies in addition to research institutions, even if the sole head of the Southern Sky Group dies, that position will not be his. So why should he muddy the water that benefits him? In a sense, Peng is the prince, and he is likely to inherit the throne in the future, even if they are on the opposite side. The definition of friends and enemies in this world has never been so simple. When he gets the benefit of expanding the laboratory tonight, he may not accept his surrender in the future. Then he opens the small golden box, saying the time has almost come. 
Jai Hunwu should be there any moment and orders his men to help him control Manager Lai. Hearing this, Manager Lai started begging for his life, saying he wouldn't hurt him, and then a butterfly came from that box and sat on Jiang's finger. Then he sent that butterfly toward Lai, saying take it easy, he is a serious researcher, not the same as the barbarians. Then that butterfly releases some magic toward Lai and makes him unconscious. Seeing this, Jiang smiles saying take a break he can't participate in the next time. Unfortunately, there is one less person to witness his success tonight. Suddenly, a strong gust of wind appears there. Seeing this, Jiang's assistant sacredly points toward it. Jiang looks there. Dr. Jane gets scared to see this, saying he himself is there. However, in Chang'an military district, at night time, a golden divine hawk sitting on the big tower on her nest suddenly starts making noise. Seeing this, the military guards get there. One of them asks the other what is going on. Is that ape from the Black Ember Forest out? The other one replies telling no, the Golden Divine Hawk is warning about the South. Check it out. Meanwhile, the chief of the military came there, saying there was no need to check. It's that person from the Southern Sky Group who came to Chang'an, and there was no need to worry just stood on guard as usual. And then the guard went from there, and the chief stood there think the storm is coming. However, on the other side, Jai Hunwu stood with his beast while Dr. Jiang and his men were begging for their lives in front of him. Jai Hunwu killed two of them while Jiang was begging, saying Master Chairman, wait. When Gao Peng's child hears this, Hunwu angrily says he would better think clearly before he speaks. Jiang says he just said it to save his life, and he hopes he will give him a chance to speak. Hearing this, Hunwu asks about Peng, who tells him that Jiang tells him to worry. He didn't tell anyone about Peng, but he has set up a program. Then, he shows Peng's picture on his mobile phone. He says as long as he doesn't decode the program, on time the program will send news about Gao Peng to T. He mobile devices of every employee in the Southern Sky Group. Hearing this, Hun Wu angrily looks toward Jiang and says forget it if he doesn't want to tell. Everyone has their own will, he won't force it. Saying this, he is about to go from there, but Jiang stops him, saying don't go. He will say it's Secretary Liu. Hearing this, Hun Wu stopped keeping their hand on his beast while Jiang smiled and added by saying to Mr. Chairman he only wanted more funds. He didn't want to hurt Peng. As long as there are enough funds, he will definitely bring more benefits to the Southern Sky Group. While Hun Wu leaves there seeing that he actually worked hard, he will give him a good time while Jiang is shouting and calling him in fear that he knows it is wrong. But he leaves by killing Jiang. After this, Jai Hunwu talked to someone via phone watch, saying that he would never be threatened in any way whatsoever. Then Hanma orders the man to investigate Jiang Yilong. He probably set up a program. If he can find the program, he destroyed if he call let him know also Gao Peng is the hirer to the Southern Sky Group this is an unchangeable truth in the worst case scenario he will simply need to announce it to the public earlier. However, the man replies that he understands, and then Hunwu asks him if he needs his help. The man replies no, and Hanwa says he like a superficial world like this. Meanwhile, Tang from behind comes there, calling Hunwu's teacher. He looks back, thanking her for the hard work. Also, he says when he had just returned from overseas, he couldn't fully control the group because the group was in a state of chaos. And then he tells to Tang about Peng saying the depth of his parents overshadow news about him he could only send his people to find any remaining clues so that he could grow up in peace. Although the forces within the group have gradually stabilized, there's no need to rush bringing Peng over. This sort of free roaming grooming method can better train a person willpower, and Peng's talents have exceeded his expectations. Then, while touching his beast, he says he has some business to attend to, so he will leave the cleanup to her. Hearing this, she asks the teacher if he isn't going to visit Peng tonight. He replies that he is just waiting for a more suitable opportunity for Peng. A rock-solid heart and soul are so much more precious than any obtainable object. He just wants to see how much his child can grow. Then he sits on his flying beast and takes off from there. However, Peng Dummy Dazzy and Silly get there. After coming there, Peng thinks, where our manager lie in the workers. Then, looking toward the broken stones all around, he says he can't get in touch with them since it just happened. Then, while looking at the mark on the ground, he believed that no matter how he looked at it, these marks didn't look like traces left behind from renovation they this looked like claw marks. Meanwhile Tang stood aside says seems like she underestimated his growth Peng returned to look back in fear asking whose Tang replies telling it's she Peng Sai and relax himself saying it's just she sister Tang no wonder silly didn't alert him. Hearing this, she surprisingly asks wait a minute, what is that expression he is making? Why does she feel it has a bit of disgust and dismissal in it? Then, pointing to Peng, she tells him that in this kind of situation, he shouldn't let his guard down so quickly. How can he confirm if she is an enemy? 
Peng smiles, telling Sister Tang that if he has to be suspicious of her too, then there wouldn't be anyone he can trust in this world ever since he became an orphan. Then she says he is wrong. He is not an orphan. His grandfather is still alive. Hearing this, he surprisingly asks about his grandfather. Then she tells him that when the cataclysm occurred, he was stuck on a foreign island. Also, the people who were stuck on the island with him included several of his most trusted aides, and the island was already a tropical environment. It was surrounded by the ocean, so one could imagine the difficulties at such a start. If one were to say that an island city was of an average problem, then the island would be the start of a hell of a difficult stage. After all, islands don't have armies, however, the heavens never forsook him. His grandfather was lucky later and seized the opportunity. He relied on his extraordinary will to survive on the island while continuously training familiars. Hearing this, Peng is surprised, thinking it unique. Then she tells his grandfather that he cares about him dearly, so he entrusts her to look after and protect him. As to why he never came to see him, he has his reasons. Peng smiles and replies he knows it's the whole before the heavens entrust a man with great responsibility. He shall be tested kind of thing. That's his grandfather. He knows his personality, and he must have felt it wasn't safe and thought that it would be easier to protect him by keeping him hidden. Also, he wants to test him, hoping that he will grow on his own as quickly as possible. Sister Tang is his family. She doesn't have to worry that he will misunderstand him and complain about why he hasn't come to meet him sooner. Hearing this, she looks at him lovingly, and he excited, Lai starts asking one question after the other, what is grandfather's familiar? What grade is it? Is it incredibly strong? She replies lovingly he will know the answer in the future while Jai Han was standing up on his flying monster was looking down toward Peng, and Tang was smiling thinking he sure understand him then he will be waiting for when the time comes. The next day, when Peng goes to school, he is surprised to see many people gathering there, and the paramedic team telling them to move out of the way he also goes into that gathering to see. As soon as he got there, he was surprised to see the paramedic team taken injured on the stretcher he asked the girl standing there. Things were already so intense, so early in the morning he accidentally lost his footing. She replies telling it wasn't an accident scholar Gao Peng he was beaten up by a monster trainer cadet. However, Peng listened to the students standing behind them who were talking to each other. One of them said he heard that these two students had always had problems with one another, and one of them became a monster trainer cadet. This morning, the two of them had a verbal spat in front of the school gate. The monster trainer cadet used his firearm to attack the other student, and the student was almost killed. When one of them says to the other, becoming a monster trainer cadet he knows his disapproval, while the other one, while looking toward Peng, angrily replies saying stop it, otherwise, he will get hit. Then the girl there sadly tells the students who used his familiar to commit the crime used to be bullied in his class because of his weak personality. As for the student who was sent to the hospital, he was one of the students that drove him the most. The boy stood aside, and that girl agreed with her, saying that he forced people with his strength back then. Now that others have obtained greater power than him, who's to say they can't force him around? Then, the students stood there and started fighting each other. One of them said he couldn't say it like that, no matter the reason. Using violence is wrong. The other one angrily replies does he know what world they live in right now? Using violence isn't bad. Why doesn't he go reason with the monster outside the city? As they were arguing among themselves while Peng goes from there with Dazzy Silly and Stripey thinking he wonder what is the school's and the military's stance on this will they remove the training grounds from the school. Moreover, in the principal's office, he was shouting at the instructor colonel, asking why did school prohibit students from carrying sharp tools like knives because their age and mentality make them impulsive. These familiars are way more dangerous than knives. Continuing training inside the school is unreasonable in terms of safety. It is unfair to the students who don't have families. The colonel replies, saying the principal to calm down and they didn't wish for something like this to happen. However, the principal replies asking for forgiveness as he lost his cool just now, and this doesn't concern the others. He is just worried about the safety of the students. Then the colonel stands up, holding their chair arm, saying it's alright, he understands, and he will seriously consider his suggestion. He will also relay it to the higher-ups, but he can't guarantee him what the result will be. Then, while opening the door to leave, Colonel tells them that because right now, nowhere is really safe anymore, what they can do is to try to stop things like this from happening with the power of the law. Hearing this, the principal sighs and relaxed. However, in Chang'an military region, the Colonel goes to the chief instructor and tells him the whole situation. And in reply, the chief says that, indeed, school should be a place for studying. But that was in the past. 
he should know that just in the last month, CH Nagan City reported over 300 cases of familiars injuring humans. Moreover, because the familiars were abnormally lethal, most of these incidents were malicious in nature, and this isn't simply a criminal incident in Chang'an City. They have to look at the whole country and the entire world. In Huxia, they have the lowest crime rate. Countries in the West have it worse, their police force is completely overwhelmed, and they need to depend on influential civilians to help them keep their peace and maintain stability. Colonel sadly replies that he understands. Then Instructor Chief keeps his hand on the Colonel's SH, order, saying he understands how he feels but just be relaxed the world allied government won't sit around and wait for the situation to worsen. They'll move soon. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures, but their task is still very heavy. Moreover, on the ground, after the training, Instructor Zhang appreciated students saying they all had improved and that they hadn't even killed many monsters yet, and they had already started to bully other students. And starting from tomorrow all their familiar will be prohibited from entering school they will construct a large gate on the side of the training group specifically for them. Meanwhile, Silly is sitting on Peng's head. Peng takes him off his head, but he doesn't come off, saying no, go warm when Silly doesn't come off. Peng pulls it off his head, saying he hears that jellyfish wolfberry soup tastes good. Listening this Silly gets scared, he quickly takes out fruit juice from his space and gives it to Peng. He says drink fruits juice, don't drink jellyfish soup and all the students start looking toward them smilingly. However, Instructor Zhang coughed so that all the students became attentive. Then he tells them all to be prudent, and then he tells them it will be time for the entrance examination for college in two months time. Waiting for no man. The results of these last two months of training will significantly affect and even determine their final results. After this, he says he doesn't think that a good result is useless. All the big groups, the military, and the government will throw a baton at all the monster trainer cadets with excellent grades. And those individuals who possess unique talents will receive focused training no matter the treatment and prospects it will be far beyond those of average students. Also, take a look there. While pointing toward the extensive interface, he tells the first set of the entrance examination for college questions for monster trainer cadets are out. They were sent to various base cities in multiple countries across the world. According to the document disseminated to them, the exam will be divided into three rounds. The first round will be a unified examination across the country, and they will lead their familiar to challenge monsters. Firstly, they all can select the tier and grades of the monster, but the monster type will be randomized. At the same time, they can't choose a monster with specific attributes and advantages in the battle. If the beast has a feature that is an advantage over their familiar monster's point, they will have one course. If the standard is successful in defeating a monster with an advantageous feature, then they will get a 10% bonus. The base points given for normal tier monsters are 10 points. Elite tier monsters give 50 points, and commander tier monsters give 500 points. Based on this, excellent grade monsters with the same level will provide bonus points of 50% and perfect grade monsters with the same group will offer bonus points of 100%. Secondly, the number of monsters they challenge can be, at most, the number of demons they possess. If they only have three families, then at most, they will be able to battle three demons. This is to prevent examinees with high-level familiars from selecting many low-level monsters to grind their points, and the first round of the exam is essentially the finish line for most of them. Only a few excellent students will meet the requirement to take the second round of the exam, and the second round will be a real combat survival mission in the wilderness. Moreover, the proceedings will be broadcast live nationally, and the specific rules will be announced after the first round of the exam. However, as long as they can meet the requirements for the second round of examination, they can essentially get admitted to a prestigious university. As for the third round of the exam, they will wait until they have earned the right to participate in the second round before they let them know, and he hopes all the examiners will save their time. And he believes they have all experienced the three years of calamity equally. It was challenging to achieve this piece, and he hopes they all treasure it and the instructors will provide them with extra training in the remaining time. Hearing Zhang's speech, Peng thinks he can participate in this year's exam with his skill set. Even though he is just a sophomore, he must promote Stripey to a perfect grade as fast as possible. After this, Jang asks, standing before the cage after begging over and over, they have finally given special approval for this mutant dead leaf locust, then asks them all who wants to go first. Seeing the dead leaf locust in the cage, Peng thinks Stripey has grown to level 10 during this period. In terms of story and grade, there is little between it and that dead leaf locust. It's the perfect opponent for training. Moreover, the locust is originally the prey of spiders, so Stripey has the upper hand. 
looking towards Stripey. He thinks, why is Stripey so timid? Also, it was ruthless when it attacked him last time. Is it possible that it was a stress response after being frightened? He should train it well. However, Peng raises their hand, saying he would go first again. This time, Jiang asks why there is another one. And then he comes to Peng, saying under normal circumstances, monster trainers put everything into training their first familiar. They only begin teaching a second one after the first reaches the commander tier. That's only because the commander tier type can preserve one's life genuinely and he is one of their outstanding students. Training multiple familiars simultaneously will waste a lot of their time and effort, especially during a crucial period like before the entrance exam. His best option is to advance one of his familiars to the commander tier so that he can obtain points from commander tier monsters. Peng replies with a smile, thanking him for his advice. Also, he has already planned the training thoroughly so that it won't be a problem. While saying this, Peng thinks although the instructor is saying this for his good, he can't tell him that he can quickly promote a familiar's grade with the help of the system. And then he encourages Stripey, saying come to think of it, Stripey has grown fatter. He can do it while Stripey is scared and doesn't want to fight with the dead leaf locusts. Seeing this, Peng's mates ask Peng why nothing is happening and whether they will fight or not. The other one asks if they should let Teddy go first. Instead of hearing this, Peng thinks one is suspicious while the other is cowardly. These two sure are a good match. Peng stood there thinking he finally understood what the instructor meant about their different personalities in the first battle. Dazzy and Stripey are entirely different. Dazzy is aggressive, and it took the initiative to attack its prey. Stripey, on the other hand, chooses to defend itself and run away. If the fooler weren't cement, it might have dug a hole in the ground to hide. Then he sighed, thinking Stripey, he needs to experience this. If he wanted to grow, he needed to experience combat. After this, the dead leaf locust moves towards Stripey, hits him, and then flies. Seeing this, Peng wrongly thinks this is not good. The dead leaf locust wants to fight in the air, and this situation gives it an upper hand. Only this kind of mutant creature possessed the strength to lift Stripey into the air, and he didn't expect it. As soon as the dead leaf locust attacks the Stripey, he jumps up in the air, and throws a web at the locust. Seeing this, Peng gets happy, thinking this is beautiful using spider silk to mess up the enemy's attack rhythm. Good job. Stripey attacked the dead leaf locust and binds him with his spider silk. Seeing this, a girl comes to Peng, saying Scholar Gao Peng, his little spider is pretty strong. It diffuses the attack of a particular mutant. Hearing this, Peng thought no, that was the best opportunity for Stripey to attack. But since it was busy defending after touching the ground, it missed the chance. Although the dead leaf locust is a mutant, its attacks didn't harm Stripey which means Stripey is far more potent than it. As soon as the slow leaf locust attacks Stripey, Peng come to Stripey, telling him to attack the locust back. But he replies he can't because he is scared. Peng encourages him to be afraid. He is more potent than it, so he climbs up the cage and attacks it. But Stripey replies that no, he can't climb the cage. It's too hard. Hearing this, Peng clench his fist in anger, telling Stripey he is a spider. He has the gall to say to him that crawling up an iron cage is too tricky. He is undoubtedly the lamest familiar that he has trained. Then Peng opens his fist and thinks never mind, it's because he was too greedy. Training a friendly has never been easy. And then he goes near cage looking toward, Stripey, thinking he's just a defense type familiar that doesn't rely on attacks. Since it's unwilling to attack, it's okay to train its defense. Then he signs and angrily says to Stripey if he doesn't want to shoot, then just come back. Hearing this, Stripey gets worried, thinking of his previous master, Granny Chen, lying in the grave, telling him that his new master isn't happy and he will be left behind again. Then again, she repeats the phrase, Stripey doesn't want to be thrown away again, scared. Hearing this, he gets angry and passionate, thinking that he doesn't want to be thrown away. And then he attacks the dead leaf locust, which makes him badly injured. Seeing this student there happily starts telling Peng he has had an ace up his sleeves all this time. The girl stands aside excitedly and says it severely injured the mutant with just one counterattack. She didn't expect Scholar Peng's familiar attack to be so clever. Hearing this, Peng thinks Stripey's condition isn't suitable. An interface appears before him, warning that Stripey's status is aggressive and out of control, and the desire to fight has increased drastically. Staying in this state for a long time will cause irreversible damage to the familiar. However, after reading the interface, Peng thinks irreversible damage as the fight continues between them. Then he goes to Stripey and relaxes him, holding his legs and telling him that's enough. And he did great also. 
He apologized for what he said just now, and that he was terrific. Stripey turn. Looking back to Peng and replies throw away master angry fight looking towards Stripey. Peng read his mind that he is aggressive and out of control. Moreover, Peng smiles and relaxes him, telling him he will never leave him behind. He is his familiar, and he is his monster trainer, and they are partner, so why in the world would a person leave his partner behind? Come back, it's enough this time. Hearing Peng's word, Stripey asks, really? Meanwhile, his mental status gets normal, Peng replies really believe him. He won't ever throw him away. Instructor Zhang, who was watching all this, stood aside and remembered the time when Peng wordily told him to open the cage and let him in because his familiar condition wasn't suitable, and he needed to go save it. Then, he thought intervening in a fight between familiars was a very dangerous thing to do. But scholar Gao Peng didn't even hesitate. Perhaps the reason he managed to achieve such excellent grades is because he's fearless. Zhang signed, thinking it would be great if someone with this kind of talent became one of them. However, at Peng's home, after one week of training, Stripey has finally lost weight. Peng looks towards Stripey and thinks he no longer fears combat, but in his spare time, he still consults Instructor Zhang, and they formulate a fighting style where the main goal is to complete the enemy's stamina in order to avoid engaging in head-on battles. Then, while giving more practice to Stripey at home, Peng thinks a lot. Ever since Stripey lost control last time, the aid the system provides him with is immense. But if he relies on the system too much and expects that everything will go smoothly, he will eventually end up at a significant disadvantage. Also, no matter the fighting tactics and his control over the information, he is still too inexperienced. He needs to take this slow and not expect immediate success. Then, while putting the exoskeleton in the trash bin, Peng thought throwing it away each time felt like a waste. He heard that spider exoskeletons can be used as medicine. He should try dipping it with egg flour and sugar and frying it. Then he smiles, thinking he is one of the Celestial Empire's people. After all, there's nothing he can't eat if it has poison, there's still Dazzy. However, Peng cooks it, and then while eating, he says to himself this is so delicious. Adding cumin powder would make it perfect then he calls Stripey Dazzy and Dummy, telling them to come and have a taste. After this, they all eat it in compliments. They feel it's delicious, while Stripey eating it, says it feels like this thing Master Mate has a familiar taste. Then Peng, while hanging apron with stand, thinks since Stripey's level has increased, his soul strength should have increased too, and now he should try a singing contract with Dummy again. Then, while making the contract, Peng asks Dummy if he is willing to become familiar, and he replies he does. After making that contract, Peng says to Dummy it's a success and his soul strength has indeed increased. Then he politely tells him to guide him for the rest of his life. However, the next day, Peng departs for the second wilderness training while sitting on the bus. He thinks it's finally time for exercise, as last time, they encountered a scary anaconda by just casually walking around the jungle. So they had to remain vigilant for the rest of the days. But this time, he brought Dummy and Dazzy so they could finally explore the place properly. Meanwhile, three boys sitting on the seat ahead of Peng are talking to each other. One of them says he is telling them they better not let him catch that boy. The other one add by saying if they find him, they will definitely kill him. He's an animal, no, even animals aren't that perverse. The third one angrily says while abusing them inside that house just because of a few words. Luckily, someone unlocked the door, and else they might have starved to death inside. Then one of them replies, but they don't know who it was they didn't see his face last time. And he is telling them that loser better not let him fight out who he is and he has a hundred methods to make sure he won't be able to stay at their school. However, Peng listens to them and gets to know them. While taking off his eye mask, he thinks no wonder why he thought those people sounded familiar, so it's those guys fate sure is a funny thing. Then they reach their destination and take off the bus. As soon as Dummy and Dazzy come, their other beast gets scared to see Dummy's size. Peng looks toward Dummy and thinks that Dummy's level isn't high. The aura of an epic grade is enough to suppress the other familiars. Then Peng says to Dummy, stopping his aura a bit and let's go as he is coming near him while seeing them. Students stand there and get scared, then look toward Peng and ask each other it's just a familiar what's he being so cocky. However, they get inside the valley where Peng sits at one side of Dummy's shoulder, and Dazzy on the other side of his shoulder. Peng says to Dummy he didn't team up with Muting this time, but it's easier to get things done if he is alone. The more the people, the more complicated things will become. Dummy replies master, he protected him. Hearing this, Peng asks with a smile where did he learn these words. Then he replies, telling armor, baby hear this, Peng thinks, surprisingly, he realized it from a children's show. Suddenly, on the way, Peng feels someone has rushed before them. Then, while looking toward the pond, Tress tells Dummy the direction it disappeared. 
he thinks it's the pond where they encountered the green skin frogs last time, and now they will change the order. He doesn't want to be spit saliva by those green skin frogs again, and then he says to Dummy while pointing to another way go that way. Moreover, they change the direction, but as soon as they move ahead, they get scared to see the giant jungle anaconda Peng thinks encountering this monster two times in a row, it looked like this area is the giant jungle anaconda's territory. However, Peng comes down from Dummy's shoulder, standing aside from the tree, he sees the green-skinned frogs get scared to see an anaconda near them, and then they start spitting on the anaconda, but the anaconda enters the pond. Seeing this, Peng thought it completely ignored the skin frog attacks. Though this giant jungle anaconda is only 20 levels, its overall strength is no less than commander tier monsters that exceeded that level, and it turned this whole pond upside down all by itself. Then, while looking toward the tadpole as they were also fleeing in the pond, Peng thought, what a spectacular sight. Then, looking toward the anaconda, he thought, no wonder these green-skinned frogs managed to survive in the pond but never destroyed the balance of the ecosystem. It's because of the periodical visits to this giant jungle anaconda. After this, the anaconda gets out of the pond. Peng was still observing it, thinking is full of life isn't accessible for everyone. There is only a slight difference between the level of the giant jungle anaconda and Dazzy. Not to mention Dummy has a higher grade than it but it's still best to avoid direct conflict with such a monster. Then Peng looked to Dummy and say him something then as soon as the anaconda get out of the pond the green frogs and toddler jump into the pond. Some of them jump and get into the pond, but to some of them, dummy capture, and then they roast and cook it on flame. After eating the roasted green-skinned frogs, Peng says to dummy and Dazzy the elastic muscle, this sweet gravy, as well as this lemongrass arm. No wonder the giant anaconda made periodical visits these green-skinned frogs really tempted it with their delicious meat. As Dazzy was sitting back to them angrily, Peng asked him what was wrong. Meanwhile, a light black horse came there. Seeing the horse run, Peng thought of the high lethality of a pitch black body. It looked just like a shadow, and he wanted to collect it. Then he gets excited and imagines himself sitting on that horse and enjoying in mountain, and then shakes his head, realizing that no he already has a familiar, and he couldn't take the responsibility of being more knowledgeable. Then he goes back. He leaves the leg of green-skinned frog to ripen there. But when he comes back, the frog leg is not there. Seeing this, he angrily asks which idiot stole his green-skinned frog leg. Then he looks toward Dummy and Dazzy to see who has eaten his food smiles, looking toward Dummy, saying he found it, then angrily asks why he stole his green-skinned frog leg. Dummy replies he is afraid that Amster how could he suspect a skeleton to stealing and eat meat while Dazzy pointing toward Dummy angrily says it's him. Hearing this, Dummy, in anger, holds up Dazzy from the bottom, and the roasted leg of green-skinned frog came out of his mouth. Seeing this, Peng smiled, thinking as expected, only Dummy can put Dazzy in its place. Suddenly, Dummy holds Peng tightly and lifts it up. Peng angrily asks what's wrong, but when he looks aside, he gets scared to see Anaconda coming near him. Seeing Anaconda near him Peng think if Dummy hadn't reacted in time Dazzy, and he might have perished at the mouth of the snake and this is the second time he visited him even though he haven't looked for any trouble with him. Then he asks Dummy if he can kill the Anaconda. Dummy replies kill and node yes he jumps, holding the tree's branch, and attacks the Anaconda from up and punches him so hard and makes the Anaconda starts bleeding. However, the fight begins between the two, and Dummy beats him so badly while an interface appears before Peng about Dummy that he is lightly injured. Peng and Dazzy were watching their fight behind the tree when an interface appeared there. Dummy was moderately wounded. Peng standing there thinking Dummy's combat ability had once again amazed him. Then the anaconda, while bleeding, made a plan to attack Dummy. However, an interface appears before Peng that the monster giant jungle anaconda status is berserk. Seeing this, Peng gets scared and loudly tells Dummy to be careful of its trump card. Dummy looks behind, and then a strong gust of wind full of cards blows and throws Dummy away. Then the injured snake hiss loudly while Dummy sit aside. Peng tells him he can still stand. Then Dummy touches Peng's heart, then takes out his blood thread heart and puts that heart in the snake heart place. Seeing this, Peng thinks that an overwhelming pressure blood thread heart is a supernatural gift that was awakened after Dummy's advance to epic grade, so this is how it's used to control the enemy's heart from a distance. However, the giant anaconda starts rushing. Peng gets worried seeing him rushing in for the attack and is also agitated. Suddenly, the blood heart explodes, and the snake gets Dummy's skin color, his mouth starts bleeding, and all his teeth fall out, and then the snake dies. Seeing this, Dummy clenches fist angrily and hits the snake to show he won. While in the control room, Instructor Zhang is amazed to see this on screen and tells the soldier that killing a gigantified variant of the jungle anaconda is fantastic. 
This familiar must have the combat ability of a commander tier monster if it has yet to send information about this youngster to him. After this, he searched for information about Peng and was amazed to see that he turned to tell Zhang this youngster's information. A bit special. Hearing this, Zhang also read the statement. Based on the definition before the cataclysm, the training base branch's class C clearance level is easy. A first class mayor has access to class C clearance, and senior provincial officials have access to class B just who is this boy. However, since his information is encrypted, it will be challenging to recruit him then. Zhang goes from there, ordering the soldier to take good care of Peng and try not to let any accidents happen. He salutes Zhang, nodding yes. However, on Peng's side, he tells Dazi to cut the anaconda's body and open it, and then Dazi slashes it with his claws. Seeing this, Peng looks toward the anaconda and thinks what with this sound. It doesn't sound like they are cutting through thick skin. Instead, it sounds like silk paper tearing. He is surprised to see a thick vine in the anaconda's body and thinks this explains why such a fat anaconda could move on top of trees as if it was floating and didn't create giant holes even when it fell from higher ground. After this, Peng appreciates Dazzy. Also, Dazzy gives Peng the crystal core he got from the snake's body. Peng seeing this, Peng smiles and then, while looking toward Dummy, who is upset, sitting leaning against the tree, thinks earlier Dummy's incredible strength was due to the activation of the blood thread heart. Even though the heart's destroyed, it will indeed regenerate with the passive effect gone, and Dummy looks much weaker now. Then, he tells Dummy that the Blood Thread Heart increases the host's strength and has many benefits. How this talent can be utilized depends on how Dummy trains itself after the heart regenerates. Suddenly, they hear a loud sound. Dazzy starts saying it's the big one from the last time. Peng asks for the big one, then runs away, saying Mu Ting and Lotus Seed are coming with him. On the other side, Mu's friend Wen fell very badly and injured her ankle while Mu told Wen to be careful of her surroundings and then suddenly the monster came there. Seeing it there, Mu says this is bad, then she says the Lotus Seed to block its attack and save them. Lotus Seed tries hard, but the monster is very strong. Then Mu tells her friend to run away, holding Wen in their arms. As they were running away from there, Lotus Seed fought with the monster, and another beast appeared there. Seeing this, Mu looked toward her friends and thought they couldn't fight against the demons and that they were doomed. Meanwhile, Dummy and Dazzy come there and attack the beast. Dummy beats that monster, and Dazzy attacks it with his power electricity. Peng tells them to help Lotus Seed to get rid of the beast. Seeing him there, Mu gets happy. Peng asks her if it is okay. She replies with a smile. She is okay. If he hadn't come in time, she would be lying on the ground right now, and then she thanked him. Peng smiles, saying there's no need to thank him. They are friends, and they should help each other. However, an announcement is made that attention to all the examinees participating in the training Wild Valley simulation training is now over. Hearing the information, Mu asks if something happened while moving from there. Peng says it's already weird for this type of earthworm to appear, and maybe it's because the monsters nearby are acting up again. But isn't this already normal for them? But now they should go back and group up hearing this Mu smile nodding head while her friends were really impressed by Peng. After this, in the evening, Peng thought, according to the instructor, a new type of solid monster had appeared in the Dali Desert. That's why these Sahachuaman man-eating earthworms were forced over there. However, he just communicated with Director Feng and said that the government has already devised a solution. Then he signed, thinking there was no peace around there, someone else was carrying his weight. Meanwhile, the group of his fellows whom Peng had locked up in previous training time already stood there. One of them, Peng, threw a stone up in his hand, and his two friends stood beside him. He tells Peng he has finally found him as he locked them up in that safe house last time, so they are there to talk. Peng replies just as he expected. They're already 18 years old and don't get angry so quickly. Going around and looking for a fight is terrible. Also, they brought four monsters, which hadn't even reached the elite tier, to block his path while thinking he suspected Dazzy could settle this on his own. But Dazzy looked toward Peng angrily. Then he lovingly pets Dazzy, telling don't be angry, he is not looking down on him at all. Then one of them replies, saying they know how to control themselves and they will only break a few bones. Saying this, he orders his black raging Kong to attack them. Seeing his beast holding equipment for a fight, Peng thinks he bought a kit for his familiar. For most familiars, their body parts are already their most lethal weapons as they are equal to steel, and he is worried about his IQ. Then he signs. Meanwhile, the beast moves toward Peng to attack while Peng says to Dummy teach this little monkey a lesson and Dummy grabs that black raging Kong by the throat and lifts it. However, they get scared to see this while Peng gets that beast injured and holds that beast's head. 
Seeing this, one of them wonders why it feels like it's bullying a little kid. Meanwhile, a black raging Kong hides behind his master while crying. Seeing this, he also gets scared, saying a seven-foot gorilla like him is hiding behind him like a bullied daughter-in-law isn't he embarrassed. Then, while looking toward Peng and Dummy, he thinks he didn't expect Peng's familiar to be this strong. He thought he only won the instructor's favor because he knew how to flatter people, but for now, he should back off and find another chance to get back at him. Then he says sorry to Dummy. Also, this is just a misunderstanding. But Dummy leaves there without listening to him and gets embarrassed, thinking he didn't even take him seriously. The boy smiles and says boss, forget about it. He replies that they should leave and have fun at the bar tonight and relax, saying they go ahead. He has something important to attend tonight, and then his companion leaves from there also. After this, he removes a napkin from his pocket and wipes off black raging Kong tears, saying jealousy and wrath are useless. These emotions will only waste his time and widen the gap between him and his enemy. They should go home and start training tonight. They will work hard and become stronger together, and only then will they be able to go up against Gao Peng. After this, in Gao Peng's studio, he was working there thinking of neutralizing the reagents. All the data seemed fine. It should be a success this time. Meanwhile, Stripey comes there. Seeing him there, Peng says wake up, petting his head lovingly. Now they will go and make him stronger. Then he tells him to jump in the container. Then, Stripey throws the web toward the roof, and with the help of that web, he jumps into the container. Peng stood outside the container and said to Stripey, it's done now. He needed to wait. The system only provided the instructions to collect the material and perform the operation himself. Luckily, he needed to boil it all in a big pot this time. Once the grade increased, the familiar need to help refine the materials, fire control, electric control, ice control, and the temperature and duration need to be downright accurate. It's going to be a tough challenge. However, some thieves come to Peng's studio in the darkness of night. One asks the other if he is sure this is empty. Further, one replies that he has been observing this place for a few days. By this time, everyone would have gone home. Hearing this, the thief moves toward the studio's door. While touching the door, one tells the other this is military-grade bulletproof glass. He needs help understanding what's there to steal in a studio, and if he asked him, it would have been better if they went to a bank. Hearing this, the other one asks a bank, now that everyone uses credits for transfers, what's the use of money from the bank? Typically, studios have some experimental materials that can easily fetch hundreds of thousands and even millions of dollars. After this, one of them uses the alcohol gel to open the door, telling the other they don't need to worry about leaving fingerprints. He is up, one replies while holding a flying glass, pointing to the other. His can regenerate infinitely, but his can't. Then he attaches that flying glass to the door. Another one says he can buy any powerful monsters he wants if he has the money. He attacks the door angrily and replies stop yapping. He is almost done. Then he tells his companion to stand back and be careful of the flying glass after the explosion. Then he presses the button. Red smoke spreads inside and explodes, and the glass door breaks. Peng inside the laboratory hears this sound and thinks what's that noise. Then he quickly checked on the computer system and the surveillance camera, considering it came from the main door and was surprised to see the security camera set up at the staircase seemed okay. But he can't see anything and thinks something probably covers the lens. People with ill intentions are on the other side of the door. He doesn't know if they're there to kill or steal things. After this, he quickly calls the police station, telling him he wants to make a report someone wants to do something evil to him. On the other side, the thieves were quickly searching for something on the system. Meanwhile, one noticed a light coming out of the laboratory door. Then he says to his companion to look over. Some equipment is still in operation. Then he moves the torchlight toward the laboratory door, telling his companion it's a laboratory and there should be valuable materials inside. They should go in and check. Then, they open the door to enter and are surprised to see the container. Meanwhile, some insects start to stick to one of them while pulling that insect back. He tells his companion that whatever it is, it's precious, they smash it first. However, a tiny centipede stuck to his arm and started shouting, pulling it away. And then he was about to break the container with a hammer. Hey, hiding behind the curtain and looking toward them, thinks this is not good. If they destroy the experimental cylinder, Stripey's evolution will likely fail and he needs to stall them. However, Peng comes there, saying hello to them. They turn to look back, asking who Peng replies they must be tired after such thorough searching and want to take a seat and have some tea. Hearing this, they both look at each other and then one of them attacks Peng with a hammer, saying that if he drinks tea, he will treat him to the taste of his hammer. Peng falls unconscious on the floor, and his head starts bleeding. One of them asks the other if he is dead, and the other one replies if he's not, he will be soon. 
Then, while looking toward the container, he says mess with him, and this is the consequence. Meanwhile, Stripey's dark evolution is booming, and the shy demon appears as a spider. Moreover, both thieves start searching for the material in the laboratory. One asks the other if he heard any strange noises, and the further replies, stop scaring himself and hurry up, and when he looks back, he screams in fear. This was Stripey who came out of the container and attacked them, however, police also arrived there. Police officers get there, telling the headquarters that they have arrived at the destination and the main door has been destroyed. Then they feel the smell of blood as they move to look, saying the caller might be in danger. As they search there and get into the laboratory, they are surprised to see the thief as Stripey has cut them into pieces by beating them, and blood spread everywhere on the floor. Seeing this, one of the police officers says it is way too brutal. The other one said hurry and report this to the chief. Call forensics. This is homicide. Peng asks them in an injured state if they are the police. They point their gun and torchlight toward him angrily and say put his hand in the air and don't move. Put his hands over his head and get down. Peng tells them he is the one who is called, and he is Gao Peng, the victim. They can check his information while Stripey sits with him, and he raises one of his hands and the other hand on Stripey's head. After this, they took him to the police station and started investigating him. The police officers shouted at him, asking why he killed them. Peng replied it was self-defense while he had a bandage on his head. Police officers angrily shout at him, asking for self-defense, continuing to attack them. After they've considered self-defense, Peng replies they were the ones who shot him first. Haven't they seen the wounds on his head? The police officer angrily says don't change the topic and answer his question honestly. Meanwhile, the door knocks and the chief comes there saying it's alright. The result of the investigation is out and the two of them broke in, entered, and attempted murder. Gao Peng only acted out of self-defense and he was free to go. Tang is stood aside by the chief and then gets bail from the police station. After coming out of the investigation room, Peng asks Sister Tang if she is there, does that mean Grandfather also knows what happened? She replies by telling her teacher that he was outraged and worried when he heard that he was sent to the police station, and then she asks him about his injury and if he wants to go to the hospital. Peng replies most of his injuries were absorbed by Stripey, and he only has some flesh wounds. Then, pointing to his head, he says that he did it himself in that kind of situation. If he didn't have this injury, he would have been instantly charged with murder. After this, she comes close to him, puts a hand on his shoulder, and says he did well. Peng is kind of the enemy and is cruel to himself, and now goes home and rests well. He will take care of the rest. However, Peng goes home as he is sleeping and then he has a dream that the intruder while holding a knife comes to Peng to attack him. As soon as he strikes Peng, Peng jumps from the bed, and the blade is stuck in the bed. Peng, sitting aside, asks who he is, then, while looking toward him, he says he thinks he is dead. The intruder replies he has crawled out of hell to take revenge on him. After this, while attacking him with a knife, Peng could hardly save himself from the attack. The intruder asks don't think he doesn't know when that spider was killing them. He wasn't unconscious at all, so why didn't he stop it? Also, he could have let it trap them with its spider web and then handed them over to the police. They wouldn't have died that way. Peng replies, saying that they wanted to kill him. They need to learn how to be ruthless if they want to survive in this world. Meanwhile, the other intruder's companion came from behind and put a hand on Peng's shoulder, and when Peng looked back, he got scared. The intruder was headless and attacked Peng with a hammer, saying to explain it to the king of hell. As soon as the hammer gets close to his eye, Peng wakes up sacredly, thinking he didn't know he would have a dream like this. Is he scared that they will come to take his life? And is it just guilt? It seems like his bond isn't as strong as he thought it was. Meanwhile, Dummy, Dazzy, Silly, and Stripey come there and hear noise from his room. But Peng was worried, thinking life springs from sorrow and calamity. Death comes from ease and pleasure. For their sake, he must conquer himself. The next day in school, the instructor colonel tells the students that yesterday, the New World Allied Government united the world's top 12 monster trainer organizations and monster trainer leagues and applied strict control measures to all monster trainers. The Monster Hunting Association and the Monster Breeder Association have also announced their involvement in the Monster Trainer League. Thus, becoming the Monster Hunter Department and the Monster Breeder Division, they have also officially introduced the classification criteria of the familiar thus dividing familiars into four categories, the Ordinary Tier, Elite Tier, Commander Tier, and Lord Tier. Everyone can apply for a certificate based on the new classification. When entering the competition mission, priority will be given to those who possess credentials. Also, this year's first Monster Trainer College entrance examination is to be held in tandem with the Monster Trainer League and the New World Allied Government. 
As the exam comes closer, the difficulty of the training will be increased. Today's monster is an elite tier skull winged blue bat. Encouragement. If they beat the skull winged blue bat, it will be there. However, an interface appears before Peng with all the information about the monster, and then a student there raises his hand, saying the instructor gives him permission to go to him first with his beast electric luster bear. Then the instructor wishes him good luck, and the student there says to his friend, it is Chen Hankuao. His friend replies that the guy successfully evolved his familiar into an electric luster bear during the wilderness training, and he's strong. Peng stood behind, hearing their conversation. Think excellent grade level 18 compared to the other familiar. This electric luster bear is not bad. After this, the bear entered the cage where the skull-winged blue bat was. The bear roars, but he doesn't take his roaring seriously. Seeing this, the bear is surprised. Seeing this, the bear got angry and started screaming again. And now, this time, the bat also got active and came down. Then the bear attacked him with his claws. But the bat quickly moved up and down all around the bear bit him so hard and injure him. The bear started bleeding, so the boy shouted and called his bear instructor. He immediately called the medic team, and they took the bear out of the cage. The boy starts crying, holding his injured bear. Peng stands behind, thinking the supersonic attack of the skull-winged blue bat is good. There's only a two-level difference between them, yet the electric luster bear was defeated with one blow. Also, the medical team came there. After this, the instructor asks other students if anyone else wants to try. Students get scared, and in order to ignore the instructor, they start talking to one another about different topics like the weather and other things. However, the instructor looked toward the student standing there with his beast, and when the instructor looked toward him, he quickly bent down with his head, saying his stomach hurt. Seeing this instructor say forget it, he can know that they graduated from the drama academy. They are always lively during standard training, so why are they chickening out now? However, Peng raised his hand, telling the instructor he would go next to another student. Seeing him said to one another Peng his ranking has never fallen out of the top 5, and the other one stood aside to wish him good luck. Then Dummy takes out his cloak and quickly enters the cage, attacks the bat, and makes it. Injured seeing this Peng classmate who had come to fight him last night, one of them says, it's so cool, boss. He is grateful he didn't take them seriously. That day, the other one replied yes, and though its attack didn't hit the enemy, it managed to graze the skull-winged blue bat. It's so powerful. Then he looks toward his gorilla and says to Kong they should work hard too, with tears in Kong's eyes, and he refuses to raise his hands in fear. However, the fight continued between dummy and bat. A crowd of students stood there, and one of them complimented, saying, it's a pity if scholar Peng's familiar could fly. The situation wouldn't be this tense anymore. While watching their fight, Peng smiles and thinks tensely. He has already formulated a plan for Dummy right from the start. Although Dummy can't fly, its other stats are all higher than the skull winged blue bats, so as long as Dummy continues to wear it out. The head winged blue bat's attack frequency is decreasing, and Dummy just needs to wait for an opportunity. However, Dummy punches the bat so hard and makes it badly injured. Seeing the student there start clapping, saying what a pity it got beaten up so badly that it got a nosebleed it won't be able to show off anymore. Did it really think no one could defeat it? How arrogant then, Dummy stood there holding the bat in hand, seeing the student get surprised and saying Gao Peng is awesome. However, Peng smiles and asks the instructor colonel to keep his word. He can do as he pleases with the skull wing blue bat. Zhang replies he can do whatever he wants with it. Then Peng raised his hand and asked the students if there was anyone interested in this skull-winged blue bat. It would cost them not 199, not 299, but 500 alliance credits, and if they miss out on this deal today, who knows when they will get another chance to get a top-tier familiar, and don't miss out. Mu comes there smilingly and says she wants to buy it and sell it to him. Peng surprisingly asks if she is sure she likes this bat and says that among the flying type monsters, the skull winged blue bats aren't able to fly high and fast. They can only bully monsters that can't fly. Living this sort of lifestyle will only guarantee their destruction when they meet more enormous monsters. She needs to think carefully, even though her flying ability is an advantage. It's a bit embarrassing. After this, while holding her mobile phone, she replies stop fussing. He may look down on this skull winged blue bat but they value it a lot, and she has transferred the alliance credits to him. Hearing this, Peng quickly checked his mobile and got so excited, saying so straightforwardly that he didn't know Scholar Mu was a wealthy little lady. Also, this comes as a package, he would give her a discount if she came to find him to level up his grade. After this, in the evening, on the way back home, Peng, while showing the truck picture on his mobile phone to Dummy, says this transport truck has 16 wheels in total. 
the vast wheels support the detachable rear storage space. Also, there are two layers of reinforced guardrails around it. They also have interwoven silver and black stripes with a battle glaze as the base color, and this simple yet unpretentious look is solid and domineering. Then he says to Dummy they will buy this one, the Steel Black Dragon Series 3, his dream car. The driver's seat is a bit larger than a typical off-road vehicle, and the interior is luxurious. He can store all of them inside. Then he excitedly turns and looks to Dummy, saying the most important thing is that this style suits him well, solid and domineering, the qualities of a real man. Meanwhile, Tang comes there holding her cat and waves her hand. Tang looks toward her, saying Sister Tang is taking the cat for a walk. It looks lovely. She smiles and replies, it's just an average cat. It was dirty when she first found it. Its hair wasn't long and had green mucus running out of its nose. Then an interface appeared before Peng through which he read all the information that Night Shadow Cat and said Perfect Grade and Commander Tier Sister Tang's familiar are all definitely something. Meanwhile, the cat starts shouting. Seeing this, Tang says it is long. His fur was already long when she first found him. Meanwhile, a cat jumps down to the ground and runs away from there. Seeing this, Peng says this cat has quite the attitude. She smiles and says Softy has a bit of a temper but doesn't mind it. Then she asks why he hasn't moved to the villa he bought in the suburbs. He says a lot of things have been going on lately, so he didn't have time to pack his things. After this, she puts a hand on his shoulder and says the number of his family is increasing, and it's inconvenient there with the lack of space. She knows he doesn't want to leave, but this place is his home. He can come back anytime. Hearing this, Peng heads down sadly. After this, he comes back home while holding his parents' picture. He thinks mom and dad are about to move out. Did they always say that when a child grows up, he will leave? He thinks he has grown up now, then touching their picture lovingly. He says he is moving to a big villa he bought himself, and he can live alone in this world so they don't need to worry about him. After this, he sits down on the floor, leaning against the bed, holding a photo of his parents. He thinks grandpa seems to have met with some trouble, so he will help grandpa after he finishes the college entrance exams. After all, he is his only relative. However, the next day, in the monster trainer's examination venue, the journalists arrive and start questioning the military, but the military man tells them that irrelevant personnel stands behind the yellow line. Meanwhile, Peng arrives there on his transport truck. As soon as he arrives, people there are amazed to see the truck and start asking one another whose truck is this. Arriving there, Peng thinks the Monster Trainer College entrance examination is finally there. Then, an announcement is made that all the candidates line up and enter in an orderly manner and show their admission tickets at the checkpoint. After this, Peng offers his admission ticket to the military man, and then the military man, while checking it with the machine, tells him that he and his family are to go through these two doors separately. If he has signed a blood contract with his beast, the light on the machine will turn green, and he will be able to enter the examination venue. However, through a scanning machine, a student passed with his familiar, and suddenly, an alarm started ringing. The soldier told him to stop there and try it again. His beast stood aside from him, and Peng was looking toward them. Suddenly, his friend starts roaring and attacking the beast. The soldier calls for help, saying there's a situation in Passage 8 and sending the Silver Moon Wolves as reinforcement. However, the Silver Wolves get there and stop the beast by biting the instructor standing beside him and ask the guy why his familiar suddenly went berserk. The boy gets scared, holds the instructor's feet, begs him, and starts crying, saying he was wrong. This is his father's aware he brought it from home secretly while his father was at work he wants to pass the examination and request him not to remove his exam qualification. The instructor sign holds his arm and tells him to stand up as soon as the students are up. The instructor tells him he is a man and doesn't kneel. The most essential thing is for a man to have dignity. The boy smiles with tears in his eyes and thanks the examiner. The examiner replies, telling him to thank him too. Earlier rules are rules. He was informed beforehand that the exam doesn't allow family that isn't there. Offenders are disqualified from the test and come back next year. Hearing this, he started crying while two soldiers came and grabbed him by the arm and dragged him away. But the boy was screaming that he didn't want to go. He wished to take the exam while the examiner ordered them to throw him out. Seeing this Peng sighed, he thinks he has the guts to try and cheat in this kind of examination while the examiner gives him the nameplate and instructs him to save and not lose it. Peng, moving into the examination hall, thinks if he wants to pass the examination, he has to rely on his strength. Then, looking at his nameplate, he thinks A5, A, B, C are divided according to Commander Elite and Standard Tiers are but what if someone has a Lord Tier familiar will they create an S area just for them? 
Then, looking across the iron bars, I think he may be overthinking it. Someone can't have a Lord tier familiar at this level. And there are only 8 venues in area, uh, this means that there are at least 7 monster trainers who are commander tier friendly. Then, while looking toward the girl standing there with her black anaconda, Peng thinks level 25 is higher than dummies. Then he looked toward the boy who stood there with the tiger. Peng thought this was the first time he had seen a tiger-type familiar. He was no ordinary person. After all, there were already very few tigers before the cataclysm. Even with the enhanced reproduction ability they've received after the catastrophe, tiger-type monsters are still currently scarce. Peng stands up, looking at the ground toward the contestants and their one beast it. I think it seems like he was right. Area B has mostly elite tier familiar, while Area C has all average deck friendly. However, Dumb is only at level 20, so it's only an elite story beast. Despite possessing the strength of a commander tier familiar, there are plenty of geniuses in this world. Being surrounded by commander tier familiar makes him feel like a husky that has strayed into a pack of wolves. This is exciting. After this, he enters the area where the top 8 monster trainers are in Chang'an City. While in the observing room, the instructor and chief watch them through a big screen, looking toward Peng. The instructor colonel says the eight of them should be the most robust youngsters in Chang'e City. Hearing this, ZH Nag adds his point, saying only six are among them. Two are older, one is 21 years old, and the other is 20. Also, their familiars were probably only recently promoted to the commander tier compared to the real geniuses. They're far away. Hearing this, the colonel says, but who can truly measure something like talent? He only knows that these are the only 8 monster trainers out of the 30,000 in Chang'an City who have commander tier familiar. Then, the general tells everyone there that each nation on earth saw the signs a decade ago, and a tiny number of monsters started to appear in areas that weren't inhabited by humans. They thought they would be able to control the situation, but they still needed help to prevent mass panic. Textbooks and other various records state that the change occurred only 3 years ago, so they did not want any accidents in this exam. They were their failure. Hearing this instructor, they salute the general, telling them they can assure him that all the soldiers stationed at the Monster Trainer College entrance examination were selected through a strict process, and cameras are carefully monitoring every part of the exam. They adopted a one-to-one -one monitoring method. Each camera is monitored by one person. If any problem occurs, not only will the person who committed the crime be responsible, but the person responsible for monitoring that portion will also be punished. However, in Area A, an announcement is made that candidate number 5 is to be prepared. Peng is on the ground getting ready. Then, from behind bars, a lakeside giant scorpion comes out. Then, an interface appears before Peng about the scorpion. Seeing it, Peng fixes his glasses and says to Dummy, attack its sides. Those are its weaknesses. Dummy attacks it, and a fight starts between the two. Peng stands aside, watching their fight, thinking this lakeside giant scorpion has quick reflexes as expected. It is not easy to overcome the difference in levels, Dumpy. Scorpion attacks Dummy with reflexes, but Dummy absolves all this power. As soon as he absolves his strength, Dummy's monster level increases, and Pen gets the message that Dummy has reached level 21 and is promoted to commander tier. Seeing this, Pen gets excited, thinking he leveled up, but now they are at a stand. The lakeside giant scorpion still has the upper hand if he compares their grades. And in a one-on-one -on -one ring match like this, even if he was to own more than one familiar, he wouldn't be able to summon the both of them into a battle at the same time. Also, once a monster is promoted to the commander tier, it will have incredible power. Its power will grow exponentially during this time. This lakeside giant scorpion can control water within a close range after its awakening, using it continuously to erode dummy. What should he do now? Then, an interface appears before Peng that Dummy's new ability has obtained. Seeing this, he relaxes and tells Dummy to use the remaining blood thread to strengthen his legs besides strengthening some important joints. Hearing this, Dummy nods in yes and uses the same technique Peng tells him. He uses the remaining blood thread and attacks the scorpion hard. Then, an interface appears before Peng that Dummy's ability has significantly strengthened the bone defense and increased attack. Seeing this, Peng smiles and thinks, excellent with the explosive force gained by gathering the blood threads and Dummy's new ability. The lakeside giant scorpion's exoskeleton can't possibly withstand Dummy's attack bone hardens. However, it's not as cool as having thunder and fire. This ability suits the Dummy's crude, straightforward, closer-ranged fighting style. However, the fight continues between the two, and Dummy beats the scorpion, watching their fight. Peng thinks it can counterattack even after suffering such heavy injuries. However, Dummy's condition is way better than Dummy hitting the scorpion. 
When Peng tells him to hit, seeing this, Peng says he hit out idle point checkmate, and it is their win. Peng appreciate him, then Dummy gets close to him and holds him in his arm, thanking Peng. Also, if it wasn't for Master, Dummy would still be an ape locked in a cage somewhere. Peng replies lovingly that's enough, this victory results from his hard work. Then pointing toward Dazzy, Peng says he is jealous because they have been hugging him so long. Dazzy angrily replies, saying hug for a second, it's five second, and then jump, running toward Peng, saying that he wants hugs too. However, he embraces Peng while Peng looks toward the anaconda behind the iron bars, thinking that it is faster than he is and that there are no visible injuries on their family's body. Then, while looking toward the girl, she thinks these candidates and her familiar sure are something. However, in the observing room, they were watching them, then looking toward Anaconda and the girl. A soldier, there says a winning against, a commander tier familiar without breaking a sweat at this kind of age, and then asks that's the girl from Jun Heng's family. The soldier stands beside him and replies yes, she's Jung Heng's only daughter, and he thinks her name is Jun Mei Lai. However, the general scolded them, saying he had seen her before, she has a cold personality, but she's a nice girl. Her full name's Jun Moi, then the commenter there said he heard she didn't go to school after her senior year in high school. She invited a few tutors to her house and spent the rest of her time with an expatriate New World Allied government team. Is that true? The instructor there replies to him. Is it true she's a trainee of the New World Associated Government, Black Flag? Hearing this, the commenter says a trainee of the New World Allied Government's black flag should be highly talented. Then the trainer there looking toward the colonel smiles, saying the monster trainer next to her is pretty good too, his familiar is a ghoul type. It was quite rare to see those there hearing this colonel smile and realize he was one of his students. However, the conversation with the colonel tells him he's the youngest monster breeder in CH Nagan City. He helped out during the Dead Leaf Locusts incident. And the instructor there reports that no wonder he looked familiar. He's the youngster director Feng recommended before. Zhang also stood there and said, such a good lad. He's already contributing to the government at such a young age. Meanwhile, the general, looking toward Peng through the big screen, thought that the old man should have a good grandson while Peng was using some mana on Dazzy and Dazzy was using his electricity power. Moreover, on the ground instructor, Zhang, goes to Jun Moi, telling candidate A3 she has finished the exam and can leave first. She replies, okay, while Peng stands on the other side of the iron bars and looks toward her and smiles, appreciating Dazzy because it is Dazzy's turn to fight, and he wins. Then, in return, Jun Moi set her cap, looking toward Peng, smiling and thinking he defeated a commander tier with an elite tier familiar. This A5 candidate is quite something. However, an announcement is made that the third exam is about to start. Candidate A5 gets prepared. This time, it is Stripey's turn. And this time, the monster is Dead Leaf Mantis. Seeing the beast there, Peng thinks Stripey's attribute is Earth while this monster's is Wood. This gives Stripey an advantage. Stripey will have a 10-point bonus. Peng is surprised, thinking. It imitates human behavior. It has pretty good intelligence and seems similar to the brightness of an 8- and 9-year-old human child. And Stripey's spirituality isn't low either. It's two grades higher than it looks through this match. Stripey will finally gain some confidence. Moreover, the fight between them starts. They both look toward each other while Stripey gets scared to see the dead leaf mantis and when the deaf leaf mantis gets ready for a fight, Stripey starts pacing around in fear. Seeing this, Peng gets worried, thinking Stripey's expression gives him a bad feeling. And as soon as the dead leaf mantis gets close to Stripey, Stripey is impressed, telling Peng Master that it also knows how to square dance. Peng worriedly replies, telling Stripey it is trying to scare him and wants to attack him, so he needs to strike back. Also, Dazzy stands aside, Peng smiling. When a dead leaf mantis jumps up to attack Stripey, he gets scared, saying it's not playing with him. Then he hits Stripey with his antenna. Seeing this, Stripey asks is this a mosquito? The dead leaf mantis is surprised to see attacking Stripey causes cracks in his leg. After this, he flies up to attack. Seeing this Stripey throw a web toward him and bind him in a web. He asks his master why this mantis is so weak. Then, the dead leaf mantis throws that web out of himself. He attacks Stripey. As soon as he attacks Stripey, he screams that it hurts, and then he attacks the mantis in return saying Stripey hit him and made him badly. Seeing this, Instructor Zhang tells Peng, All right, his exam is finished. Don't dilly-dally around the exam site. Since his exam is done, he should head out. Peng smiles and nods yes. On the other side, in the exam waiting area, students were waiting for their turn. One of them said it's been an hour, but the first batch hasn't come out. The other one replied he was in the second queue, 
and then she said she was still stuck in the first queue. The boy there says to her classmate that only scholar Jun from area has finished the exam. She has a military background. She's so strong. Meanwhile, the door opens, and she, while pointing toward the door, tells everyone to look the door open and asks if someone has finished the exam. Meanwhile, Peng was sitting on stripy dummy silly, and Dazzy came out, seeing the students are surprised. One of them said it was scholar Peng from Area A, and it was location A again. Then someone there, seeing Peng's familiar, asks if it is Area A's monster and also says people are already heading home while they are still stuck there queuing. This is the actual difference in strength. After this, Peng goes to his new villa with his family and is wholly shocked to see that his mansion is badly ransacked. Seeing this, he sees the new villa he bought getting run over by a hundred huskies. Then he gets in the house, and as soon as he enters, he finds everything in his place badly smashed and thrown on the floor. Seeing this, he shouts for his new home. His alliance credits also putting his hand on his heart. He feels he is going to have a heart attack. Then he looked back, there was fur on the couch, and it looked like someone had pulled it out of the creed with nails. Seeing this, he angrily shouted and commanded his familiar, saying the guy who trashed his house had the guts to stay at the crime scene the gall to disrespect him Dazzy Stripey get them. As soon as he commands them, Dummy stands before him to protect him. Seeing Peng smile, thinking Dummy's so considerate he knows to defend him even without his command and then Silly quickly starts sitting on his head to watch him, and he angrily grabs and pulls him back, saying how many times does he have to say this? Don't. This won't make him stronger. Despite everything, Silly sticks to Peng, and Peng angrily hold him in his arm, and then they move ahead. Suddenly, Dazzy sees a bird lying on the floor. Pointing to the bird, he asks Peng's master if he can eat it. Tang looks toward the bird, thinking, what monster is that a bird? Meanwhile, Tang calls him, standing outside the house looking through the broken window. Tang moves to look back and relaxes to say that it is her sister Tang. Hearing this while holding her cat, she waves hands, telling her that this little pet is a housewarming gift from his grandfather and he should keep it if he likes it. His grandfather put in a lot of effort to get this little creature, and then she goes from there, saying her sister still has some things to do, so she won't be staying for dinner. Hearing this, Peng thinks, as expected of Sister Tang, that she's building a new villa next to him in a few days just so it's more convenient for her to take care of and protect him. That land was a wasteland just a few days ago. Then, while feeding silly orange juice, he thinks housewarming is more like house wrecking. Dummy moves and looks back to Peng. Peng orders him to lift the bird, and Dummy holds it tightly. Seeing this, Peng says Dummy loosens up a bit. Don't strangle it to death, thinking a red-crowned crane with only one leg is quite uncommon. Suddenly, the bird jumped out of Dummy's hand. Seeing this, Peng was surprised, thinking it's a good actor, and he needs to intimidate it for it to learn its place. Then Peng moved and said to Dazzy that they should have a roast crane for dinner. Hearing this, his mouth started watering, and the bird standing behind got scared and started crying. Peng smiles, asking if he is still going to act tough. A little bugger, let's see what he exactly is, shall they? However, an interface appears before Peng through which he reads the whole information about that flaming red crane. Peng, after reading this, thinks his great-grandfather is so generous. Then he smiled, saying although this flaming red crane has the same grade as Dummy, it will automatically reach Lord Tyr when it grows up. Dummy's promotion to Commander Tyr was only because it received enlightenment after fighting in numerous battles. This Lord Tyr familiar will surely be a very powerful monster in the future. While Dazzy stands aside, looking toward the flaming red crane, imagines the tasty roast, and when Peng says to the flaming red crane, once he enters his house, he is familiar with eating some mealworm. Dazzy gets completely shocked and angrily says. Then Peng lovingly fed him that mealworm, asking how about giving him a name since he has three flames in his name. He will call him Flamey while Dazzy looks at this, hiding behind the wall, crying, and enjoying his orange juice. Then Peng lovingly puts a hand on Flamey's head, saying let's see whatever they can establish a contract as he puts a hand on his head. They both close their eyes, and Peng closes his eyes thinking perhaps the clarity of a familiar's consciousness is a direct correlation to the familiar's intelligence, and these bright spots must be flamey memories. Then he read his mind where Flamey's mother sat aside the pound and suddenly a crocodile attack and eat her mother. Peng, reading his deep thought, understand that he also has lost his mother. Then, while holding him in his hand lovingly, he asks Flamey if he is willing to be his partner, showing him the contract paper. Seeing the contract paper, Flamey asks if they can help him get revenge. 
He replies if he signs the blood contract, he will be one of them, and his problems will become his problems. Suddenly, the contract paper starts finishing in red light. Seeing this, Peng gets surprised, thinking, why is he still in its consciousness? Then the contract paper of Dummy Dazzy, silly and stripy, gets in front of him, and all the contract paper starts moving around him. Seeing this, Peng starts thinking this is the knowledge of the familiars, a new life-saving ability, and elemental barriers. He consumes the energy of his own familiar, and then transforms it into a barrier to protect himself. Then Peng, while looking toward the contract paper of his familiar, thought this probably wasn't a rare ability. He remembered seeing someone use it in the first round of the exam. So it turns out that every time a familiar is promoted to Commander Tier, Lord Tier, and Emperor Tier, each one of them will gain new life-saving abilities. Therefore, this new ability must have appeared during Dummy's promotion to Commander Tier and these words suddenly popped up. He doesn't recognize them, but he can understand them, and then a blood contract appears before Peng reads it. He thinks how weird it is that a monster trainer is a profession handed down by the previous generation. The blood contract states that the memories passed down from previous generations will be unlocked as the familiar becomes stronger. Could it be that there are existing monster trainers in other places? Then he thinks, forget it. This question is out of his reach, but these life-saving abilities are branded in the depth of one soul. There is no way to teach these moves to other people. No wonder Sister Tang told him to keep the Shifting Constellation's ability a secret. When she taught it to him, people would focus on him if they found out that he had a life-saving ability that could be shifted to another person without any restriction. But it looks like Grandfather and Sister Tang are way scarier than he thought. He doesn't know if he will be of any help to his grandfather with his current ability. The next day, Peng was sitting on the chair on the ground reading a book while his friend was playing near him, and Flamey was cutting down the tree by hitting his beak hard into the tree. Seeing this Peng sign, he thought it had hatred rooted deeply in its heart. It's training so hard so he can avenge his mother one day, and then he starts finding Silly, saying where is Silly? Wasn't it spinning in circles because he feared Flamey would eat it, and then he found him sleeping in the grass. Seeing him sleep there, Peng relaxed too, thinking it could fall asleep like this, it has no worries. Then he relaxes and starts reading a book, thinking the day has been so relaxed lately since his grandfather gave him a limitless credit card. Monster breeding has become a hobby for him. This book by director Feng is really good. As the saying goes, the older, the wiser. Then he searched for his exam results on his mobile watch. As soon as he searched the interface, it appeared his account had logged in from another location, and Peng understood that his grandfather had logged in. However, his grandfather logged into his account to see his exam results, and he was happy to see the exam results. Peng secured full marks and first place in CH Nagan City. Moreover, the interface appears before Peng about his result, and meanwhile, from an unknown number, Peng gets a call and receives the phone call. After this, he stood up and received a call from his college. They asked Peng his name and some necessary information. When Peng told them, they congratulated him, saying he had qualified to take part in the second round of the Monster Trainer College entrance examination. Also, go to the venue where the first round took place on June 27th at 9 a.m., and the exam will last 15 days. He does not need to bring keys, clothes, and toiletries. They told Peng the necessary item he needed to bring with him there. After this, the call ended. Peng looked toward Flamey, thinking since he hadn't signed the blood contract with FL May before taking part in the exam, Flamey wouldn't be able to participate. He would need to find a place to stay for a few days. Meanwhile, Sister Tang waved her hand and smiled, looking toward Peng as she went on her morning walk. Peng, looking toward her, thinks it's Sister Tang. Isn't this too coincidental? Then Tang hides behind the tree. Peng stands there, thinking his grandfather already knows his score, and the exam regulations were announced earlier, so it's not hard to guess that he will need someone to foster Flamey. He probably even knew when Sister Tang had called to inform him to take the exam and had already planned this secretly, and suddenly Tang came there again smilingly. Peng looked toward her, thinking she just wanted him to hurry up and ask her. Then he smiles, thinking they do like to worry, and asks her he doesn't know if she has the time but can ask her to look after his crane for half a month. Hearing this, she happily replies why is he being so cordial? Just leave it to her. He will feed it so well that it gets fat. Then she quickly comes there and starts lovingly petting Flamey while Peng stands aside, thinking, why does he feel like that's not an empty promise? However, in another villa in Chang'an City, a guy angrily asked the employee how he could be in second place. 
He saw it with his own eyes, and they both had three familiar commander tiers and two elite tiers. How did he get second place? Then she replies that the young master, one of his elite tier familiars, is an earth type, and the monster it fought against was a wood type that gave him a 10-point advantage. Hearing this, he angrily punches the table, saying he doesn't care and won't let this go that easily. After this, Peng arrived at his destination. Peng thinks only a few people are there. It looks like he arrived quite early. However, Constructor Zhang says everyone there looks like everyone has arrived. Nice to meet them. He is the person in charge of this round of the exam. Peng, while looking toward Zhang, thinks there are only eight candidates. How can there be a second round with only eight people? Are they going to assign the top ten rankings among these eight people? Then Zhang tells everyone that the second round will take place in Sun Mountain National Forest Park, which is within the base city of Jiangnan, and the exam won't take part in a ring, nor will it be a one-on-one -on -one battle and it will take part in the forest, and they will be fighting against real wild monsters. Then, the candidate there asks the base city of Jiangnan Sun Mountain why they must suddenly go so far. Then Zhang tells Sun Mountain Forest Park that, Fatop monster trainers have scouted it have ruled out the possibility of the presence of any Lord Tier monster. However, there are no fewer than 500 Commander Tier monsters in the Sun Mountain Forest Park some of which are peak commander tier monsters. In principle, the government and the Monster Trainer League will ensure their well-being and give them all a flare gun for emergencies. However, since this is a virgin forest with at least 500 commander tier monsters, the second round of the exam isn't mandatory, and all the candidates can decide now. Then, a guy and a girl with him. They sadly asked if he was sorry, instructor. They thought it was still too dangerous. Can they withdraw? Zhang replied, it is fine. He understands it's not embarrassing at all. Is there anyone else who wants to withdraw? Meanwhile, Jun Moi raises her hand and tells the teacher she doesn't need her parents' approval to join Jack. She smiles and replies that according to the rules, she doesn't need their approval while wordily thinking. But her parents aren't just normal. Then she smiled, saying that she wanted to sign up. Hear this, Jang tears in her eyes, thinking he is just a lowly handler. Then, while looking toward the other candidates, Jang says that the six would present Chang'an City. All the candidates from the military cities in the Huexia region will also be joining them in the exam, and they need to do well and make Chang'an City proud. Hearing this, Peng thinks other regions are also taking the exam. Then Wang Jenchen comes to Peng, gives him a little introduction. Peng asks his name. Peng smiles and replies, telling him his name. When Peng shakes their hand, Wang excitedly shakes him vigorously, saying Gao Peng, so he is Chang'an City's number one. He has always wanted to meet him. Then, holding Peng, he says the others are all from wealthy families. If they aren't from political families, they're second-generation nouveau rich, and their parents are powerful monster trainers. They are the only two muggles hearing this. Peng thinks he is sorry to disappoint his brother, but he is not a muggle either. Then Wang asks him whether any companies have scouted him. A few companies came looking for him right after the exam. Peng replies, not really, thinking maybe his grandfather and sister Tang shooed them away for him. Then Wang excitedly put his arm on Peng's shoulder, saying it was fine. He is number one in Chang'an City. Maybe they're still thinking of a suitable price to scout him. Don't worry, while Peng is putting his hand on his heart and thinks Wang's arm is so strong. Then Wang introduces his beast to Peng, telling this he is his good comrade, God. He mutates from a black ant to a god, and after it is mistakenly at something, the name refers to the fact that the mutation was an act of God. Then, while looking toward his beast, Peng thinks Han Zio is lucky. As the saying goes, the poor rely on mutation, and the rich rely on technology. It's hard to train a familiar up to commander tier just through talent alone. If monster trainers don't come from a good background and don't have the necessary resources, they won't be able to acquire the items needed to speed up a familiar's growth and thinking. But why does the system show its name as Golden Devil Ant? Now that he thinks about it, what exactly is the naming system based on? It has even shown him names that don't exist in any books and data. It is as if it has precognition abilities. However, Instructor Zhang announced that as their airplanes were there and everyone was getting ready, they were about to depart. However, all the candidates were taken on military planes, and then finally, after a long journey, the plane reached the base city of Jiangnan. As soon as the plane arrived, people stood and started talking to each other. They mobilize a large group of people for a test, even using the military plan to transport them and they're the best and brightest out of thousands of candidates the military region needs to protect these geniuses. Peng arrived there thinking, are these the other candidates in the exam? There were a lot of people, close to 200. Almost every type of familiar was present. 
candidates saw their familiar made of granite, got surprised, and started taking pictures while the soldiers there stopped them to capture pictures. After this, they open the door and all the candidates enter the commander's address. Since all the candidates have arrived, they will give the consent letters. To participate in the second round, they must sign to acknowledge the possibility of dying and the location of this test will be far away from the city. Even with their emergency flares, there's still a 10% mortality rate in this examination. Moreover, this is not a joke. The estimated mortality rate considers their commander tier familiarity. Think carefully, they need to be responsible for their future. Then the commander there gave everyone their consent letter, and this letter was about if a candidate participating in the exam violators would be disqualified and their life is their responsibility. But in the event of death, they would be made a martyr and 1000 alliance credits will be paid as compensation to their family. Reading the contract paper, Peng thinks 1000 alliance credits are not even a small amount for big companies. It looks like this exam is very dangerous. Then, the commander there tells everyone that the second round of the examination uses a point system within the Sun Mountain Forest, where many target pillars are set up. Destroying these pillars and killing monsters will grant them points, and the competitive pressure is high this time. Since everyone has looked at the consent letters and been given the details of the second exam round, he will now announce some information about the third round. Then he says they will choose the top 12 candidates, with the 12 candidates with the highest points to take part in the third round. And to take part in the third round is said to exceed the boundaries of the Monster Trainer College entrance exam. It even has its name, the Alliance Strongest Youth Monster Trainer General Assembly. And those who perform well, including their familiar, will be bestowed a title. Also, the last round of the competition will be broadcast live globally, and the battles between their families will be sewn to everyone worldwide. Hearing this, candidates get excited and ask for a universally recognized title. So cool. Peng stands there and thinks so. Eighth grader, then, looking toward his familiar, he tells them that he should think about it more. A title with the word king would be nice. After all, there are so many titles that suit him. Hearing this, they get surprised. However, a military helicopter arrives at the Sun Mountain Forest entrance. The commander there starts announcing that attention all candidates in the second round of the examination will now begin. They will officially start in 20 minutes, head in the direction indicated by the helicopter searchlights, and reach the target destination within the time limit. Then Peng and all his friends sit on dummy, and Peng tells them to move now. Stripey throws his net toward the tree, and through this net, they jump from one side of the forest to another. While on the way jumping, Peng thinks that he has the shifting constellations technique. If he didn't, he would be cut open by all these branches from the speed they were going. Suddenly, Peng felt someone there, and when he looked toward them, a candidate was requesting his monster to slow down because his stellar white pig was running so fast while sitting on his beast. He was shouting, saying he didn't have to go so fast. There's no prize for first place, so slow down. Peng looks toward them, thinking, disgusting. Usually, the trainer is dominant in the trainer-familiar relationship, however, there are exceptional cases when it is reversed, especially if the trainer has a weak personality. Even so, getting despised by a pig is a bit sad. Then, moving aside, Peng wished him good luck, saying all the best pig riding boy, while the boy behind was surprised, thinking all the best. Why would he wish him that? This guy must be a nut job. However, Tang and Flamey were watching them on the big screen at home, and they were announcing all the candidates one by one. When they announced the candidates from the Yinjing district, his registered familiar was a fire-type bird, and Tang relaxed him, saying Peng would also appear soon. She feeds him so well even though Flamey gains so much weight. After that, when they announced Peng, they said they now have a candidate from Kongan City. He also has four registered familiars, and he's also CH Nagan City's top scorer, and he is one of the popular candidates for the top 21. However, Tang brings a tray of roasted fish for Flamey, telling him to eat more so he can become stronger and then he can follow in the footsteps of his master. However, they start watching TV, and the boy and his anger arrive on Peng's side. As soon as they arrive, Pig stops suddenly, and his master is knocked over him and falls to the ground. Seeing this, Peng is surprised, thinking what an irritable Pig, then, Granite Familiar, and his master also arrive there and an announcement is made that time-up candidates who haven't reached yet are disappointed. Moreover, the helicopter arrived there, and the commander there also announced that before they all entered Sun Mountain, he had a few things to say. Right past the entrance, they had placed field combat backpacks with compressed biscuit canned food and bottled water inside. It'll guarantee them an additional hour of survival in emergencies. Each person may only take one, 
and were 197 candidates for the second round examination. He is pleased this is a higher percentage than expected. It seems there aren't many cowards among them. He knows some of them have had the experience of surviving in the wild and are proficient in doing so, whereas some have rarely been outside the city. Still, no matter what type they are, they all have to remember that this forest will be completely different than what they imagined. So his best advice for them is to survive only by surviving can they get a high score and move on. Then, two experienced people were discussing the candidate's performance in the observing hall. The host welcomed everyone to the special program and they could see their exact location through the tracking device on each candidate. The people sitting there start discussing with one another. One of them says that's Duan Wu, the Duan Wu from Didu's Dragon in the Cloud, and he thought he disliked taking part in this kind of program. The other one sitting beside them asks if he is famous, and the boy replies the powerhouses in Didu are usually older, and Duan Wu is among the few young powerhouses there. He has quite a reputation. Then, while pointing toward the students on the projector, she tells everyone that to get the highest number of points, they can see that most of the candidates have gone to the center of the forest. The point pillars are all situated within the center region. Currently, the participant with the highest score is Jun Moi, and the first place candidate is a girl. This is most definitely unexpected. Then she asks what he thinks Mr. Duan Wu replies while watching Jun Moi's performance. Not bad. He believes this species of snake is a black anaconda, and this black anaconda's scales are shiny, and its body is well built, so its grade should be rather high. It seems like it has been raised well from a battle perspective. This black anaconda must have fought in many battles as it seems very strong in combat. Hearing this, she thinks she is asking him about the trainer, not the familiar. What's there to say about a big black snake? The audience wants to see a cold beauty. Then she starts smiling, telling the audience Mr. Duan Wu's analysis is spot on as always a professional indeed. Thinking they say dragon in the clouds Duan Wu is known to be hopelessly single, and his display today truly lives up to that reputation. He seems to have an innate ability to stay single. However, the audience there also appreciates them. Then, while pointing, Duan Wu says alright, since they have seen who's in the first place now, they will look at the candidate currently in last place and divert their attention to the screen. Then, while looking toward the screen, the host says this candidate seems rather cautious. He has chosen high ground, and perhaps he's making some preparations. Then, she orders the cameraman to zoom in on the screen. As soon as he zoomed in on the screen, Peng and his family were lying on the ground. Seeing them, Duan Wu said this teenager seems really zen, and this is just laziness. Hearing this, the host thought, if this is how he replied, they probably won't see him in the next episode. On the other side, Peng, lying on the ground, says lying down like this s really comfy. Then he stands up, setting himself, and seeing the weather conditions, he says to his familiars, the outer areas of the forest shouldn't be too dangerous now. They should also head over. Then, pointing toward the wood, he says into the wood they go, and then they reach the depths of the Sun Mountain Forest Peng. While holding the flower, says to Silly throw away those red banded silver leaves. They just pick this blue light golden rain flower that is worth more than one alliance credit, and they need to be prudent and thrifty. Meanwhile, Dummy, pointing toward the pillar, says to Peng's master, look there. Peng is surprised to see this and thinks it is one of those fabled point pillars. Then, an interface appears before him where he reads all the information about that pillar. Then, while looking toward the pillar, Peng thinks white earth sandstone destroying the pillar will give him points, but what does he do about this? Then he looks toward the wood vine, thinking the ghost wood vine hasn't moved an inch. Is it pretending to be a normal vine? Also, it sure looks interesting since he seems to like acting so much that he will give him a chance to earn a golden horse award. Then he ordered Dazzy to fire. Dazzy, with his antenna, burned fire to the leaf. Peng stood aside, thinking an experienced hunter must remain patient just a moment longer. An elite hunter must remain calm, and he can't endure it any longer. It's too hot, and then, from that ghost wood wine, flowers bloom. He orders Dummy to hold that ghost wood wine. As soon as Dummy holds it, the ghost wood surrounds it. Seeing this, Peng thinks when hunting prey. It seems like the ghost wood vine will use its vines to envelop the enemy and use its knife leave to lacerate the enemy until it either bleeds to death and its bones and organs are crushed by the pressure. But they are unlucky to have encountered Dummy. Dummy cut through all the veins. Seeing this Peng, think for this level of veins to cut through Dummy's tough bones, it is no different than using sandpaper to polish an object. Then he orders Dazzy to finish the veins up quickly and save Dummy from this, and then Dazzy quickly, with his antenna, cuts all the veins and releases Dummy from this trap. Then Peng says he didn't expect such an easy victory, but again, despite it being a commander tier, it was just recently promoted. 
it didn't have any chance to fight back against Dummy and Dazzy. While Dummy angrily held Dazzy to the head, saying he shocked him and Dazzy was telling Fool he was helping him. Then Peng orders Dummy to crush that pillar in front of him. As soon as Dummy crushes that pillar, an alarm starts ringing. Peng gets the message from his identity watch that on destroying a pointed pillar, he has received 150 points, and his current points are 199. Hearing this, Peng gets excited and says Dummy and Dazzy come to him and give him a hand, and then holding the monster core, and he says there must be a monster core in its body. Now they will search thoroughly since that fight was so intense they don't know where the monster core is. It's valuable, as they know. Then, an announcement is made Candidate Chu has been eliminated. Hearing this announcement, Peng thinks this is the fourth eliminated candidate so far. Is the monster in Sun Mountain that vicious, and is it not because of a monster? However, the military team gets there, and while collecting Zhao's body parts, they tell each other that they are late. He's already dead. Then the soldier asks what they do about his familiar while looking toward Zhao's familiar. The other one replies while packing. They should take it back and give it to his family along with the boy's body and then they fill the dead body in a bag, saying it even punctured through his specially made protective glasses. Meanwhile, a giant monster comes to Peng, asking if there's so much smoke if a battle took place. Seeing him there, Peng thinks of the other candidates there for the remains. The rules didn't state that candidates weren't allowed to battle each other during the test, but since it didn't say it's prohibited, he shouldn't put his guard down. Then Peng, while looking toward Dazzy, says he is quick to snatch this point pillar and consider himself lucky next time he and the kind of scorpion will be the ones to surge victory. Just as the mountains stay lush and the water keeps flowing, they are bound to meet again someday in the future, thinking, luckily, he has 8th grader syndrome. While on the host's side, watching everything on screen and looking toward Peng and Scorpion, she says to Duan that it seems like there's no conflict between these two candidates as the examination doesn't actually prohibit fighting between the candidates, but it's not a good thing. And it's actually realistic this way, this isn't a fighting match. They won't be stepping into a ring for one-on-one -on -one fights. The natural wilderness is crueler. It's bloodthirsty, Duan Wu replies, looking toward the screen. In this wilderness, killing and looting are common occurrences after killing a person. One could simply dump the body anywhere in the wild. There wouldn't be a scrap of bone that would remain the next day, and it's not a vital base city with cameras installed. It's a place with no rules to protect them in order to obtain treasures, precious monster parts, and even the offspring of powerful monsters. Murder is quite common. However, Peng and his family reach the depths of the Sun Mountain Forest. There, Peng stands aside while Dummy Dazzy and Stripey collect material. Peng asks if the smell of something is rotting. Also, it's too quiet there. How weird that then says they keep a lookout for any suspicious movements while they're collecting materials. Meanwhile, a rabbit jumped there. Seeing the rabbit there, Dazzy and Silly hold their head and get relaxed. Peng tells them it's a unicorn rabbit's false alarm. And suddenly, they are shocked to see a monster from behind attacking the rabbit and killing it. Peng says, his familiar face falling back. Thinking he can't see this monster's attribute just from a segment of its lamb. He will need to see much more of the beast before he can tell. Since it is hiding in the dark, he can't see it, but it can see him. This isn't the time to act tough. However, Peng tells them to run from there, thinking they still lack long-range offensive attacks. Otherwise, they could probe the monster and get a look at it. He would be able to know its attributes and weaknesses, and they wouldn't have to take such a passive approach. Then Peng tells his familiars the distance between them now is about 40 to 50 meters, but they are shocked to see the monster is also following them. Meanwhile, Corpse Mutation Dream Insect, the monster from behind attacks Peng with his leg, but Dummy tries to save him with the shelter of his arm. However, the Corpse Mutation Dream Insect tries with his full might to attack Peng with his poisonous leg, but Dazzy comes there. The monster attacks Dazzy, and blood comes out of Dazzy's mouth. Seeing this, Peng gets scared, thinking it suffered such a heavy blow, even with the elemental barrier skill. However, Dummy holds both Peng and the injured Dazzy in hand and starts running from there while Peng tells Stripey to use his spider skill. Stripey uses his spider skill and throws a web toward that corpse mutation dream insect to block his attack. Moreover, in the special ops unit headquarters, they were watching them and seeing them in trouble. The instructor turned and told the captain they couldn't let this corpse mutation dream insect continue anymore. It has already killed one monster trainer. It knows that the trainer has a weaker defense than the familiars, so it's attacking the trainer first. However, the instructor there was telling every little information about all the candidates to the captain there. He said that White Rose was currently 5 kilometers away from the target location and she should arrive just in time for the rescue. 
The captain replies by saying one person already died at the hands of this monster. If they have more fatalities, doesn't he think those guys are crazy? They said to be prepared for the possibility of death and that it's a more realistic experience and training for their cadets. Meanwhile, the instructor goes to the captain and tells him, but the captain replies now that someone actually died. They're more anxious than anyone else, and the instructor asks the captain haven't always been like this isn't the first time. Then the instructor returns and tells the controller that the captain isn't behaving too cowardly. The captain hears this and angrily says, this isn't cowardice, it is strategy. Knowing when to advance and retreat and understanding when to give and take are the most important factors for a successful individual. And every great general has lost a battle. Even if he was to think he was invincible, he'd eventually fail because of his arrogance. Hearing this, the instructor replies he is right, captain. But how would he know if he could beat it and not after such a brief encounter? Moreover, at Peng's side, sitting on Dummy's shoulder, when he sees the mutation dream insect coming toward them, the other trainer, and their familiar in fear were running from there. Then, an interface appears before Peng, through which he reads all the attributes and weaknesses of the monster, and then he says that just locating its weak spot will cost him his life. He should just forget about fighting it and run. While running, the monster attacks Stripey and gets him injured. Peng shouts, calling Stripey, but Stripey is in an injured state and tells Peng to keep running. Seeing this Peng scream, they are not running anymore. They will finish it off today. Then he tells Dummy its abdomen has a white spot that's the size of a rice grain. That's its weak spot. After this, Dummy attacks the mutated dream insect, and Peng tells him to attack. Seeing this, Peng gets satisfied, thinking the dream stick insect's primary method of attack is to use its extendable spear-like limbs to impale enemies. But against a monster like Dummy with no flesh and blood, it will have a hard time. The mutation dream insect tries to attack Dummy just like he attacked the other familiars. Seeing this, Peng thinks this is bad, although the dream stick insect won't be able to deal with any fatal injuries to Dummy. As of now, Dummy's stuck because of its limbs and can't pull back to launch any attacks. As soon as Dummy stands in front of them to protect them, Peng understands that Dummy isn't stuck. It's afraid that the enemy will attack them if they retreat. Seeing this, Peng says to Dummy dodge it, don't force himself. They are already at a safe distance. Counter, he can beat it, try to find its weak spot first. Then, while looking, Dazzy Peng gets scared and calls him because blood is constantly flowing from Dazzy's mouth. Then Dazzy, in anger, attacks the enemy, asking who allows him to bully his friends. However, in the sky above the sun, the mountain forest instructor goes there riding an albatross flying in the air, and says kid, don't die yet. While Dummy and Dazzy are fighting with a mutated dream insect, and Peng stands there in the distance says, Dazzy crawls up its abdomen. As soon as Dazzy was about to reach its weak spot, he attacked Dazzy with his leg, threw him away. Seeing this, Peng shouts and tears start flowing from Silly's eyes. Dummy gets mad with anger, seeing Dazzy injured and attacking the mutation dream insect and breaking its leg. And then the fight started between the two mutations dream insects that attack Dummy and throw him away. Seeing this stand aside, Peng thinks they need to quickly get out of this stamina. Although the dream stick insect looks bleak and bloody because it has lost an eye, it hasn't sustained any significant injuries. Its combat power is still above them. Then, looking toward injured Dazzy Dummy and Stripey Peng, think they all have suffered various injuries and think, what should he do? Then he tells Dazzy to hit its white spot with electricity, then Dazzy attacks him with electricity. Then, looking toward the mutation, the dream insect thinks no, they can't because they already had a struck his eye. On the other side, the instructor riding the albatross flying in the air informs the military that she has arrived at the scene and asks if she should engage and stand and observe exterminate Roger. Then, the albatross attacked the mutated dream insect with fire and burned it. Seeing this, Peng thought this was the military, a level 38 albatross, flew it away after burning a mutated dream insect. Seeing this, they relaxed and sat down, saying it was fine. If they had continued to fight, they would have been annihilated. On the other side, they relax in the special ops unit headquarters and start observing the students. Duan stands aside, and the instructor says luckily, the white rose was fast enough, and the instructor says this kid isn't bad. If he is not wrong, those two families are both commander tier. To own the commander tier familiar at this stage is quite rare. The captain comes there to add his point, but trying to defeat that dream stick insect with those two commander tier familiars is still too complicated. And the instructor replies, asking the captain why he let White Rose exterminate it based on initial instructions. They were not allowed to interfere until they received the emergency signal. 
Then the captain replies by saying that all the candidates have died after all the higher-ups need to make sure the number of monster trainers doesn't drastically dwindle, and this was a mistake. Having good results in a match doesn't mean they can perform well in a real fight in the forest. They are still too inexperienced. However, in the Sun Mountain Forest, Peng looking aside, Dazzy thinks the wounds have already started to heal. Familiars sure have great vitality. Then, looking toward the injured days, Peng says, not to mention how tender its flesh is, it looks just like the meat of a fish. Then Dazzy looks towards Stripey and says he wants heart. Hearing these tears come into Stripey's eyes, he asks. He always treats him as his big brother, and now he wants to eat his leg. Dazzy replies, coming close to him after eating flesh proliferates. Then Peng, standing aside, says even after suffering such a severe injury, Dazzy still doesn't forget to rate. He thinks he wants to eat Stripey's leg. Then, he asks just how long it took after Stripey Dazzy if he wants to eat. After this, they all start looking toward Peng. Seeing this, he asks why they are looking at him. Meanwhile, an announcement is made that candidate Feng Peng is eliminated. Hearing this announcement and moving from there, Peng says another candidate got eliminated. They should first find some food for Stripey. They will decide what to do next once it sheds its skin and regenerates its legs. Moreover, at night time, Peng was roasted meat, and all his familiars were sitting near him there. Peng preparing meat says a lot of candidates have been eliminated today, and it looks like to get the highest score, they just need to survive the longest. Then he smiled, saying there were quite a number of points pillars scattered around the outer edge of the forest. Since everyone was rushing towards the center of the forest, no one would fight him for them. So destroying the ones along the outer edge of the forest will be sufficient while looking toward his familiars. He says, moreover, they need rest to heal their injuries. They should be careful. Let's fight the monsters along the outer edge of the forest as practice for now. Hearing this, they get worried. After this, while looking toward the roaring wind mountain beast, Peng says this beast has both wind and earth attributes, and its body is filled with vibrant energy. After eating it in the skin shedding process, Stripey's level should increase to 20, and it's a pity he didn't have enough time to train Stripey. Although it has good defense compared to a familiar of the same level, it was powerless against a commander tier familiar. Also, its skin has started hardening. The skin shedding process should be complete tomorrow. After this conversatio, and they lay down on the ground, and Peng tells them that they all have worked hard today and are now sleeping well. However, the next day, as soon as Peng wakes up, he is happy to see Stripey's interface appear before him that he has completely healed, and his leg has regrown, too. Also, his level has reached 20. It's only one step away from Commander Tier, and once Stripey reaches Commander Tier, he will have three Commander Tier familiars, and with Stripey's defense and crowd control, it will be able to fill the roles that the team is lacking. Then Peng ordered Dazzy, Dummy, Silly, and Stripey to move and find more pillars while Dazzy was busy looking at insects. Also, his mouth was watering. Then Dummy started finding more posts, and Broke Peng and his familiar were standing behind were looking at him then. Peng suddenly looked toward the pond. There, the frogs were sitting on the stone. Peng looked toward the frog. Peng thought, why do these frogs look so familiar? However, an interface appeared before Peng about a blue-skinned frog, and on that interface, everything about the frog was written. Peng read all the information and thought this name was familiar. Don't tell him it's a cousin of the green-skinned frog. Meanwhile, the blue-skinned frog spit at Peng while Peng heatedly looked toward him, thinking he already knew it. Why did the data not show this disgusting hobby of theirs? Has the bad habit of spitting become part of the nature of the blue-skinned frogs as well? Then Peng looked aside, and there was a drone camera. Peng looked there and smiled. However, in, the host asks Du and Wu if everyone still remembers the person behind the flipping salted fish emoticon pack. Then, looking toward Peng on the screen, she asks him if this examination has yet to be eliminated and lets them check his current ranking. After this, they show Peng and his opposition ranking on the screen as Peng was number one in the score. Seeing this, she asks the salted fish monster trainer, who managed to make it to rank 15. Duan replies, saying, that's not a bad ranking currently only 21 examines are left in the Sun Mountain Forest, and the top 15 includes the core of those who have been eliminated the requirement for getting to the third round of the exam is to be ranked in the top 12 he varies close right now he certainly has a chance. Then she smiles, pointing toward the screen, and says, let's hope this examinee can successfully make it to rank 12 just like Mr. Duan said, and next, they take a look at the other higher ranking examinees. After this, they examined other students and then they came to Jun Moi, who ranked second. 
As soon as they discussed her in the meantime she acquired 40 points more. And then the host said, looking toward the screen, it seemed like most X-Miners gained most of their issues from killing monsters instead of destroying points pillars. However, Peng gets the message from his identity watch that the exam has ended, and all scores will cease to accumulate and will be tallied. All X-Miners are asked to move to a safe zone and await transportation. Then Peng says to his family that it is over. They can finally rest now. Although they hadn't found many point pillars over the last few days, thanks to Stripey succeeding in being promoted to the Commander tier, they were able to kill several Commander tier monsters. They gained quite a lot of points as well as many rare materials. Then Peng said to do one's best and leave the rest to destiny. He has done his best regardless of the result, and he won't feel any regret. Also, Peng Peng was ranked 11. However, at a hotel in the base city of Jung, a man was shouting at his son for not performing well in the exam. He was crying, asking if he wasn't told to try his best to get into the top team. If he could participate in the Alliance Youth Monster Trainer General Assembly, it would help him grow and develop in the future. The boy replies, head down, that he tries his best, and it's not like he didn't see his performance on TV. Why doesn't he look through his contacts and see if he can find a way? Hearing this, he scolded, saying it was ridiculous. How could he expect him to get him into such a large-scale general assembly? He really thought his father was almighty. Then he asked, hitting his fist on the arm of the chair, when will he start lying up to his expectations? After he angrily said to his son right now, a lot of eyes are watching him. The moment he makes a single mistake, they will pounce on him like hungry dogs and tear him apart. Now forget it. Give him some time to think. He better keep a low profile over the next few days. Don't hang out with friends. If he sees him hanging out with them again, he will seriously break his good-for-nothing legs. After this, Peng, in the hall eating food and using their mobile phone, thinks the Youth Monster Trainer General Assembly will be held in three months. It has been delayed, and the performance of the Monster Trainer candidates was unsatisfactory. So the government has decided to give them three months to grow. Now, the age limit is 20 years and 3 months, and I think they're so sloppy. Is this to avoid people turning 20 years old right before the assembly because of the delay? Meanwhile, Wang comes their waning hand, saying to Peng he has been looking for him for a long time, then asks once to get dinner. They are all from Chang'an, where they should have gotten together. Then he excitedly holds Peng and says to him let's have dinner together. Even Jun Moi, who never smiles, agrees to it. Peng smiles, replying he will join, so let go of him first. While Jun Moi was excitedly looking toward them from behind, Peng entered the hall. Their succeeding candidates were Wang waving their hand, telling his friends that he knew a good seafood restaurant nearby. As soon as Peng enters, a man comes close to him, asking if they can talk for a bit. Peng ignores and passes by him, then he quickly puts his credit card in front of Peng, telling him the card's password. Then, he tells them inside that there's around a 1 million alliance credit regardless of the outcome of their conversation this is the payment for taking up his time. Hearing this Peng looked toward him asking didn't think his time was worth this much money then the man pointing aside says there's a cafe over there Peng smile saying wait a minute. Then showing him dummy Peng says his familiar has always been cowardly even since it was young he has to pat its head every night otherwise it cannot sleep it's there looking for him because it couldn't sleep. Hearing this the man laugh repling quite cautious but that's a good thing one should always be cautious no matter what they are doing then they both goes to cafe. There, he says to Peng. In truth, the reason he came here today is to make a deal with him. And when Peng asks him about the agreement, he replies that someone is willing to give him a considerable sum of money in exchange. He will withdraw from the Alliance's most robust youth monster trainer competition this sum is more significant than the reward given to the one who will rank first in the round. Then, keeping the card in front of Peng, he says to show his sincerity. He will disclose some insider information to him based on the information that he has received. A monster trainer from the Mei district made a contract with a Lord Tier familiar. He's a favorite for winning the competition. And this means even if he participated in the youth monster trainer competition, there's no chance for him to claim first place. Then he requests Peng to give it some thought. Peng replies he is just a poor orphan who lost his parents and then asks what is there to be wary of to think his employee is willing to pay such a high price. It looks like they really love their child. Hearing this, he asks if they can discuss the details. Peng, taking a sip of coffee, replies sorry, rather than money, he wants to have the chance to enter a higher stage. Then, while looking toward Peng angrily, he asks what does he mean? Give it some more thought. Doesn't he like money? This is an enormous amount. Then Peng was too tactful and said he told to refuse. Then Zhang says to Peng that's really a pity. 
then Peng gets up and goes from there, waving their hand and telling him to enjoy his coffee. It's on him. As soon as Peng goes from there, he calls his boss, saying that he rejected the offer because the kid had quite the character, and money didn't work for him. On the other side, Peng calls his friend Wang informing him that he is coming, and they call to eat first. Jiang also comes out of the restaurant thinking he resolves problems through negotiation. But his client isn't someone who fixes things through words, as that kid is still too young. Only after experiencing a few more difficulties will he understand the cruelty of the real world. Well, either way, this doesn't concern him. After all, he is just a lowly messenger. As soon as he came out, he got scared to see nobody was there on the road. And from both sides, two young men with beasts came there. Seeing them, sweat started flowing from his face while he thought he didn't know he would need to use his trump card this soon. Just who set him up? However, one of them says to Zhang he should stop struggling as his familiar is already in their hands. They mean him no harm, just cooperate with them. Looking toward them, he thinks he can't get in touch even if his familiar doesn't chance to warn him. It seems like he is in deep trouble now. Then, that guy tells Zhang that someone has met him. Hearing this, he sacredly thinks, okay, he will see who it is, and then they take him into the restaurant. There was Peng's grandfather, Jai Hunwu. He stood there with his back, and as soon as Zhang entered, Jai Hunwu asked if he was Mr. Zhang. Meanwhile, Tang, who was right there with Jai Hunwu, threw the card toward Zhang, which stuck into the wall. After this, Jai Hunwu turned saying to Zhang he was sorry for taking up his precious time. This card has 5 million alliance credits on it, and the password is 6 fives. Think of it as compensation for his time, and he would like to know what he said to that innocent and naive child just now. Hearing this, Zhang smiles and replies he just had a little talk with him. He wanted to ask him to quit the Alliance's most robust youth monster trainer competition. Thinking innocent, these people are there for Gao Peng. Their relationship isn't ordinary either, and according to his research, the boy doesn't have any notable background. So how is he related to someone of such status? Jai Hunwu came close to Jiang angrily, asking why the boy answered ZH Nag, and he replied he declined it. He said he didn't want to miss an opportunity to expand his horizon, thinking just who the hell is he? As soon as they try to attack him, he requests them to wait. Then Jai Hunwu asks him about his next step because he does not want to hear any lies, and he is sure his sister doesn't want to hear that her brother is a liar either, and that would set a bad example for the children. Hearing this, he gets very nervous. Meanwhile, his sister calls him from behind, and Jai Hunwu holds his hand there. Jiang turns to look at him and asks Xuan why she is there. She replies, pointing toward Jai Hunwu. Grandpa said he could help her see him. He is always busy, and he doesn't come home. She hadn't seen him in a long time. Then she sadly says that Grandpa also asked her to play a game with him to prevent him from discovering her, and as long as she could do that, he would buy her five ice creams, and brother, she would give him all of her ice creams so don't be angry it's just that she has missed him. Moreover, Jai Hunwu comes close to her, putting their hand on her head lovingly, saying her brother won't be angry at her cute little princess. He has to talk to her brother for a while, so why doesn't she go inside and have some ice cream? Then Zhang also bends and says to her lovingly that he won't be angry and be a good girl. Xuan, as soon as she goes from there, Zhang shouts, saying his sister is innocent. She knows nothing. What do they want to know? He will tell them everything. He just had a talk with Peng, and he hasn't done anything to him. Tang comes close to him and controls him from moving ahead toward Jai Hunwu while Hunwu replies that's why he is still sitting there and talking to him. Then Jai Hunwu sits on the chair, and the waiter brings tea for him. And then, while taking a cup of tea, he asks Zh Nag if he works for him. And in return, Jiang asks if he's not going to kill him. Hunwu replies by saying no matter where they come from, as long as they're people, they have value. Killing them is the simplest, but also the most wasteful method, and he asks why doesn't he continue. Zhang then tells Jai Hunwu everything. Hearing this, Hunwu says the mayor of the base city of Jinling, Han Yuanming, when he received information that someone was investigating Peng, he always assumed it was something significant to think it would be for such a reason. Then Tang stands aside. Hunwu asks the chairman to get rid of Han Yuanming. He replies no and leaves Han Yuanming for Peng to handle himself. This incident occurred because of him, so he will be the one to end it, and it will give him a sense of accomplishment. After this, Jai Hunwu says to ZH Nag. However, there's one thing that he agrees with Peng. Taking part in this competition is really a waste of his time. Hearing this, he is surprised. Then Jai Hunwu, while looking at himself in the mirror, thinks it's been four years since they last met. 
on the other side, Peng, also looking toward the mirror window, thinks just who is behind all of this. Then he goes to bed thinking whatever he will think about tomorrow since he rejected their offer, they will move on to their next plan. He will worry about it when the time comes. Meanwhile, his room's door opened so fast that he slowly approached the door while someone from outside opened the door lock, saying it was not suitable for a young man to constantly oversleep. Hearing this voice, Peng was surprised, and this was his grandfather Jai Hunwu, who was close to Peng for a long time. Seeing his grandpa's there, Peng hugs him tightly, and Jai Hunwu, holding him lovingly, says he hasn't seen him in years. He has grown taller while sitting on the couch. Hunwu says grandpa saw his performance during the competition. He did great. He was intelligent and courageous. Peng hesitantly replies he wasn't strong enough. He could only scout for point pillars on the periphery. Then Jai Hunwu, looking toward him, says being able to preserve oneself is the most tremendous success, there is nothing to be ashamed of, and he is just like his grandpa when he first started the Southern Sky Group. He also took a step back on certain matters, but he is back now. As long as he is there, no one will ever bully him. Hearing this, Peng says about the group, is there anything he can help him with? He has a lot of experience and training. Hearing this, Jai Hunwu says after a few minor characters are still struggling and can't do any harm to the group, let's talk about something else. Someone tried to make him withdraw from the competition. Then he tells Peng that the mayor of Jinling Base City, Han Mijuan, refuses Gim, but he has more than one way to disqualify him from the competition, and he is asking him to show him courtesy before the war. Hearing this, Peng gets worried and asks the mayor, who's a bit troublesome. Then, he asks what kind of war. And then Jai Hunwu explains to him that first, he will ruin his reputation and he will find a girl who will invite him to a meal. After he and the girl finish the meal, some things will happen, and then she will accuse him of raping her. Then they will spread rumors, and he, a good child with no background, will never be able to defend himself against such stories. When enough people believe them, the words will become the truth, and they will stick with him for the rest of his life. He hopes that he can avenge himself. Also, his grandpa will help him with all his might, and it's good to have this as motivation to push himself. Hearing this, Peng thanks him, and he will remember this. Then Jai Hunwu smiles, asking to remember grandpa's words and remember this person hearing Peng laugh. After this, he says Peng to now for the main topic. He hopes that he is willing to give up on the Alliance Youth Monster Trainer General Assembly. Peng replies, saying he will contact the organization tomorrow. Then Jai Hunwu smiles, asking if Grandpa is making him give up such an ample opportunity, and he will not object. Peng replies with a smile he is sure Grandpa has his reason, and he will listen to what he says first. Then Jai Hunwu stands up, and goes near the window, telling Peng he knows that it has only been three years since the cataclysm, so the gap between individuals isn't actually that big. Hearing Peng clinch his fist and Jai Hunwu says age doesn't bring anyone any advantage, whether a person is 30, 40, or 50 years old, everyone is standing on the same starting line. Then he comes close to Peng, asking if he knows why he must go and seek the title of the most muscular youth monster trainer. Isn't it better to remove the word youth? Hearing this, Peng is shocked, then asks the most muscular monster trainer while Jai Hunwu, looking outside the window, replies yes, also the most muscular monster trainer. It's a different era, an ear for the ambitious. Although the alliance controls the overall situation right now, it's only temporary. One day, a conflict will arise. Hearing this, Peng says to tell him if a person could command familiars to destroy mountains and hells to stir up rivers and oceans, would he still be satisfied with normality? Would he be satisfied with his current position? And human greed is always proportional to their capabilities, thinking he can't imagine what the future will be like when such a day arrives. Then Jai Hunwu comes close to him, putting a hand on Peng's shoulder, and replies, telling him to strive to make himself stronger and that participating in this kind of competition will only waste his time. A man should be more ambitious. Then Peng says he has a question and asks when such a day arrives, there will be strong people who will be willing to maintain order but there will also exist a bunch of people who want to destroy the order. Also, Grandpa then does he wish to maintain the order. Jai Hunwu smiles and replies silly child, he will protect him. Also, he knows that deep in his heart, he is not happy about withdrawing from the competition, so how about this? In three months, when the competition starts, he will recommend that he participate in the competition as a judge. Hearing this, Peng, in surprise, asks as a judge, and Jai Hunwu replies yes he can help him fight for this spot but whether he gets it will depend on him. He will have to work hard for the next three months. Hearing this Peng smile, I think participating in this sort of competition is indeed pointless, but to take part as a judge is interesting. 
and when the competition starts, the participants will be very happy to see a former competitor as their judge. However, in the CH Nagan Base City Airport lobby, Peng, on the way with his familiars, thinks he is finally home, but is a lace without family still considered home. After settling some matters there, he will be heading straight over to Yuzhu. It will be better to apply to Yuzhu University. He has the system, so which university he goes to doesn't really matter. Although he can't really help Grandpa, it is better to stay close to the elderly. Meanwhile, his phone rang, and it was Chief Feng's call. Peng picked up the call. Feng asked if he was back from Jiangmen and if he was free. There was something he needed his help with. It's something good, Peng replied, saying he had some business to attend to at the association. Hearing this, Feng says he has already left the Monster Breeder Association. Peng asks the reason for his leaving the Monster Breeder Association, and he replies that the organization has changed. It's no longer the Monster Breeder Association that he loves working for, and the Monster Breeder Association is now a subsidiary of the Monster Trainer League. Then he sighs, saying he doesn't want to talk more about it because while talking about it, he gets upset. Then he says he is working for the military right now, and there's a lot to be done. Then he asks Peng if he is interested and if he can pay him much for it, but he can make up for it with rare materials. Also, military soldiers stand aside in his office. Peng stands before scanning the machine's replies and feels free to get straight to the point. If it's within his abilities, he will do his best to help. Hearing this, Feng tells them he will get straight to the point. He has probably heard of the Shachuaman man-eating earthworms migrating over from the Dali Desert. And recently, a monster hunting squad discovered that within the colony, a Commander Tier Shachuaman man-eating earthworm is about to evolve to Lord Tier. However, Peng asks if the military is preparing to capture a shaman man-eating earthworm on the brink of reaching Lord Tier. Feng replies he doesn't have to be worried they won't be taking part in the battle between Lord Tier monsters. All they will do is prevent another monster from interfering while the Shachuaman man-eating earthworm is in the midst of evolving. Moreover, Peng says to himself, keeping the phone down, that the Dali Desert already has a Lord Tier Desert ruler. Although the Dali Desert has gotten bigger since the Cataclysm, it's not big enough to house two Lord Tier monsters. When the time comes, a huge battle will erupt. It seems like the Chang'an military is preparing to reap the spoils of this battle. However, Stripey stands aside and gets sad, listening to this. Peng, looking toward him, says he is not talking about him, and then he starts talking to Chief Feng, asking why he comes to him. Aren't there much stronger trainers within the military? Feng coughs and replies this plan was proposed by him, but the upper brass of the military didn't like it, so he can only rely on his own connections. But he should not be worried. There is not too much danger. He also has a few military trainers on his side, and if the plan goes well in the end, the golden deity itself will personally lend them a hand. Hearing this, Peng smiles, saying it seems like he hasn't done so well since joining the military. Feng laughs, and then Peng asks when the earthworm will be evolving. Feng excitedly asks if he agrees it should be within the next two days. He wants him one, so feel free to come to him if he ever needs any help. However, Peng smiles, keeps the phone away, and replies he should join in on the fun. Then, he will be waiting for his notice and move from there, thinking a battle of this level is way beyond his capabilities. If he goes, all he can do is watch. But if he wants to become stronger, he will have to observe a fight between the strong and expand his horizon to the most muscular monster trainer. Meanwhile, Tang comes there with Flamey, waving their hand and greeting him. Seeing Flamey there, Peng asks what is this fat penguin? However, two days later, in Chang'an outskirts, Peng was with his family, and Tang was with them with her family. Peng thinks it's not very far. They haven't threaded into the Dark Ember Forest, yet this part is still considered as the periphery. Also, the director Feng was telling the people to point ahead any further. They will be in the territory of the Lord of the Dark Ember. The Lord has always had a bad temper, and it would be harmful to provoke it. While on the way, Peng looks toward Tang's familiar shadow. Japalera thinks so. Sister Tang has such a strong familiarity then the interface appears before Peng on which he reads all the information about that beast. However, after reading it, Peng think its attribute looked frightening. Now he finally understands why Grandpa sent her to him while looking toward other people and their families. He also looks at a man and his family and thinks. In contrast to the helper director Feng brought, this guy introduced himself as Lai King, and his familiars are a level 24 thorny iron hide boar and a level 21 poison blooded green snake. Then, he looked at the other one. His name was Kinni Peng he thought. Think of his familiars that's a level 72 flaming bird, and they're on different levels. Then Peng gets confused and thinks of Lai King Kinni Zhang's wordplay. 
Then, Director Feng points aside toward the man-eating worm and tells it that they shouldn't head in further right before a breakthrough at a level when a monster is most cautious. They must not provoke it. Seeing so many worm there, Peng gets surprised, and then Feng says they might not need to do anything. In the end, these Shachuaman man-eating earthworms will naturally protect their leader. After this, Peng asks if the Lord of the Dark Ember's actual name is Lord of the Dark Ember. Feng replies, saying no, they call it that because it's currently occupying the entire Dark Ember forest. After all, not all Lord Tier monsters have a territory. For instance, if that desert ruler were to occupy the Dali Desert for a long enough period of time, they would start calling it Lord of the Dali instead. Then, Director Feng tells everyone to be careful. There will be monsters that will use this opportunity to launch sneak attacks. Then Peng feels something suspicious, and then he tells Feng that something's coming. Then a vast chicken came there. Seeing this, Peng got scared, saying what a giant rooster. Seeing this, Feng laughed, telling Chaiken to eat earthworms. This son-to-be Lord Tier Shachuam and man-eating earthworm is just too tempting for it. Then, the chicken jumps over the worm. Feng tells him to look by relying on its inborn nature. The five colored golden roosters can easily bypass the earthworm's defense. However, Peng is surprised and sees everywhere, but the worm has disappeared. Then, he surprisingly asks where the earthworms were, fat, juicy earthworms. Hearing this, Tang laughs, while Director Feng coughs, saying that the earthworm can dig underground. The commander tier Shachuam and man-eating earthworms should be hiding underground while it's promoting, so it's normal not to be able to find it. Also, he has talent, but he still has so much he needs to learn. Hearing this, Peng looks toward Director Feng and thinks he is an elite of the monster breeder industry. He will be caught if he acts too experienced. 